Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Thanas Vergulis. I am a scientific associate at Athena Research Center in Greece. Uh, and today, as a member of uh, each organizing committee, I have the great honor to welcome you uh, to the SciK 2022, uh, which is the second edition of the International Workshop on Scientific Knowledge. Um, now, uh, SciK is uh, a venue that aims to bring together researchers and uh, practitioners from different disciplines like digital libraries, information extraction, machine learning, semantic web, etc., NLP, scientometrics, bibliometrics, uh, to, to discuss uh, on subjects related to research on scientific knowledge. And um, uh, in particular, uh, on subjects regarding uh, scientific knowledge, representation, uh, discoverability, and assessment. Um, the history of Psy-K uh, begins in 2020. Uh, that year, uh, two related workshops had been co-organized uh, with TPDL the International Conference on the Theory and Practice of Digital Libraries. Uh, the first one was the AIM in Science workshop about research assessment, and the second one, the SKG workshop about scientific and uh, scholarly uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, after the successful organization of both events, uh, the organizing teams uh, of the two workshops decided to join forces and this is how PsyK was born. Uh, the first edition uh, has been co-organized with the web conference uh, 2021. It was completely virtual. Uh, and in the same year, a special issue uh, in the QSS uh, journal, uh, the open access journal on scientometrics uh, called uh, quantitative, uh, Qualitative Science Studies uh, journal, uh, had a special issue uh, for extensions of works uh, from the initial uh, workshop, the AIM in Science workshop and the, the SKG one. Um, this year, the same team, the same organizing uh, uh, committee uh, is behind the organization of uh, SciCase second edition. Uh, and if you are interested in more details, you can find them in the web page, the, the dedicated web, web page we have created for this reason. And uh, the link uh, is included in uh, this slide, but you can find it also uh, from the main uh, website of uh, the works. Now, uh, this year we had a, a worldwide interest for the workshop. Uh, more specifically, uh, we had submissions from 15 countries coming from North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, after our peer review process, uh, 11 papers uh, have been accepted for presentation and uh, publication uh, in the proceedings. Uh, and in particular, uh, we had four full papers uh, four assortments and two vision papers accepted for presentation and publication. Uh, all these papers will be presented in the two sessions uh, that will be uh, before the lunch break. Uh, and after that, uh, we have two afternoon sessions uh, which are dedicated to our keynote speakers and um, uh, a very interesting, we think, uh, discussion panel. Uh, in particular, uh, this year we have a special theme. Uh, it is about the discontinuation of uh, the Microsoft Academic Graph, uh, MAG, uh, which was one of the uh, most uh, widely known and used um, scientific knowledge graphs. Uh, Microsoft decided to discontinue uh, this resource uh, by the end of 2021. And uh, after that, a lot of uh, people and services relying uh, on this uh, resource uh, had to change their plans uh, and to, to adapt uh, to this change. Uh, 
so uh, because of this, uh, we have invited two great keynote speakers, uh, Jason Priam uh, from our research to present uh, Open Alex, uh, a new alternative uh, for those services that need to, to, to handle the same time, type of data. Uh, but also Alex Wade uh, from the Allen uh, Institute for AI and the Semantic Scholar uh, to present us uh, uh, these, uh, the, the resources that Semantic Scholar provides. Uh, but also uh, they will be part of a panel discussion regarding uh, the same issue uh, where we can have uh, a more structured, uh, but also uh, live discussion uh, about uh, this subject. Finally, uh, before uh, going further, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank all the members of our program committee. You can find them displayed here in this slide. Uh, without their help and their excellent and uh, thorough work in the peer review process, this event uh, could not be possible. Uh, so uh, let me again thank all of them uh, for this. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, without further ado, uh, we could um, uh, go further. And uh, I would like to welcome you to the first session of the PSYCH 2022. Uh, I'm co-chairing this uh, first session with Angelo Salatino from the Open University in the UK. Angelo, do you want to make a quick introduction of yourself before we go to our first paper presentation? Uh, yes, why not? Uh, can you see me? Or maybe you should like remove the sharing, uh, sharing screen because I don't think the other people. Yeah, hi everyone. So I am Angelo Salatino and I am a research associate at the Open University. And uh, yeah, my research interests are uh, about scientific knowledge graphs and size of size in general. So try to understand what kind of metrics we can use or we can devise to assess and eventually ac accelerate the progress of science. So um, I want to keep it briefly and concise. So maybe we can we can start analysis. Okay, uh, thanks Angelo. So uh, the first presentation uh, is uh, about uh, a paper in the uh, scientific knowledge representation uh, subject. Uh, it is titled uh, data models for annotating biomedical scholarly publications, the case of COVID-19. And uh, it is, uh, the authors uh, are uh, House Medin, Turkey, uh, Mohammed Ali Khadstayeb, Alejandro Piad Morphins, Morphis, Mohammed Ben Awitsa, and uh, Rene Fabrice uh, Bill. Sorry if I did not pronounce them uh, correctly. Uh, so, do we have the presenter of, of, of this work? Uh, of can you show your screen? Yes. Okay. Hello. Hi. Well, you did well. You pronounced our, our names very well. Okay. Well, uh, actually, do you see my screen now? Yes, yes. It is yes. okay. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. We are honored to be here today to present our work entitled Data Models for Annotated Biomedical Scholar Publications, the case of COVID 19. The work is a joint initiative of Data Engineering and Semantics Research Unit, University of Sfax, Tunisia, with the University of Havana, Cuba, and the University of Marwa, Cameroon. So, a brief introduction about us. So the University of Sfax is located in Tunisia, in North Africa, 270 kilometers from Tunis, the capital. It is a major university in Tunisia, and it is among the best universities in Africa in computer science research. Well, the Data Engineering and Semantics Research Unit has been created recently in 2021. It is affiliated at the to the Faculty of Sciences of Sfax, and it works on various ranges of research topics. In fact, we work on semantic technologies, CN2 metrics, biomedical informatics, data science, open science, big data, social network analysis, information retrieval, etc. The Sison Bibliothèque is 
an open and inclusive community of African researchers, practitioners, and enthusiasts at the intersection of machine learning and healthcare. It is created in 2021, and it works on various projects related to biomedical data science, including the biomedical semantic annotation. Well, let's go now to our work. Well, as you all know that COVID-19 research is evolving. In 2020, we had about around 80,000 papers, and in 2021, we had over 140,000 papers, where, where all the research did not change a lot. Well, multiple countries are involved from the five continents, and various research areas have been involved, ranging from medicine to computer science and economics. So this situation has caused the creation of multiple scholarly publications, of thousands of scholarly publications. This huge volume cannot be processed by humans, but it involves ground knowledge on the pandemic and consequently it should be reused for clinical decision support among other important tasks for COVID-19 uh, management. The solution here is that full text should be annotated in a machine readable way so that their findings can be reused to drive intelligent systems. So, the solution is the so-called the inline semantic annotations. So to annotate uh, the full text of scholarly publication or of a group of scholarly publications, we need quite four steps. Well, we need to drive a corpus of scholarly publications about the topics. We need to define the purpose and the features of the annotation. We need to decide a data model and finally, we need to begin the semantic annotation using automatic or manual methods. So, how we can analyze this work? Well, to, uh, to search about the, our, our evidences, about what is ongoing, about how people have chosen the data models for annotating scholarly publications about COVID-19, particularly the, the COVID-19 data set. We, we have uh, chosen uh, to uh, analyze Google Scholar to extract the evidences about the, the works that have been done. We have found around 348 publications. We have also extracted 108 publications from the COVID-19 NLP research venues. And we have also extracted 17 publications about... Then we have collected the evidences we, are, we have eliminated duplicates, and we got 460 duplicates. <coughs> Where screening the titles, we have obtained uh, 28 publications. And finally, when we screened the full text, we obtained a final result. I, I, I think uh, we, we are experiencing uh, net, a network. Uh, 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 sorry for the interruption, but uh, I think that you have a connectivity issue the previous minutes. Can you repeat uh, uh, what you said in the previous minute? From the beginning? No, no, the, pre the previous minute, the last seconds, because we lost them. 
yeah so i will i will just come from here okay what i was saying is that uh semantic annotations projects for scholarly publications are mainly based on four steps the first step is driving the corpus of scholarly publication the second is define the purpose and features of the, of the annotation the third is deciding a data model and the fourth is beginning the semantic annotations using automatic and manual methods well in this research work we are interested in studying the data models that were used for the semantic annotation projects for scholarly publications about COVID-19. We are mainly focusing on the core 19 uh, data set of scholarly publications about COVID-19 that was launched by the Allen Institute among other institutions. So for that, we are, we are ju just uh, extracting evidences about uh, the, to the topic. So we are uh, analyzing Google Scholar using a simple query to extract uh, some results about semantic annotations of code 19. So we got 348 results. We uh, also analyzed the COVID-19 NLP related research venues and we got 108 results. And we have analyzed the showcase about the semantic annotation projects that was launched by David Boot at the W3 Consortium, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. So after eliminated duplicates, we got a number of 460 the initial uh, evidences. So we screened their titles. And after screening titles, we got only 28 publications. And finally, when we screened the full text, we actually finished with having 17 papers about inline semantic annotations. So what we have done with these 17 publications? In fact, we have analyzed the methods parts of these works to get the data models of the inline semantic annotations of COVID-19 publications and their target applications. By data model, we mean the type of the semantic annotation that was done and its layout, how it is uh, featured and presented. So let's go forward to the results now. Well, when we analyze uh, the results from a, a bibliographic perspective, we found out that most of these publications are done by the United States of America, nine out of 17. But there are several other publications and initiatives that were done by other countries around the world from Europe, Asia, and even Africa. Well, we found uh, four data models for the semantic annotations of COVID-19 publications. We found the named entity annotation, which is the annotation, the text span annotation of concepts, the concept-based relation annotation, which is the annotation of, uh, uh, of concepts as a text span annotation, and then we annotate the relation between them using an arrow, as you see in the example. We find also uh, the sentence annotation, which is the annotation of a full sentence as a text span annotation between sentence boundaries. And uh, every sentence is annotated using labels or using relations from knowledge graphs, etc. And we found a quite new type of data model that was included only in two works, which is the action-based annotation. In fact, the action-based annotation uh, uh, highlights the, the terms, the verbs, and the adjectives 
that stand for the action of the centers as a text statement annotation and it uh, and this uh, annotation will be related to the subject and object of the action using arrows so this is uh, the four data models that we will deal with in this work when we see the purpose of the semantic annotations project by data model we see that the annotations have quite a different purposes for example the named entity annotations and the concept based relation annotations are coupled together to uh, to create knowledge graphs for example or for other purposes For example, uh, cre creating text summarization applications, etc. The the cent while the sentence annotation is used for question answering and dashboards mainly. The action based relation annotations can be used either for creating search engines or for creating knowledge graphs. Now let's move to the discussion of these results. Well, what is the rationale? What are the reasons for using these data models? We found out that there are logical reasons for using each of the data models. For example, the concept-based relation annotation is precise as it uses predefined relation types. It has more recall, uh, more precision, but less recall because if the if the relation type is not predefined before the annotation it cannot be annotated however the action based relation annotation has generic relations and the relation type can be defined as a concept so every type of relation uh, of relation can be annotated in the text so we have a more recall but we can have less precision because We have limited knowledge about how to deal with such an annotation. There are limited guidance about how to to, uh, to set things using this type of data model. The named entity annotation is mainly used for uh, for a need to identify concepts within text for data mining or for knowledge engineering, where the Santos annotation is motivated by need to return a natural language text to solve a particular matter for example the question answering so we don't need a precise annotation but we need a more human response that can be reused for in a dashboard or in uh, a question answering tool etc so to go in depth into the advantages and disadvantages of these four data models i have done these four examples here so the first example is the pathogenesis of covid19 is caused by the molecular aspect of sars-cov2 virus the second example anemia is rarely a symptom of covid19 disease the third one the development of vaccines by firms will be said will certainly not be a very short journey the maximum incubation period for COVID-19 is 14 days. So these four common examples that can be uh, seen in various scholarly publications. So we are going to use them and to see how each of the data models can deal with that. Let's begin with the named entity annotations. So the, fir the first issue that we have here is that uh, we don't have a particular guidance about how the annotation granularity should be done. For example, you can annotate pathogenesis and COVID-19 as concepts. You can uh, define pathogenesis of COVID-19 as a concept, as a unique concept. You can add the to, uh, to, uh, to the text done uh, annotation and it will be the pathogenesis of COVID-19 and so on 
The second thing is the label choice. In fact, COVID-19 can be a concept, a disease, a medical condition. How we should decide that? When we go to the concept-based relation annotation, we have an issue about whether we should uh, use uh, uh, well, a relation type or its reverse, its inverse relation. For example, whether we should use causes or caused by as a relation type. And when the uh, sentence is in the passive form, whether we should go backward or forward. So this is an issue that we find out to be tricky in the annotation projects, even when we go into the examples of annotations that were done to the COD-19 dataset. Another problem is the consideration of the adverbs and the regation. For example, in anemia is really a symptom of COVID-19 disease and the development of vaccines by firms will certainly not be a uh, very short term. So what we think here can work is the use of reification. But how we can define reification to do that? For example, as you see here, we, we did uh, a relation between COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 virus, and we reify it to add uh, the precision of the statement. When we move to action-based relation annotation, we find more interesting problems. So, sorry for the interruption. Beyond the... Sorry for the interruption, you have about two minutes, okay? Yeah, I, I'm just finishing. So okay. I have two slides left. Okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, I am I'm seeing the clock. Yeah, so when we go to action-based relation annotations, Further than the subject and the ob object uh, granularity, we have the granularity of the action itself. So as you see here, should we use cause only? Should we, uh, should we use the base form? Should we use the conjugated form? Should we include the preposition? Should we include the verb? And when we go in depth, should we include the negation, the adverb? the adjective, the compound verb, for example, if the will be, for example, and particularly when there is an adverb and indication in the middle. So these are all problems about action-based relation annotations. So here we move to the conclusion as I promised. Yeah, so we provide an overview about the data models used to annotate COVID-19 scholarly publications. We discussed the advantages of each data models and we provided an overview of the major matters limiting their practical efficiency. So the main purpose of this work is to show the need for guidance for inline semantic annotations in the next few years. If we need to go forward with inline semantic annotations of scholarly publications in general, particularly in the medical uh, field. Okay, the future direction for this research paper can be the inclusion of other bibliographic databases, even if Google Scholar is an inclusive bibliographic database and it includes most of what is of what exists in Web of Science and PubMed as Scopus, but we can use a cross uh, database uh, approach such as to uh, to ameliorate our analysis. Uh, well, we can use visualization tools as bibliometrics for uh, a better analysis. We can we can establish a detailed guidance based on this analysis for, for annotated textual resources in a standardized way by considering the limitations of semantic annotations data model. Particularly, we can we can even move forward to define a W3 consortium recommendation on the matter. And finally, we can develop a machine readable edition of these rules when defined 
to ameliorate fully automated semantic annotations algorithms. So finally, I acknowledge that this work has been supported by the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Tunisia within the framework of Federated Research Project PRF of 19 D1P1. As well, the work of Alejandro Biad Morfes has been funded by the University of Alicante, the University of Havana and Giraltet Valenciana, as well as the Spanish government through the project Living Lang and SIA. Thank you very much. So I am free now to receive questions if you want. Okay, uh, let, uh, let me thank you for the presentation. Uh, so uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, let me say that uh, uh, we, you can use the chat uh, to, uh, to ask your questions during uh, the presentations, but uh, you can also unmute yourself right now and uh, ask something. Okay, uh, if there are uh, not uh, yet any questions from the audience, uh, one first question from my side is, uh, which was your motivation uh, behind this work? So uh, did you start this uh, just uh, um, as a, a, a basic research interest uh, for you uh, to, to, to try to do, do this classification and uh, identify uh, the strengths and weaknesses of uh, all these data models? Do you have a particular application in mind? And uh, are you currently working on extending this work in another uh, field, not uh, in COVID uh, specifically? Well, when uh, I'm actually a medical student and I am working on biomedical knowledge engineering, and what I seen is that many of the biblio uh, of uh, the biomedical uh, relation uh, extraction things depend on semantic annotation. And so, what what I have observed is that the ontologies that were created for COVID-19, for example, or for any other disease, lack efficiency and precision from a medical perspective. And I was interested to see the reasons behind that. And so I went back to see how uh, the, if the standards, for, for example, the use of RDFS or other ontologies for defining, for defining the, the ontology of uh, of biomedical domains has been the reason or another thing. And I went back until I reached the first step of the inline semantic annotations. And I found out that the data models that have been created had many issues. And that the understanding of people of the data models they are using is quite limited. And when you ask people, I have been in conferences before, actually see class conferences where Tunisian people are there. And I asked them several questions on the matter and they just do not have an answer. And so that's all I, uh, I have benefited, if I may say, from the COVID-19 and the COVID-19 semantic annotations uh, projects to go through this problem and see what happens and how people make annotation in, uh, in general. So that's how it works. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, for, the, for the interest of time, we should move in the next uh, presentation. However, uh, let me take the, again the opportunity to uh, congratulate you and thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's go to the next uh, work, which is uh, titled... Uh, sorry? Sorry? quantifying the topic disparity of uh, scientific articles uh, by uh, Moon Hyun Kim, uh, uh, Zisung Yoon, uh, Hu Sang Jung, and uh, Hui Nook Kim. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, I did not pronounce them well, but uh, apologies for that. So uh, can you share your screen? Thanks. Yes. Can you see this window? Okay, great. So hello everyone. Uh, 
Oops. I think I have to open another one. Is it working now? Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. Okay, thank you. So hello from Boston. So it's 3.30 a.m. So please understand me so if I make some mistakes. So it's really late at night. Uh, so it's my pleasure to present our paper uh, quantifying the topic disparity of scientific articles at this year's Psyche conference, so workshop. Uh, my name is Hyunwoo Kim, and I'm an assistant professor at Boston University Metropolitan College. And this is a joint work with my collaborators, so Moon Jung Kim and Ji Sung Yoon and Woo Sung Jung from Pohang University of Science and Technology in Korea. So as my co-authors are not here, so I just want to introduce my co-authors with their profile photos. And this your research uh, is an extension from the, mass, uh, the bachelor's thesis from the first author, the Moon Jung Kim. Um, so we were motivated to understand how citation is determined, especially focusing on uh, the conventionality and whether we can use text uh, to measure conventionality of a paper. So as you already know, so citation count is determined by many different factors, so including team size, gender, journal, career age, conventionality. So large team gets more citations and unfortunately female authors uh, lose citations and papers published in prestigious journals and written by senior authors get more citations. Um, and the last one is the factor we want to focus on is conventionality. So papers with conventional topics get more citations uh, compared to papers with novel topics, while papers with novel topics can be more highly cited. So it means so it could be both risky and impactful. And to measure conventionality of papers, there are many methods uh, suggested. Uh, and a common approach is to use journal pairs. So for example, uh, within the papers, you can see the references and, and also you can see journals uh, cited in that paper. And from the list of journals, you can construct journal pairs and then also calculate the z-scores, how the journal pair frequently appears in the papers. Uh, so for each paper, we can get the, the z-scores of journal papers uh, journal pairs, and if G score is higher, then it means the journal pair is appearing frequently uh, more than expectations, so it becomes conventional. And uh, from the list of G scores of journal pairs, we can also get median G score, and it is the central tendency of conventionality. And according to the paper uh, by Uzi et al. in uh, 2013, Science. Uh, about 3% of papers have negative median G-score, which means have uh, so overall so novel uh, components are included. And at the same time, it means that there is strong tendency for conventionality. So our question is, can we use text rather than journal pairs to measure conventionality? Because of course, journal pairs include some information, but we think using text, we can better estimate conventionality because text include many things and also information. And so we use document embedding. So document embedding is a technique to convert document to vector. So, so in other words, we convert discrete object to continuous numerical values. Specifically, we used SPECTRE, uh, which is specialized for scientific articles because they, uh, this method is citation-based approach and with the loss of function uh, as follows. So to simplify, so the papers uh, have uh, the, the cite or cited by each other, so we'll be close on the vector space. And after training the embedding vectors, we distribute the papers published in 2019 
uh, under the disciplines, the so 49 disciplines, level one uh, field of study codes in Microsoft Academic Graph. And so these are, so each dots are papers and big dots uh, means uh, first level FOS code. And you can see that this map uh, is quite well organized. And on the right side, so you can see biology, starting from biology, go to sociology, social science, and then move to computer science and science and engineering. So this figure uh, is consistent with uh, various maps of science in literature. So from this figure, um, we think that the document embeddings uh, represent the papers quite well. So it means at the same time, we can use those factors to understand uh, how the paper is deviating from the, the central theme of discipline. So that's why we try to define topic disparity. So we define this measure, uh, it's quite simple. So first uh, we calculate discipline vector uh, by averaging paper vectors within the discipline and then calculate the cosine distance between discipline vector and the paper vector and uh, consider this cosine distance as topic disparity. So it means if topic disparity is higher then a paper uh, deviates more from a central theme of a discipline. And we put this measure into a regression model to understand how it is related to citation. Uh, and as I mentioned in the, the first slide, so there are many factors about citation. So we include team size, gender, gen, uh, general impact, and career age. And so these factors are included in quantile regressions, 50th, uh, 75th, and 95th. But 25th is excluded because all citations are zero. And gender is inferred from uh, the first name uh, by using genderized service. And general impact is measured uh, based on the every citation counts by journal. So we put one top one third journals as high general impact and the bottom one third as low general impact. And career as is the number of papers as first or last authors. So there are two versions of career age, career age first and career age last, and team size, career age, and topic disparity are normalized in regressions. Uh, and these are the results, and we try six different models to see how each attribute affects the change by uh, other factors. And uh, surprisingly, so we can uh, confirm that all liter or observations in literature uh, are reproduced. So you can see the high journals uh, increase citations and normalized team size is also possibly correlated with citations, career age. So senior authors get more citations and female authors lose citations. Uh, but so, our focus is disparity, topic disparity. So in all quantiles, 50th, 75th, and 95th, so the coefficients are negative and significant at the level of uh, 0 0.001. So it means, so these negative correlations are quite significant and it means the papers uh, of high topic disparity. So which in other words, less conventional papers tend to receive fewer citations than conventional papers. So it, this confirms uh, the use of the topic disparity to measure conventionality. To summarize, so our paper tries to um, suggest a new approach to measure conventionality from text. Uh, so we use document embedding, embeddings and calculate the distance uh, between discipline vector and the paper vector. And the tables are consistent with literature, which is great because it confirms that we can use this topic disparity in addition to general pair approach to measure conventionality of a paper. And one advantage of using this method uh, is because we convert the text onto an embedding space and it's quite simple. Uh, so we can do more operations on a vector space uh, to analyze the impact of other factors such as the accessibility of research papers or the author's demographics on citation counts. And also so on the vector space, we can see which papers are uh, at the periphery of a discipline 
And with, so it means with a qualitative case study uh, that uh, examines how this paper is different from the center theme. And it will support the use of topic disparity or measure. And also we can compare, we expect to compare our measure with uh, other approaches, including general pair approach. So we really appreciate the reviewers comments because so they suggest us to use uh, the quantum regressions with normalized attributes and also uh, suggest further plans. So we really appreciate that. And I'm happy to answer uh, any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, the uh, speaker. So are there any questions from the audience side? I cannot see anything in the chat, but you can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, if there are no questions from the audience, I have a quick one. Uh, so uh, your work uh, tries to identify uh, the uh, publications that are not conventional, let's say, uh, for a particular field of study. Uh, and uh, you are measuring something like uh, uh, the dissimilarity uh, of uh, the topic of the uh, publication to the general topic. Uh, but um, this could be a sign of uh, two things. The one thing is that uh, this is a, a very uh, specific work uh, at, at uh, uh, a, a very not very focused work in the field. Uh, but the other option is that uh, this is a new work, a novel work that uh, tries to create a subfield, let's say, uh, that was not uh, present uh, before. Uh, do you have any mechanisms to identify such cases? Do you plan to, to, to investigate uh, uh, how this, uh, um, uh, this phenomenon uh, um, af affects uh, your analysis, something like that? Thank you for the question. So um, so my co-authors uh, major in physics. So I think physics would be a good uh, discipline to study more deeply. So, so our plan, possible plan is to apply the method to all the, the papers in APS dataset and see the, how it uh, overlaps with their so discipline trees and see whether we can use this method to see the papers uh, in between the two subfields within the physics, and then we can see the how it works, and then it will provide more insights into the method and the subfield as well. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, so I think that uh, since we are short of time, uh, I would like to thank again the speaker. And there is one uh, question, Tanaz, is in the chat. Okay. From so sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I... Error bars. Uh, yeah. Could you specify the slide? So these errors come from the regressions, and this is not an error bars. So this is the distribution of the topic disparity by discipline. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 So it, it's okay. Uh, so let me thank you again for your presentation, and I think that uh, it's time that uh, I left the stage to Angelo, right? Angelo? Yes, are... yes, it's me. Yes. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. No, I thought I was muted. So yeah, the next uh, talk, uh, so now I'll be, I'll be sharing this, uh, uh, this part of the, of the session, and uh, the next talk is uh, a vision paper called titled Personal Research Knowledge Graphs from Prantika Chakraborty, Sadak, Sadakshina Dutta, and uh, the Barshi Kumar Sanyal. And basically they will talk to us how to represent structural information about the research activities of the researchers. So are there the speaker here? Uh, okay, the Barshi. Yes. Uh, hello, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so. I'll be sharing my screen. I am Prantika Chakraborty, and I'll be, I'm the first author and I'll be representing the paper. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Sure. 
Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Prantika Chakraborty and I am a PhD scholar in the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. And today I will be talking about the vision paper, Personal Research Knowledge Graph, which is a joint work with Sudakshina Datta from Indian Institute of Technology, Goa, and Devarshi Kumar Shannal from Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. Now, the motivation for our paper is that a researcher's activities can entail various aspects. So these can include problem solving, which requires a thorough understanding of the problem and knowledge of prior techniques that have been used to solve those problems and new and innovative ideas and then implementations for problem solving. But a researcher's activities also include management of a research lab and various collaborations, project collaborations. Now, all of these might sometimes management of all of these activities might sometimes hinder uh, or uh, bring a, uh, will, might prevent a smooth flow of a researcher's activities. And one way of handling this issue is to have a smart personal virtual assistant who might be able to answer the questions that the researchers might have uh, to deal with all of these issues. Now, let us look at an example. And we look at an uh, example conversation between a computer scientist named Sunita and Sky Jeeves, which is a smart personal virtual assistant. Now, Sunita had used a visualization tool to analyze a time series whose name uh, she currently cannot recall. So she asks the Sky Jeeves, the personal assistant about it, who promptly replies tempo -vis, because it has access to the information of Sunita's uh, uh, information related to Sunita's research. Now, she might also wonder what GPU are there in her lab uh, or the lab that she manages. And the assistant might uh, come up with the answer of NVIDIA A100 GPU, which is available in her lab. Now, this smart personal virtual assistant can access all this information if we can provide it with a knowledge graph. But knowledge graphs are mostly public. And the information that they contain are globally relevant and might not shed much light on the day-to-day -day activities of a researcher. So enter personal knowledge graph, uh, which, which was first proposed by Christian Ballock and Tom Cantor, who defined it as a resource of structured information about entities personally related to its user, their attributes, and the relations between them. Here we can see an example of a personal knowledge graph where the user is the main entity and every other entity is connected with the user entity because and only those entities that are relevant to the user are contained in this personal knowledge graph. In our vision paper, we propose the idea of a personal research knowledge graph, which is a specialized version of the PKG mentioned previously. This uh, personal research knowledge graph, as the name suggests, is suited more for the researchers. And it contains information uh, regarding the professional activities of the researcher, like the affiliations of the researchers, uh, their publications, and the projects they're involved in, the course courses they're offering, or the research interest. It will also contain the personal and shared lab resources of the researcher, along with fine-grained knowledge items that have been uh, extracted from the various papers or the works of the researcher, like the current task that uh, they are working on, the methods that they're using to deal with the problem and the data sets they're using. Let us look at an example of a PRKG of Sunita. So here we can see that the works for relation connects our main user entity Sunita to various institutes like ISRK and ISCS. We also see that she is connected to the task topic modeling. And from this, we can conclude that Sunita is currently working on the task topic modeling or has previously worked on this task. Our PRKGs, the entities of our PRKGs will also be connected to uh, public knowledge graphs so that we can obtain more information about these entities like OpenAlex. Now, we will be discussing about ways to populate the PRKG. One way of discussing this 
is by designing an AI chatbot agent who can hold conversation with the researcher and extract information from the sentences uttered by the researcher. Like, uh, I am currently working on topic modeling and I'm using the 20 NG data set. So the agent might extract uh, relevant information from those statements, but this might not always be very, uh, uh, very effective as a researcher might not talk about this uh, by themselves. So what the chatbot agent can do is elicit these responses by asking probing questions like, what are you currently working on? Or what machine are you currently using? Another way of populating the PRKG is activity tracking. The chatbot agent can track the papers that the researcher is downloading or and, or, and extract relevant information from those papers regarding her research ideas or research interests. Another way of uh, activity tracking is if the chat agent is granted permission to passively listen to research meetings that the researcher might have because uh, there is relevant information also in those meetings. But uh, the privacy, con uh, since there is a privacy concern in this matter, so uh, the agent might, the agent will only be able to passively listen when it is allowed to listen to any meeting. The final way of uh, populating a PRKG that we suggest is by reading through the early drafts of manuscripts that the researcher is writing. Since a paper might take some time to get published, so waiting for the paper to get published and then to extract information from it might take a lot of time. So in order to prevent that delay, we can allow the chatbot agent to go through the manuscripts of the paper that the researcher is currently writing and uh, take up relevant information from it. Now, research is mostly a collaborative activity and it involves collaboration between various individuals and our groups. So sharing a PRKG in this case will help the collaborators to gain uh, informative insight regarding the research. But this also raises privacy concerns because since uh, because a, a PRKG contains every relevant information of a particular user, so it might also contain confidential information about the researchers, like the committees they are a part of or the papers that they're reviewing. And we wouldn't want the collaborators to have an access to those aspects of the PRKG. So one way of dealing with it is role-based access control. So using RBAC, every collaborator can be assigned a certain role who can then read, write, append, or control the PRKG. So this is an, prototype, a prototype of, the, of our Sunita's PRKG that we created using Neo4j browser 4.4.0. Uh, and here, we have used uh, Spurt, which is a deep neural network-based uh, tool to extract entities and relations from scientific data to uh, in extract the information uh, like from the papers that Sunita is reading. Like if Sunita is reading a paper whose main topic is CC link, so uh, using Spurt, we can uh, extract that this paper's main task is translation and the method to deal with this task has been word since disambiguation. So this, this can be one of the interests of Sunita. But we, here we also see that Sunita is a member of the PhD selection committee, and she is a reviewer of a paper called Science KG. Sorry to interrupt, Darbashi, just one minute. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm almost done. So, for a, so in order to implement this, we have created a collaborator role in Neo4j, and we have denied, first of all, we have denied the right collaborator to make any modification in the graph. Then we have denied the uh, collaborator to, to be able to read the what all selection committees uh, Sunita is a member of, or to look at the papers that uh, she is reviewing. Now, finally, uh, regarding future works, since it, this is a vision paper, our main goal is to bring this into reality. So, we will be designing a framework which researchers can create PRKGs from easily. And we also plan to uh, 
create an AI chatbot named SkyJeeves that will harbor the information from the PRKG. And we also plan to improve the privacy concerns by implementing property level RBAC on nodes and relationships of the entities. So these are my references. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you for the talk, Devashi. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'm Prantika. Uh, I'm the first author, so. Um, ah, okay. Sorry, because your name is uh, Dervashi. Okay, yeah. on the on. The, okay, I'll call you Prantika from now on. Sorry about that. Um, um, yeah. In the meantime, if uh, in the meantime people think about their questions, I can ask uh, uh, a question. So, um, to me, it looks an interesting project, and uh, as well as quite ambitious. So, I was thinking, um, have you got any idea on uh, where to start from? because eventually would like to start small before building the whole tool so I i'm wondering what i'm wondering what is your priority in terms of building this personal research knowledge graph what kind of information you want to ingest initially so like we discussed in uh, the my, uh, the slide when we talked about populating the prkg so uh, just a second yeah so First, we will be, our main aim is to first design a knowledge graph, but, uh, and we first uh, plan on running it on the papers that a researcher might be reading uh, or writing to extract relevant information. Uh, and then we also have, uh, we also plan to, we had planned to uh, use manual, uh, manual processes to populate it, but that will be quite time seeking. So initially we all, we first, we also plan to design the chatbot because that will be able to extract relevant, first relevant informations like the affiliations or uh, the, the number of courses that a researcher is offering. So, yeah. Okay, there is one question from the chat from uh, Castel Noll. Uh, do you plan to publish your framework as open source software? Uh, yes, sure. So that all the researchers can use it because that was our main aim to help the researchers uh, and to make the lives of researchers easy using a smart chatbot who can use the personal research knowledge graph. Okay. There is uh, another question in the chat from Mat Mat Matthias Sesbu. Um, who, who thanks you for the presentation and loves your idea. And uh, he asks whether uh, you have explored this, the SOLID project, I think from uh, the MIT um, and how you could integrate it with yours. Uh, no, we haven't yet, but thanks for the suggestion. We will really look into it. Okay. Um, I have a final question uh, since um, I'm here. I would like, I'm interested to know, uh, I mean, of course, researchers are, uh, at, we can find researchers at different career stage. So we have, might have PhD students from research associate fellows and then professors. Have you thought about different use cases of your personal research knowledge graph? Yes, we have. Uh, we have actually, uh, before uh, delving into the idea, we asked a few researchers also in the institutes regarding what all uh, what all they might want in the knowledge graph and what all they might want the chatbot to be able to answer. So uh, the priorities are obviously different for different stages of researcher. So yeah, uh, we will be taking that into consideration as well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now it's about time about uh, it's time uh, for the uh, following paper, which is um, a long paper from uh, Daniel Kershaw and Rob Rob Curling, and uh, the title of the paper is "Sequence Based Extractive Summarization from uh, Four Scientific Articles." So I guess that uh, Daniel will be presenting, right? Yes. Hello. Okay. Cool. Right. Uh, da, da, da. The standard question, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we do. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Kershaw. I'm a senior data scientist at Elsevier. Um, I'll be presenting a paper on sequence-based extractive summarization for scientific articles. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, my co-author Rob Holland can't be here today, but he sends his best wishes. So um, uh, quickly, first an overview. Um, I'm first going to introduce the problem we're trying to solve here at Elsevier. Um, then we're going to look at the available data sets that we have, how we then use and utilize our data sets to develop um, a data set for extractive summarization. I will then focus on the models and the baselines that we um, developed in this uh, research method. And then I'll focus on the results and then finally move on to the conclusions. So what is the problem we're trying to solve here at um, Elsevier? Um, as I'm sure most people on this call are aware, Elsevier is one of the world's largest scientific publication houses with roughly 25 million articles within our archives. The, the, main, the main platform which these articles are served on is Science Direct. Um, this is seen as the, an entrance to our archives. And people come here to find the research that they need uh, to conduct their research. Um, as you can see here, um, we can see the title, the abstract. However, there is a lot of information which a uh, user is overwhelmed with on a daily basis, be this from the number of figures, numerous tables, links to other articles, citation information. But the core bit of information that they are wanting to get access to is the content, is the text within the, the article, and particularly the key points that the researcher has written within this article. Sometimes this can take a long time. These articles can be 30 to 40 pages long, and they can be quite intensive to try and find uh, the information you're wanting. And at Elsevier, we're wanting to make this a bit easier. We have three use cases within our um, core concepts when developing new products. Use case one is trying to find the relevant information for you allowing researchers to quickly assess um, whether the paper is what they are looking for. Um, in essence, trying to find what the approach the person is using, what is novel about this research. Then the next paper, next uh, concept we try doing is understanding, allowing users to navigate to the appropriate locations that they need to do. Um, is, what is the context that these findings are in? Can you give me all the places in this paper where this spe uh, specific finding is discussed? And the third uh, research or the third use case that we usually focus on is discover more. These are the traditional recommender systems, allowing people to connect to other papers. Um, and you can see my other publications for that. However, this through going through these different use cases, we came up with the idea of um, can we can we use extractive summarization to find the key points um, and uh, findings within a scientific document? And you may be questioning why we're using um, extractive and not abstractive summarization. Abstractive is where we ba where you basically go and rewrite the document in new text. However, we believe our authors are some of the best writers in the world. And the tool which we are aiming to develop is not to rewrite their documents, but to allow us to identify the important parts of the document. So what text? What data do we have available? Um, what data do we have available? At Elsevier, um, as I said before, we have access to 25 million full text articles. Um, and this just isn't, isn't just the original document which has been submitted. It is the structured XML documents. So this gives us access to the figures, the annotations of the figures, tables, um, fully resolved references with DOIs. Um, titles, section headings, all within um, accessible XML. In addition to this, we have access to the title, um, the title along with the abstract. Um, and sometimes these are in different languages. So if we focus on French publications, they'll submit multiple lang language versions of these two bits of data points. And these, the abstract and title can be seen as sort of becoming more summary-like of the findings. Uh, when people write abstracts in different fields, they are very structured compared to others. We also have additional side bits of information, um, such as the keywords. Um, these are generally author generated. They sometimes don't align with a taxonomy or a gazetteer of keywords. We also have um, impact metrics or article based metrics, uh, such as citation counts, social media impact, fact, social media um, exposure, um, and along with additional things such as the number of saves, downloads um, into different citation managers. And then we have uh, references. The majority of our references are backed by Scopus and are fully resolved. So this allows us to give a deep understanding into the, into the scientific uh, knowledge graph. However, the bit of information which um, is really important here 
for extracts of summarization are the highlights. So in essence, author-based highlights um, are submitted on 100% of new documents that are signed elsewhere. And these highlights have four to five bullet points, which we ask authors to summarize their core findings within a document. These should be generally snappy and to the point, highlighting the main findings and contributions. So someone can easily go and look at um, them and understand. So that whereas an abstract is a bit more narrative, this should be what is the take home. However, these only cover 8% of documents. However, these documents cover about 25% of traffic. So we can see here that there is, a light, there is a disproportionality of them in more recent documents. However, we know more recent documents are more access. So in essence, um, what one can see is that a paper, full text, can be sub, um, summarized to an abstract, when an abstract being sort of the uh, a contents narrative version, whereas the author highlights are the more um, salient points of the article, what's the take home points that we're aiming to get from an article. So this means the ultimate research question we have here is, can we predict which sentences in a document made the best set of author highlights? And this being that, can we go from a full text document to about four or five bullet points? But the main problem here is we don't have access, we don't have, um, whereas with abstractive summarization, you're trying to rewrite to target the, uh, say, highlights or the abstract. Extractive, we need to have labels on the sentences within the document saying these are good summary sentences or, or these are good sentences which are like highlights. To do this, we use greedy-based sampling um, to identify sentences within the document which are very much like the highlights that an author has submitted. So this means that we can take the highlights and assign labels to the sentences within the documents. And the greedy-based sampling works like this. We first select the sentence within the document, which is most like the set of highlights. We then go through, and for each, each, sentence, in the, each sentence within the document, we add this to our sort of um, um, constructed summary, which we have previously done, to find which sentences, when added, increases the similarity to the, the author highlights the most. And we keep doing this until there is no increase in, the, in a target metric. And the target metric we focus on um, is Rouge, um, particularly Rouge Recall. So Rouge is a metric used within um, summarization and extractive summarization uh, NLP tasks. And it is an, a similarity measure. It's quite similar to, say, cosine similarity or um, Hamming distance. However, this focuses on n grams, or um, there are other derivatives such as the longest sequence, uh, longest common sequence, and it looks at the overlapping um, n gram structure within the highlights, within a target target pool and a candidate pool. Um, if you would like to know more about this, please go and uh, read the paper. Um, and there's uh, a lot of literature around Rouge. I am aware there are other better metrics. However, this was a, a good starting point. So this means for this document about bioactivity and uh, bioactivity guided cut CCC strategy, we can see here that we have um, four highlights or quite short, um, talking about sort of online storage and recycling. These are the highlights that come out. So we first get number one and two, number highlight number one, or sentence number one, I must say, um, in order to enhance efficiency is more sort of a narrative describing what they're going to do. Number two appears to be uh, results. Three, again, a bit narrative. Four, conclusion. Um, and six, conclusion as well. So we can start seeing here that it is pulling out sort of salient points. So from here, we go and generate a test training test train and validation data set. And these are full text documents we have access to. So in tests, this is about 100,000 um, 100, sample across scientific disciplines. Um, test is about 41,000 documents. Train is about 83,000. Through using the greedy sampling technique, we are on average have about 10 positive samples per document. So these are sentences which we say are very much like the, the author-based highlights. And on average, we have about 160 sentences per document and 24 uh, tokens per sentence. And this is the same across all three sets. And ultimately, by doing this greedy sampling technique means we can treat this problem as a sequence prediction problem, where um, sentences are in a sequential order, one through n, and then the positive and negative labels indicate whether they are part of the, the constructed summary, the highlights that we want to construct.
And this then me this means that we can then uh, use um, sequence tagging techniques, which have previously been used in uh, more traditional NLP tasks, such as uh, pos tagging or uh, name density extraction. So for this, we use a bidirectional LSTM. Uh, with the sentences encoded in numerous different ways as the input each um, time step within the um, unrolled LSTM. The hidden states, the two LSTMs are then concatenated, and then the class A, a, um, a linear um, a multi-layer perceptual network is applied on top of that uh, with a soft max for a classification. However, which sentence embedder do we use? When reviewing the literature, there is a, a numerous amount of sentence embedders which are used. For this, we went simple. We decided to go from basics. Uh, words are represented, or tokens in this case, are represented as um, embeddings themselves, and we take from the um, pre-trained embeddings, and we take from glove. So we use the um, dim 100 dimension glove vectors. And then we test three different embeddings, mean, CNN, and RNN. Mean is where we just take the harmonic mean across the sentence to find the mean word embedding. This has been known to have issues previously where the, you just end up in some sort of like gray space. CNN, where we do go, take a one dimensional CNN with varying widths and pass over the word embeddings to produce a sentence embedding. And finally, an RNN um, embedder, where we uh, have an RNN with a LSTM cell in it and concatenate the final states of the single layered bidirectional RNN to make the sentence embedder. Um, going from top, this is quite fast. Mean is quite um, um, efficient to compute. CNN is medium. However, the LSTM and RNN are quite slow, especially when um, placed into another RNN. Additionally, though, um, when looking at traditional research in extracts of summarization, uh, we had there are additional sentence features, um, which have been used to identify summary sentences within scientific documents such as sentence of love with title, um, abstract embeddings, general classifications. Um, so one of our experiments looks at in concatenating these onto the end of these sentence embeddings to add additional contextual information. Our baseline model um, comes from Colin et al., um, again, a work uh, supported by Elsevier, where instead of using a sequence-based approach, they use a pointwise-based approach, where they just take apply binary classification to each sentence with additional information passed forward. So that means there is no contextual information being passed between sentences. So the experimental results, um, the part which you have all been waiting for. So when looking at um, the um, core uh, sentence, um, core sequence tagging uh, model that we have with a varying, uh, uh, varying sentence embedders, we can see that um, different um, sentence embedders have different, um, these are not accuracy measures, these are rouge measures. So the higher the rouge measure, the better or the better the similarity to the target-based um, summary. Um, the first column represents the um, sentence embedder. The second column uh, means whether we turned on the ability to uh, modify the word embeddings from glove. And we, then we did a breakdown of the different uh, disciplines. We can see here that uh, CNN with a uh, the uh, sentence with the word embeddings being able to be uh, retrained has, overall has the highest rouge score of twenty two point one nine. However, uh, when looking at computing and economics, it is the uh, CNN without that embedding turned on. Um, but we can see a stability across all disciplines, with the worst performing being the um, mean embedders. However, there is very little difference, but the difference is, is statistically significant as we run each model five times and did um, st um, st statistical significance testing between the results. However, when we look at applying additional features, we see there is very limited uplift in the results. Um, this model here is a CNN-based uh, model with additional features um, on a sentence level and a document level, and we can see that there is marginal improvements. However, when compared to the baseline model, which is the Collins et al. model, we can see very large statistically significant improvements in moving from a pointwise based model to a sequential based tagging model. However, one of the issues that is known with a sequence based model, especially when using for extractive summarization, is that there is a potential for the dependency on structure within the document. We know scientists and authors write documents in a very structured way, and that is why we are wanting to use a, a, a sequence based model, because we want to encapsulate um, some of that um, structure within the model. However, if the model all is learning the structure, then why, what is the point of using it in the text? 
So for this, we go and um, train the model uh, once uh, with a structure and then go and shuffle the input. Um, the say we take the validation data set and shuffle the inputs of each document, thus testing for the dependency on the structure of the doc the structure of the document themselves. So we can see here that when shuffled, there is a marginal re marginal reduction in the quality of the quality of the um, summarization at the end. So this would indicate there is a marginal reliance on the structure. However, this is not overtly um, overtly dominating within the model, which is quite an interesting finding, I think. However, having these having root space metrics is all and good. A number is all and good. However, people need to read these things. It is fine having words in a sentence, but if the words don't make sense, it is a, a pointless exercise. For this, we engaged a lot of our editorial staff here at Elsevier. We, we have the, we're fortunate to work with Lancet on a daily basis. And for this, we set up a big experiment using human and uh, a human in the loop with the editors, we call it. And we asked them to rate the automated summaries um, by first selection, by the ranking of them, the simplicity, and then the com overall complete set. Um, and um, this um, allowed us to come up with some sort of metrics um, to baseline our results against. This is an example of the um, survey we asked them to complete. We can see we gave them the abstract, links to the documents, and gave them a like it scale, like it scale of one to four. Um, asking them to rate it on varying dimensions. And across the disciplines, uh, we saw that the results, um, so we can see here that we have the disciplines again broken down by biosciences, computing and economics. We can see that we are roughly getting above um, 50%, uh, above, roughly above 50% threshold. So we're get, getting sort of into the, um, not good, not sort of one would say good. Um, however, this is still slightly lower than the author-based highlights. Um, when talking to the editors, one of the issue, interesting insights for the editors were that the author-based highlights were equally not that good, um, which was quite an interesting insight um, from this research. However, let's look at one of these highlights or one of these um, outputs. So approximate optimal social choice under uh, metrics preference uh, from a uh, social media journal um, or artificial intelligence journal um, from some research in the UK. You can see here that it is predominantly focusing on social choice, metric preference, and uh, Euclidean preference. And when we look at the highlights um, which have been extracted, we see that um, for the first one, as we show closely these results, um, so results based, our other objectives, so again, looking at results. Um, again, another results one showing that um, the results are highly distorted. And then focusing on the rules, so about the metric costs and order preference. And then we provide, um, we prove that distortion of every voting rule um, that always outputs a subset of uncovered sets. So we can start here seeing here these are very results driven. So we see this as a very positive way. You can see more examples of the extractions in the paper with a more in depth analysis of the um, forms of outputs. However, to summarize, um, we present an empirical analysis um, using sequential based models for extract summarization. Results show that through the application of basic CNN models that we get particularly good results, and that summaries can be produced which are good as those provided by the authors of the paper. Depending on the discipline, though, we see varying uh, degrees of reliance on the structure of the article. And in further research, we are looking at to use more complex sentence embeddings such as BERT or uh, using uh, some more research out of um, other research groups, which can take into account the to uh, tokens such as the proteins um, and gene names, which are commonly treated as random embeddings. Thank you for having me. Um, and are there any questions? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so there is one question in the chat. And um, yeah, he, Jian Wu is asking whether your data and software is publicly available. So there is a subset of the data available in an article I released 18 months ago called the o Elsevier Open Access CC BY Corpus, which is about 60,000, I believe, 60,000 um, full text documents which are covered by a CC BY license. All of them, or the majority of them, have um, author highlights, these four sentences, along with fully passed text documents um, 
I don't believe the um, say images are included in there, but um, the full, I believe, um, a fully parsed structures in there, which allows people to replicate this research. Um, the code isn't publicly available, um, but um, there are versions of it which are um, from other um, other tasks. It's in essence a, a standard post tag of uh, set of converters. Okay, uh, do you plan to release this code or is not your? Is um, it's, uh, as I'm sure people are aware, it, it, it would be quite challenging for me to release the code. But there is a there is a very large data set which people, I will put okay. in the chat, which people can go and uh, use. Okay, in the chat there is Derbashi or Prantica, not sure. Um, um, who is suggesting uh, they have used pointer generator networks uh, proposed by Manning? Uh, from, from Stanford to generate research highlights from abstracts. So maybe you want to have a look at this paper. Yeah. And um, Ian, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've looked at, we looked at abstracted, but as I said at the beginning, um, we treat our authors as the, as the best authors that they can be. So um, we decided that wasn't a feasible way uh, moving forward, but we do have evidence that say that points of generator networks do generate quite good um, summaries. Okay. Then there is one other question from Jian Wu. Why not using Blur? Uh, which focus or blue, uh, which focus more on precision? So there's, uh, yeah, we could have. Um, we chose uh, recall, uh, Rouge because there is multiple versions of Rouge. So there's Rouge Precision, Rouge, Rouge Recall, uh, Longest Common Form, which allows us to experiment with the forms of the output. So Rouge Precision allowed, would have uh, created much shorter summaries because it had a tendency of selecting in the greedy sampling framework of selecting shorter based sentences because it's focusing on completeness of the sentences. Whereas the recall, which we focus on, we were wanting more sort of like descriptive longer based sentences. Um, so recall allowed the algorithm to choose uh, sentences which had more of the target summary within the within the, the, the sentence which had been selected. So it is, it's just purely, we looked at it, um, it was just purely a design-based choice for the, the type of highlight we were wanting at the end. Okay, I have a final question. I, I, I might have misheard, but uh, I'm not sure um, with your wood embeddings that you use, the, the GLOVE one, uh, did you use a pre-trained one or you trained it on your own corpus? Uh, it was pre-trained off the, the standard one people download off um the website um but the one we turned on the uh re being able to retrain the embeddings that would have been then retrained on the the uh, training process of the, the model okay so there's no, they, they weren't is... they they weren't scientific they weren't trained on scientific corpuses okay no because in our experience of training um were the embeddings um i my experience is that if the word embedding work best if they are trained for the task they will be used for. Yeah. So perhaps it would be ideal to work on scientific corpus and then use the pre -trained, the trained ones on the scientific corpus to for the task. Yeah. This is just a, okay, just a suggestion. Perfect. Then if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to move to the next speaker, the next paper, which is a short paper. Assessing network representation for identifying interdisciplinarity from Elgan Cunningham and Derek Green. I believe Derek is going to present. Oh, Elgan. Ah, Elgan. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, can you see this? Okay. Yes, perfect. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Owen, and the work I'm presenting today is a collaboration with my supervisor, Derek Green, in the Insight Research Center in UCD. Um, and we're interested in using network representations to identify interdisciplinary research in, in research networks, primarily in, in citation graphs. Um, so to give a, a definition of, of interdisciplinary research, it's commonly defined as research which integrates expertise, data, or methodologies from two or more disciplines. And there are a lot of studies which quantify the interdisciplinarity of an article um, as some function of the balance, diversity, um, and dissimilarity of the disciplines which can be identified in its references or in cited research. So if we look to the, the citation graph on the right, the focal paper in the center, and it cites a, a number of 
uh, papers on the left. And each of those papers can be assigned to a different discipline, which I've shown with the colors. And using some function like the Rao Sterling Diversity Index, we, we can uh, quantify the interdisciplinarity of that paper according to the proportions and similarities of, of those disciplines, which we identify in the research, uh, which the paper cites. Now, obviously this approach is, is dependent on assigning research papers to specific disciplines. Um, and there are kind of issues with this. This becomes a difficult challenge. You need sort of defined uh, and concrete borders around research disciplines. And in a, an ever evolving scientific landscape, these, these borders are, are blurring uh, and, and contested. So in the case that we're not willing to assign research papers explicitly to disciplines, um, how are we to quantify research interdisciplinarity? Um, the approach that we're evaluating here is to use node embeddings. Um, and so the idea of an, a node embedding is to transfer a node on a graph into some low dimensional vector representation that preserves important similarities on the graph. So that is, we'd like to learn similar representations for nodes which are similar, and nodes could be similar according to their proximity. So nodes in the same community would learn similar embeddings or according to uh, structural equivalence. So nodes which play similar structural roles in the graph might have similar embeddings. Um, and our primary research question here is, is could embeddings uh, such as these learned on a citation graph encode research interdisciplinarity and could we use them to identify interdisciplinary research? Uh, so the data we use in our experiments, we take three uh, benchmark citation graphs. These are popular benchmark data sets from Cora, Sightseer and PubMed. They're quite small graphs uh, and they're quite sparse. They're about three to four citations per paper with each paper assigned to a discipline. Uh, there's between three and seven disciplines, although it's, it's difficult to find information on how these assignments are done um, and even what these disciplines are. They're sort of numbered rather than named. So we also use two um, of our own data sets, which we collect. Um, in the paper, we refer to them as Scopus 1 and Scopus 2. Um, these are our larger graphs. They're a little bit denser, six to seven citations per paper, and they're highly interdisciplinary. There's 26 disciplines, um, and we assign disciplines to papers according to the journal that they were published in, which is, is quite common in, in these kinds of um, studies which quantify interdisciplinarity. Um, and so our methods, um, we learned three sets of, of paper embeddings. The first is according to roll to vec which is um, uh, an approach that preserves structural equivalence on the graph. And the second and third are deep walk and node to vec which preserve that proximity relationship between the nodes. Um, and we'd like to evaluate the potential for these embeddings to encode research interdisciplinarity according to their utility in an interdisciplinary citation prediction task. Um, so the intuition here is that a representation that can be used to predict interdisciplinary citations must encode at some level the interdisciplinarity of the paper it represents and that it could be used to identify interdisciplinary research. Um, so to describe the citation prediction task, we have a, a citation graph populated by uh, nodes and citations, so papers and citations, and each paper can be assigned to a discipline. We can describe that graph as, as a set of edges where each edge is a pair of node IDs. Um, and we can split those edges or citations into train validation and test. We can then use negative sampling to collect a set of um, edges that did not exist in the original graph. Um, and then we can use an approach like deep walk to learn a set of node embeddings to map node IDs to dense vector representations um, according only to the training portion of the graph. Um, we can then use these representations to describe all of our edges as pairs of vectors. So we now have pairs of vectors that, that are positive that did exist in the graph and pairs of vectors that do not exist in the graph. And now our citation prediction task is just a binary classification task. So we can feed this data through something like a multi-level perceptron model, and we can evaluate citation prediction as uh, classification accuracy. And we'll measure this in area under the rock curve, and we'll report two scores. There's an overall um, citation prediction score or classification score, and then there's an ID or the interdisciplinary score. And this is just how well is the model able to uh, classify or, or to predict those edges which occur in the test set between papers of different disciplines. So when a paper is assigned to, when two papers are assigned to different disciplines, how well are we able to predict those citations between those papers? Um, and this is all with a kind of a binary definition of interdisciplinarity. So a citation is either within a discipline or it is between disciplines. Um, we'd also like to evaluate a sort of a continuous definition of, of interdisciplinarity. The idea here is that some topic discipline players are more distant than others. 
Um, for example, a citation that bridges mathematics and computer science could be considered less interdisciplinary than a citation that bridges chemistry and social science. Um, and we're interested in, you know, does the distance of this interdisciplinarity affect our ability to predict citations? Um, we define five metrics for measuring the distance of a citation. The first is according to the topics on the papers. And then we have four just according to distances on the graph. Um, so we have a simple graph distance, and then we have three according to the embeddings, which we've already calculated, just to get an idea of how far apart are these two papers. Um, and to clarify, the idea here is to explore how different embedding methods are able to predict citations between more distant topics. So to calculate these citation distances, the Scopus topic distance, um, we take a topic level citation matrix from 5 million papers. And then the distance between two topics is the cosine distance between the corresponding rows in the topic level citation matrix. Um, so two topics will be considered to be close if they have very similar citation patterns across all of the topics um, in, the, in the graph. And this is taken from a big graph of, of 5 million papers. So as an example, we compute the distance between the topics or the disciplines of medicine and immunology, microbiology to be very small, 0 0.04. And the distance between medicine and business management and accounting is, is very large, 0 0.8. Um, the graph and network distance is just the shortest path between the two nodes. And the embedding distance is the cosine distance between the two, uh, the embeddings for each node. So to clarify, we're interested in, um, in exploring the relationship between the citation distance and our ability to predict those citations. So as citations become more interdisciplinary, how are our uh, different prediction models able to, to predict those citations? So we'll group the citations in the test set by these different distance metrics and explore how that affects our, our classification accuracy. Um, so to summarize our results, um, we find that consistently predicting interdisciplinary citations is more difficult than predicting within discipline citations. Um, in the case of the benchmark data sets, our, the Rolte Vec model consistently outperforms the other two uh, in both the overall citation prediction and in predicting those interdisciplinary citations. Um, we find that the interdisciplinary citation prediction performance tends to correlate very strongly with the overall citation prediction performance. So a model that is good at predicting citations is also good at predicting those interdisciplinary citations. In the larger, denser data sets, which, which we collect, the relative model no longer performs the other methods. We find there's very little difference between um, the three. Um, but across all the graphs, the relative uh, structural sort of embeddings uh, have the smallest gap between the overall citation prediction performance and predicting those more difficult interdisciplinary citations. Um, in the case where we have a continuous definition of interdisciplinarity, so again, we're grouping the citations in the test set according to how distant um, the two papers are. And we're interested in how our different approaches are able to predict those highly interdisciplinary citations. We find that relative based citation prediction, the performance increases as citation distance increases according to all but one of our metrics of citation distance. And in the other case, the deep walk and no to vec based models, their performance decreases as that citation distance increases, suggesting that for those approaches, uh, more interdisciplinary citations are, are more difficult to predict. Um, so for our conclusions, we find that paper embeddings that preserve structural features on the nodes in the citation graph, such as the relative ec model, are better able to predict interdisciplinary citations than those that do not. Um, and these embeddings uh, may be useful in identifying interdisciplinary research without the use of prescribed uh, topic or discipline categories. Uh, going forward, we'd like to develop means of explaining the paper embeddings to understand which structural features relate to interdisciplinarity and uh, to see if we can interpret the different interdisciplinary roles of research papers. Um, obviously, we could expand the representations to include textual information as well as the structural information in the citation graph. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Elgon. Thank you for the talk. Are there any questions? Please feel free to use also the chat. In the meantime, that people think about uh, the question, I have one to ask to you. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you showed to us your five data sets and uh, with the corresponding citation numbers and you claimed that, uh, and you told us that the, the network is quite sparse. 
uh, this resonates to, with me quite a lot. And um, but actually, I'm a bit curious to know why um, all these data sets have, have very uh, low citations, like three to four point five citation on average per paper. I was expecting more citations, to be honest. So I'm kind of curious to know what is your idea about it. So, so this this was really surprising for me as well. These are um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with these benchmark data sets. They're used very commonly in uh, in graph learning papers. Um, a lot of the kind of early GNN papers evaluate on uh, node classification tasks, which is trying to assign papers in these graphs to their disciplines. Um, and I was really surprised when I actually started to use them to find that these are really sparse graphs. Um, I'm not entirely sure why it is. In the case of the, the data sets that we collect, we have difficulty producing really, really complete graphs because we're assigning um, papers to, to disciplines. It was necessary in, this, in these experiments that we could assign research papers to disciplines. And we did that according to the journal that they were published in. Um, which is the most common approach that we've seen in uh, the studies which try to evaluate interdisciplinarity. And so you can only sort of supplement your graph with papers in order to complete the completeness of the graph and the density of the graph. You can only supplement the graph with papers published in a particular set of index journals. Um, and this is what sort of limited our the density of our graph. But I mean, it is it's definitely more dense and a little bit more realistic than the, the, the benchmark citation graphs that we used. But I mean, really, none of this would be an issue if, if you didn't need a single approach to classifying research papers to disciplines, or if you were to use an alternative, maybe text-based approach. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. Are there other questions? I don't see any in the chat, if you want, please turn on your microphone, Nick, you can ask the question directly to the speaker. Hi. <coughs> Hi, Daniel. Sorry, Please, sorry. Just having, um, so the Scopus data sets, are they sort of like an intersection between like um, journals indexed in Scopus and documents which appear in the Microsoft, Microsoft academic graph? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, okay. That, that's exactly it. So, and what, how did how did you find the coverage? Like, what what did you find as like the intersection between them? Was it sparse or was it quite dense? Um, so, I guess yeah, we, we wanted as dense a, a graph as possible in terms of citations, and it needed to be sort of highly interdisciplinary. So we chose a, a seed set of topics according to the Scopus topics, okay. um, which I believe are the all science journal categorizations yeah. for for journals, and then we selected. Um, we collected just journal titles based off that and then collected the papers according to those journals in the mag. Okay. Um, so I couldn't speak exactly to the coverage because there wasn't a stage in that process where I knew how many papers oh, yeah. were published in those journals according to Scopus. But uh, it, it seemed really good to me. And that was obviously right before the mag uh, closed. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions? Otherwise we can go for coffee. Looks like not. So thank you very much, Elgan. So I guess that now we can have uh, some rest and uh, enjoy our cup of tea or coffee. Okay, so I think we should start with the second session. So my name is uh, Dimitris Sakharidis. I'm a professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. And I will be chairing the first half of the second uh, session. So uh, we have, uh, for this first half, we have uh, uh, two long papers and one short paper. So we will start with a short paper uh, titled Graph Site. Citation Intent Classification in Scientific Publications via uh, Graph Embeddings. And I believe we have uh, Dan here who will present the paper and Nicholas Cothors. So Dan, will you be presenting? Yeah, uh, Nicholas will be sharing the screen and we'll both uh, present it if it's okay. Of course. Okay, cool, thanks. Does it work? Like, do you see the screen? 
correct? Everything works fine? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So uh, today, Dan and I are going to present our paper on uh, station intent classification via graph embeddings. So this is a project that we did while at Ecole Polytechnique. And uh, this was under the supervision of Oana Balalao from uh, INRIA and Ecole Polytechnique. So to start uh, the presentation, I'm just going to give a bit of uh, motivation for why we studied this and why it is important. So as you can see here, uh, science is evolving at a really fast pace. So you can see the numbers of papers uh, from Semantic Scholar, and this number is very big. And uh, the second insight is that papers are connected, so they are not isolated, of course, because every paper will cite uh, some other papers. And so this, these connections uh, are really important to understand uh, how fields evolve. And this leads us to two conclusions. The first one is that stations are important because they show how, how papers are connected. And station intents are important because they show why papers are connected. And uh, we chose to focus on this aspect, uh, which adds a layer of complexity uh, in this uh, project. So to illustrate this, I'm going to start by explaining what is the, the challenge here. So what we want to do is a multi-class classification. And here you can see an example uh, of a station taken from our own paper. So, uh, so the question here is, uh, why did we put this citation in our paper? So what is the, the intent of this citation? And you may say it's because it's background information, or you may say it's uh, because it's a method or it might be a comparison with the previous result. And if you look at this uh, citation carefully, uh, you can see that the right answer is that it's a, comp a comparison with the previous result. So in the citation, uh, Nicolas have just shown that it's quite easy to get uh, what's the intent, but in some citation as this one that uh, in blue that we put in the paper, it's more ambiguous. So an NLP solution could be to use more context than only the citation phrase, like using the previous sentence and the sentence after. But in our opinion, it can still be ambiguous. And we did the assumption, we made the assumption that graph can add uh, global information that's useful to uh, be better on ambiguous uh, intents. So for instance, if a paper A is citing a paper B and the intent is quite ambiguous, then let's imagine that there are five other papers, C to G, that are all citing paper B for a motivation intent, because maybe B is like a linguistic uh, paper pointing to one very complex thing in machine translation and paper C to G are technical paper trying to address this issue, then probably paper A is also citing paper B for motivation purpose. So the data we have, uh, in addition to the citation sentence, can be titled, section, more context. And this is the NLP approach that was developed in previous work. But also, um, we can get access to author, venue, year, and all those information can help building a graph. That's what we did in our approach. The, the data sets we use for station intent prediction are um, ACL ARC made of uh, about 2K citations split into six intents extracted from NLP papers and SciSite um, made of 11K citations split into background methods and result comparison intents. And those papers were extracted for computer science and medicine fields. The challenge here is that ACL ARC and SciSite are very sparse uh, data set, meaning that if we try to construct, uh, to build a graph from those data set, we will end up with a graph looking like graph, graph, uh, figure A here, which means that we have very few uh, connected, uh, large connected components. And so we had, we needed to get access to a larger database in order to uh, build a graph. But then the question is, um, which graph would be helpful, which graph we want to construct, to build, should we add authors, should we add venues, so yeah, we tried different solutions that are summarized in table one, and we can see that starting from, uh, for site sites, for instance, we started from like about uh, 10k nodes and edges and went uh, with a 
way bigger graph uh, at the end with more like than 50k of nodes and edges. And this was uh, critical for the methods we developed and that Nicolas will present now. Yeah, so now let me talk about the, our method, which we call the graph site. So the, the intuition is quite simple. Basically, you have, uh, you have the local structure, uh, which is carried by the citation phrase. So this citation phrase will have a lot of semantic meaning, but you also have a global structure, uh, which will be carried by the citation graph. And those two levels, so the micro and the, the micro and the macro level, are linked together by uh, neural networks. And our intuition is that we can add this macro level information to the micro level information, and this will help us have better results than the state of the art. So let me start by explaining this part of the architecture. So this is uh, the NLP uh, part. So we use a, a model called Cybert, and this is uh, basically uh, a BERT model fine-tuned on scientific papers, which is really relevant in our situation. Uh, this takes as input a, a phrase, so words, and it outputs a vector or an embedding. And uh, we fine-tune that uh, during our training. The second part here you can see on, the, on this diagram is uh, the graph uh, part. So this is uh, actually a, a GATT model. So GATT stands for Graph Attention Network. It takes as input a graph, uh, which are the with the nodes as the papers, and uh, the node features are the titles of the, the papers. So this is quite natural uh, as uh, as features, and uh, and it outputs embeddings again or vectors if you prefer. So at the end we have embeddings which we can feed into our uh, neural network, and this neural network is our classifier which will give us the prediction of the intents. And to give uh, more details about the training uh, procedure, so basically we use a the cross entropy loss because we are doing classification. And uh, we jointly train the two parts, so the NLP and the graph part. And this is actually quite important because um, we want to learn which parts of the citation phrases are important and which parts of the station graph are important. And this is the, the combination of those two aspects uh, which will help us get good results. So I'm now going to present. Uh, I'm now going to present the results and uh, comparison. So we compared our approach that Nicolas just described to some uh, first deep baselines. Uh, so the first baseline is like just a random classifier, and then we also use rule-based system. By rule-based, we mean um, just models that say, okay, if the citation phrase is in uh, this section, then the intent is this one. We also uh, use as baseline the graphical uh, approach, like GATT model alone, like without using any citation phrase in order to see if a graph model alone can have great results. Um, and we also compared to uh, like previous state of the art and previous work on that direction. So cyber that Nicholas uh, just introduced, but also uh, DAPT, so domain adaptation, uh, domain adaptative pre-training and Tartan, which are two uh, methods that are learned, uh, that are studying the um, uh, pre-training fine-tuning paradigm. And they were tested on in NLP and they were tested on various NLP downstream tasks, including uh, a ACL ARC uh, data set. So yeah, for ACL ARC results are gathered in table two, and we can see that our graph site method with the graph made of citations and authors uh, is uh, establishing new state of the art and outperforming the uh, cybert approach by uh, about six F1 uh, score points. So that's quite significant. And it's also beating Tartan and the APT approaches. We can also remark that the GATT model alone is having very weak results and that confirmed the intentions that, yeah, only having the network of citation is not enough, but the combination is very strong. Yeah, but the citation phrase is always uh, needed. So yeah, this is confirmed in table three on the side side data set where GATT is also performing quite badly. 
Uh, we can also see on site side data set that our method with citation and authors is um, graphs is also uh, beating all the previous work uh, by more than two points getting better than Cybert, which is also significant as Cybert was already very good in terms of results. Um, the other remark we can do is that the rule-based system is actually quite good on that data set. That's uh, because there are not that many uh, intents, like only three on this one compared to six for ACL ARC. And the last remark is that uh, the when we add venues to the uh, augmented graph, then for both data sets, it, uh, it, it is getting uh, like worse results. And that means that venues are adding some noise and not very relevant information for uh, citation intent prediction. So in conclusion, uh, we had the assumption that adding uh, like a global graphical information would help in the task of citation intent prediction. And we confirmed this uh, numerically. And we made our code uh, publicly available uh, on yeah, the address you can see here on GitHub. And future work uh, involved like having even more dense graph, even more dense graph uh, by adding some related like citing and cited papers uh, in addition to authors and venues. Yeah. Thank you for having listening to us. And uh, yeah, please feel free to ask any question. Thank you very much, uh, Dan and Nicolas, for this uh, joint presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and ask a question from the chat. So the F1 scores are really high. Are micro F1 similar to macro F1? Because the class imbalances are, because the class labels are imbalanced, micro could be a more unbiased metric. Can you comment? Yeah, so, uh, so we chose uh, this uh, this metric because this is actually what was used in the in the previous uh, works. So in the Cy Cy cyber paper, for example, in all the papers that dealt with um, station intent, and uh, and yeah, it's right because uh, it's it's right that classes are imbalanced. You don't you don't have the same uh, uh, you don't have the same uh, number of papers in uh, in every uh, in every class, but uh, basically we chose to to compare with the with the results of the uh, of the other papers, and uh, and that's why we we made this uh, decision. Yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah, as Nicholas said, that was like the score that made uh, like re reference from the first paper that introduced the test. So yeah, we just like uh, also evaluated on other metrics, but only reported like the macro F1 score, yeah. And yeah, there is another question, yeah, thank you. Uh, so did you explore how the results uh, change with citation graph? Uh, actually, we did not, that's very uh, interesting question, but we uh, worked on like a fixed graph um, as like it's already like a very big structure to handle and we have to make some choices of how many nodes we want to add. But that indeed can be like uh, very interesting to see the evolution, like if like in, uh, intents are refined uh, as long as new papers are added. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, wrap it up here. Uh, thank you very much again for the presentation and the uh, Q&A session. Uh, so in the interest of time, let's move on to the second paper of this session which is examining the uh, open research knowledge graph towards a representation of control theoretic knowledge, some preliminary experiences and conclusions. And uh, this will be presented by Karsten Noll. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, please go ahead, thank you. So I try to share the screen uh, dun, 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 dun. so the usual question is can you can you see the presentation yes so not full screen yet correct but perfect thanks now it should be full screen yes. Okay, so thank you very much for this introduction as you can see I'm with the Institute of control theory so by training, I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer and I'm 
on my very interesting journey into knowledge representation. And here I want to pre present some preliminary experiences and conclusion regarding the open research knowledge graph. But first of all, I probably have to explain what control theory actually is. It's, um, in, in, let's say, a subset of mathematics, electrical engineering, and some other scientific disciplines. And the main question is how to achieve desired behavior of dynamic systems. For example, in cruise control, anti-lock blockade systems, temperature control, uh, and so on. But probably the best way to explain it is with segway stabilization, because you can imagine that such a vehicle is unstable from a mechanical point of view because the center of gravity is too high and only by uh, active control it's possible to maintain the equilibrium and actually have some some forward traction. Um, so in, in theory there's a, a dynamic system which is called plant has input output variables uh, output is feedback then there's an comparison with a reference value and the controller takes this difference to adjust the input. This is the simplified theory, but in practice, uh, the block diagrams look uh, a lot more complicated. And so uh, it's not surprising that the control theory uh, makes use of a quite heterogeneous spectrum of methods like differential geometry, functional analysis, theory of ordinary and differential and partial differential equations, optimizations, and so on. And there's also a heterogeneous spectrum of application domains like robotics, process engineering, automotive, etc. So um, it's quite hard to getting an overview of this field and keeping an overview of this field. And my uh, impression is that it's harder than in other uh, engineering disciplines because it's more interdisciplinary by construction. So why is formal knowledge representation in control theory uh, a relevant question? Uh, some aspects of the answer are shared with other disciplines because as always, we have growing numbers of publications and uh, not, uh, or there's no single brain which can handle this and uh, have an overview of all. And so there's this trend to specialization. So, uh, the discipline is branching into smaller niches. And uh, the established knowledge representation is unfortunately only natural language, formulas, and diagrams. So almost no ontologies, no databases. Um, some other aspects are specific to control theory because the spatialization, uh, which is mentioned earlier, uh, conflicts with the heterogeneous spectra of methods and applications because uh, due to this heterogeneousness, there's a high demand of knowledge transfer. And also, we can observe uh, that the sophisticated modern methods from control theory lack adaption by application engineers. So there seems to be also issues with knowledge transfer from the control theory to application domains. Another aspect which is uh, on the positive side is that the control theory community is already accustomed to use quite formal methods. So um, the barrier to adapt methods like, let's say, description logic might be probably lower than in other engineering disciplines. So in the remainder of the talk, I want to introduce the open research knowledge graph and then present um, some experiences from introducing control theoretic knowledge into the system and uh, finally give some subjective, conclusion, subjective conclusions and improvement suggestions as well as some final remarks. So the Open Research Knowledge Graph started in about 2018 and public contributions are possible since about two years. It's coordinated by the German National Library of Science and Technology, which is in Braunschweig. Um, its self-description is that it is an infrastructure that acquires scholarly knowledge in, in machine actionable form and thus enabling new possibilities of knowledge curation, publication, and processing. It consists of a, a backend, which is a labeled property graph, a triple store, and a relational database. Um, interfaces like REST, API, Sparkle endpoint, and some 
uh, quite sophisticated web front end, which is uh, depicted here in this screenshot. So it's an interactive experience to, uh, yeah, to interact with this user interface. The data model, uh, as usual for a labeled property graph, consists of um, vertices or nodes and edges. And the nodes are mainly class instances or literals, and they are called resources. And probably is best explained um, here on this uh, screenshot of the graph view of some entities. So we have here paper node, which has a title starting with sensitivity analysis. And this um, node has some uh, relation to another node. Uh, this relation has a label, in this case has contribution, and then another node is uh, the contribution of this paper. It's uh, usually an ORKG to adjust number the contribution. So most papers have contribution one as their main contribution. This node again has another property, has research problem and so on. And finally, uh, all nodes and properties can have key value pairs, uh, which associates them with with literal values. For example, here, there's the dis description uh, of this uh, research problem. Um, important classes are paper, contribution, comparison, research field, and so on. So uh, terminology, which one would expect from a uh, knowledge graph, which models scholarly knowledge. And also the, the important properties are um, quite less surprising. The current content is that there are about 100,000 distinct, distinct nodes, about 5,000 uh, properties, and overall there are um, about 700,000 triples. Contributors are from the core team of the Open Research Knowledge Graph, and then there are also um, curation grants, which should incentivize uh, people to take published papers and um, represent them in, into the graph. And there are also uh, third party volunteers. So the, it's possible for every person to register at the website and uh, start editing in just a couple of minutes. And then there are also reports about automated techniques, but uh, I did not find out how this actually happens. Um, what happens if one wants to introduce control theoretic knowledge into open research knowledge graph? Uh, the first step is to open the wizard, uh, which contains of three steps, uh, adding bibliographical, bibliographical data, choosing the research field, and adding information about the contribution. Um, the first challenge is in choosing the research field because this uh, research field taxonomy is structured like a tree, which um, means that it's only possible to have one parent. Uh, so we say single inheritance. And this uh, is, in the case of control theory, uh, not ideal because some uh, community members considered as a subfield of mathematics, like it's represented also in the research graph, but uh, others like me would consider themselves as engineers and uh, would therefore look in the category of engineering. And if one uses the uh, full text search in research fields, then uh, more than one uh, result uh, um, is achieved because their control theory, which has uh, is research number 109, and there's also controls and control theory, which has a different number, and uh, two other uh, research, which also contains control. Um, so this is the first minor challenge, but uh, can be solved in one way or another. The uh, bigger challenge is how to actually represent the, the contribution information of a paper. So uh, the first problem is that the template contains uh, a material method result uh, structure, but most papers in control theory do not follow this structure. Um, for, 
because it's a theoretical area and uh, it's unclear what material should uh, should mean. So the user has to be confident in just deleting this uh, this property from the template and go along with those which make sense. Uh, an even bigger problem is that it's unclear what the actual contributions of a paper are because there might be uh, yeah, subjective uh, modeling approaches to this kind of, of representation problem. For example, um, if I want to represent a, a research problem for a paper which deals with periodic orbits uh, and I cannot find um, that periodic orbit or that there's already a research problem which is named periodic orbit, I'm not sure if anybody has just um, chosen a different name like limit cycle, for example, which is uh, a syn synonym of periodic orbit, uh, but there's no easily discoverable ontological structure for um, research problems and other resources of the open research knowledge graph. So there's all, um, always this, um, this uh, trade-off between semantic accuracy and reusing existing properties and resources. So at this point, one has the urge to look how do other papers or how are other papers represented in open research knowledge graph? So uh, it's probably a good point to uh, comment on the existing control theoretic knowledge in this system. So before I started to contribute, there were five papers uh, in the field of control theory, which sounds quite a few, but on this graph, we see that it's still above the median value. So most uh, papers are concentrated only in a few areas of research or research field. And most research fields, on the other hand, only have a few number of papers associated with them. Um, these five papers had between one and five associated research problems. And the range of these research problems is from uh, some very general terms like L2 regularization to some very specific terms like modeling, blood pressure, response to infusion and hemorrhage, which might be also a title of, um, of a paper. And we can uh, deduce that there's a heterogeneous level of granularity or heterogeneous levels of granularity and also heterogeneous modeling depths. For example, this uh, this resource uh, of the research problem has no other um, properties associated with it. So the person who created this resource uh, did not bother to define a class or to associate a description or any other things. So uh, in summary, we can say there's a limited potential of existing paper instances to be used as templates. Um, this reusability challenges can also be seen in um, these two other diagrams. Um, here we see the properties. Uh, as I said, there are almost 5,000 properties in the Open Research Knowledge Graph, which can be retrieved by the Sparkle endpoint. About 3,000 of them are associated with at least one paper, but only very few are associated with at least 1% of the papers. So here we can again see uh, most entities are associated only with a tiny fraction of, of the overall papers. And in terms of research problems, we have a similar situation. Um, most research problems uh, are associated only with exactly one paper. OK. Um, then back to the control theory. Uh, assume I want to introduce a paper titled The Generation of Stable Limit Cycles with Prescribed Frequency and Amplitude by a polynomial feedback, which is some kind of a standard uh, content for control theory, I would say. And the main result of such a paper is um, 
a proposed class of control algorithms, a theorem, a mathematical theorem that this class has some desired properties and then the proof of the theorem. This would be the, uh, yeah, the abstract description of the main results in a non-formal way. And now the, the question is, how can these results be formalized to a triple structure such that uh, they can be represented in uh, open research knowledge graph. So what, what kind of entity should be placed here in this triple structure? Either A, B, and C individually as multiple triples or a combination of A, B, and C because a theorem is only valid with a proof, but on the other hand, a theorem and a proof should be distinguished because there could be more than one proof for the same theorem and so on. And even if this question is uh, solved, how can these components be represented? Because it would, uh, in terms of reusability, be meaningless to, uh, to represent exactly one theorem that has exactly one scope and assertion. So my pragmatic approach was to introduce a, a research with name some stability theorem, which is kind of a place re, placeholder resource representing some particular stability uh, theorem, but whose scope and assertion might depend on the context in which is it defined. I'm not sure whether this is uh, the perfect approach, but anyway, the conclusion here is there are non-trivial ontological questions and in the current state, the user is left alone with these non-trivial questions. So um, speaking of conclusions, I want to state that ORKG is a very powerful tool, but it has to be used wisely. And therefore I compiled a list of best practices on the user level. And this list contains uh, advices such uh, one should familiarize with the existing context uh, content and use wherever possible the existing entities such as research problems and uh, methods and results and so on. Um, wherever possible, one should use or introduce terms from ontologies, um, but this is easier said than done because for example, for control theory ontologies are almost not present. I'm currently working on one, but it's a uh, hard endeavor. So uh, the next advice is that one should take the perspective of a searching user because most uh, contributions seem to assume that one already knows uh, what the contribution is about, but as uh, to be useful, uh, open research knowledge graph uh, contents should should have uh, the target audience which wants to learn and not already does know what the contribution is about. And uh, then the aspect of feedback and review should be, um, should be uh, reinforced because uh, this might prevent some issues in the quality. So the advice here is to ask a peer from your domain to review your contribution. The second conclusion is that although the research graph is a powerful tool, there's plenty of room for improvement. And therefore, I've also compiled a list of structural improvement suggestions, which do not aim at the uh, user level, but on the development level of the open research knowledge graph. This list includes more and better documentation, exemplary content for different domains, which are explicitly uh, advertised, um, then to improve the feedback and review capabilities, for example, by introducing a commenting system or a field uh, where the reviewer, the review user can be made transparent and uh, introduce a quality mon management process and uh, introduce incentives to, to participate in this process. For example, currently there's lots of duplicate data, incomplete data, unused entities and so on. So there are quality issues which might be easily spotted, but uh, there's the only incentive currently is to add content and not to increase the quality of the content. And among others, uh, there should be 
better support for mathematics, for example, uh, before I started contributing concepts like uh, mathematical theorem and proof were not present in, um, in the knowledge graph. Um, the final conclusion is despite the mentioned issues, from my perspective, ORKG is the best openly available platform to represent control theoretic knowledge. I did a brief examination of other knowledge graphs and in those um, there's less or even no coverage of control theory. This is not a, a, um, a uh, yeah, not a problem of these knowledge graphs uh, because obviously they have different scopes. Um, so now I want to come to the summary. Um, I presented what control theory is, namely a niche discipline with some special features. Uh, what is the open research knowledge graph? It's an infrastructure to acquire scholarly knowledge. And um, by adding control theory knowledge to the open research knowledge graph, there are some challenges. And as conclusions from these challenges, I made suggestions for best practices and structural improvements. And finally, I want to remark uh, or remark some, some thoughts. Uh, which can be summarized or motivated by the quote from Christopher Ingram in the Washington Post from some years ago, the solutions to all our problems may be buried in PDFs that nobody reads. And while this quote is probably uh, quite polemic, um, I think it has some, some truth in it. Uh, namely, the one brain barrier is real and the world's knowledge should be um, represented better than just put in, in PDF files. So on, on my point of view, knowledge representation should be part of the digital literacy for researchers and engineers. And currently, semantic methods like ontologies and Sparkle and so on are almost unknown in engineering. And there's plenty of room for research. And uh, personally, I'm looking for a cooperation in this field. So how to represent control theoretic knowledge or in general terms, engineering knowledge uh, in a semantic fashion. And there's also plenty of demand for teaching and uh, to, to go in the right direction, I uh, compiled all the claims which I made about open research knowledge graph uh, in, a, in, Jupyter, in Jupyter notebooks as Sparkle and AP queries to back up uh, these claims. Um, so um, one outcome of, of this study is that uh, there's a quite good commented uh, collection of Sparkle queries um, and their interpretation. So thank you very much for your attention and I am happy to answer your questions now or later. So thank you very much, Karsten. Uh, there's already a question on the chat. So can you have a look and would you want me to read it? Uh, yes, then I have to to change the window again. Okay, so, so, so maybe the, the, the easiest way be, uh, would be to for you to read uh, the yes. question, please. So you s talked about um, uh, how to model papers, theorems, and proofs. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the first question was, um, it, wasn't there some already structured way to model the field or some fields in control theory that you can take advantage of? Um, yes and no. So there, uh, there is no um, no structure, uh, let's say, built in in the open research knowledge graph. So everything which is present emerged by by user contributions, and as one can imagine, this is not without without issues. So um, I had quite an intensive look on what is already present and which structure I can use and extend. And um, I had the conclusion that the present structure is uh, not as I would structure the, the field. So a, a very simple example is that I would not say that uh, con control theory is only 
a subfaction of applied mathematics. So because most control theoretic researchers consider themselves as engineers. So there, this is maybe a subjective perspective, but uh, I think uh, the open research knowledge graph should find a way to deal with uh, with such things and therefore i would suggest such thing like a commenting system where uh, contributors can discuss things out and come up with with ways how to model the knowledge this is uh, only a tiny example but i think it's it's the easiest to to understand i think wiki data has a quite a good um, communication structure so there's plenty of um, of questions and answering going around how to model this and that entity and this and that relation. And I think this should take place in open research knowledge graph as well. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, let's skip the next question. And I would like to ask Karsten to uh, go ahead and answer this question in the chat. And let's move on to the second paper or, or the third paper of, the, of this session. It's called Sinobo a hierarchical multi-label classifier of scientific publications and it will be uh, presented by Sotiris, I think. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please share your screen and start. Yes. And when you see my virtual or actual hand raised, so you should be uh, wrapping up the presentation. Okay. Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sotiris Kotitsas and I'm a research associate at Athena Research Center stationed at Greece. In the following presentation, I will present the paper of Sinobo and the following work is joint work with my colleagues Nikola Jalitsis and Haj Papagiotiu. In this work, we study field of science classification methods and as you can see in the example, our end results are FOS labels at various levels of granularity, such as natural sciences for level one, and optics for level three. The power of field of science classification is evident. And if we consider the multiple applications of it, like search engines, um, science monitoring, and helping with bibliometrics indicators. Most of the methods, however, that currently exist, uh, perform a field of science classification by relying on the published journal of the paper and this journal classification, or solely on textual metadata like titles, uh, abstracts, and author keywords. In addition, uh, some of them are focused on a specific domain like computer science. However, um, more and more journals tend to be multidisciplinary and furthermore, textual metadata are not always available. And some methods have uh, difficulties uh, discriminating between field of science labels that share similar vocabularies like materials and metallurgy. Our FOS classifier, on the other hand, um, focuses on leveraging the structural properties uh, of a publication through its citations and references organizing them in a multi-layered network. Finally, we also propose a, a three-level hierarchical field of science taxonomy. The proposed field of science taxonomy is based on the AOCD disciplines and, and the science metric classification labels. To, to unify them, we manually link the science metrics labels to the level two OECD labels, and the resulting FOS taxonomy is used as a classification scheme in our class. In the slide, we present some examples uh, from the field of science taxonomy, along with statistics uh, of the number of FOS labels per level. Finally, the extension of the field of science taxonomy to levels four, five, and six is currently work in progress. The intuition behind our classifier is that the publication mostly cites thematically related publications. To create the classifier, we employ a multi-layer graph approach and uh, we try to bridge venues and publications by constructing a multi-layer network. The nodes in the graph can be venues, FOS labels of the venues, and publications. The edges reflect the layers of the multi-layer graph and can be venue-to-venue -venue edges, publication-to-publication -publication edges. Uh, the venue-to-venue -venue edges reflect citing and cited relationships in the respective publications. We have venue-to-FOS labels, which are provided uh, by the science metrics general classification, a uh, publication to venue edges, which are constructed during inference time, a hierarchical edges between field of science labels and publication to field of science labels, which are the end result. The classification step consists of classifying a publication based on the citations, based on the out citations and in citations. 
where out citations refer to the publishing venues of the citation of the publications it references, and in citations to the publishing venues of the publications it gets cited by. Some quick advantages of this approach is that we can classify publications with minimal metadata. Uh, we can classify publications from the very first day uh, of publishing, and uh, we can account for multidisciplinarity. Some disadvantages are that this graph needs constant updates because uh, more and more publications get citations as, the, as time go, goes by, and very few venues have labels at the initial graph creation. Here we can view a complete pipeline of the classifier. During the next slides, I will describe the red boxes, which are graph creation, label propagation, which is an iterative process, and the inference step. We are given a publication and the required metadata, the classified and output field of science labels. To create our graph, uh, we exploded Crossref and Microsoft Academic Graph. Uh, we retrieved all the publications in the years between 2016 and 2021, along with the references and citations when available. Furthermore, for every publication, uh, we try to retrieve the publishing venue and the publishing venues of its references and citations. And as a result, we can now create venue to venue edges, creating the initial graph. The weight of the edges are the amount of times a venue is cited by or cites another venue. The weights are being normalized to sum up to one, and we also perform a um, venue duplication, trying to map the venues to their abbreviations. And as you can see, for example, we are trying to map the Association for Computational Linguistics to ACL. Finally, to create the venue to FOS edges, uh, we utilize science metrics uh, general classification by linking the FOS general labels to the venue nodes in the graph. Initially, a small portion of the venues have field of science labels, as I stated before, which we hope to alleviate using label propagation. The intuition behind label propagation is that a venue is more likely to express the FOS of its most referenced venues, like a nearest neighbor set. We utilize the venue to venue edges and the neighborhood contexts of the graph to enrich the initial labeling from science metrics. Furthermore, we dynamically evaluate the initial labeling from science, uh, from science metrics. And after a few rounds of label propagation, a single labeled uh, venue may become multi labeled. Uh, I will demonstrate the label propagation using the example presented here. Uh, the graph presented shows uh, four venues, which are the orange nodes, connected to each other through citing and cited relationships with the red weights. ACL and uh, Ryan LP are also connected to the RFOS labels from science metrics with green weights, which represent the confidence of a venue to have uh, these labels. To propagate a label information uh, from ACL and TRINLP to EMNLP, we multiply the red weights uh, with the green weights. And as a result, we can now assign uh, to EMNLP field of science labels with a certain confidence. If we perform a, another round of label propagation, we can now assign through the same process field of science uh, labels to KDD. Now, by multiplying the red weights, we can assign the labels to KDD with a certain confidence. After a uh, label propagation is finished and utilizing the same mechanism, we can now infer field of science labels for publications. We can propagate information uh, from the venue level to the publication level based on the publishing venue of the, of the paper, uh, the venues that the publication uh, cites, and the venues that cite our publication, resulting in th these three variants presented in the slide. In the example presented here, the publication to classify is the purple node, um, the orange nodes denote the venues, and the blue nodes again denote the field of science labels. The red weights now represent the percentage of P1's references that cite a venue, and likewise, the percentage of publications, of publication from a venue that cite P1, if P1 had citations which were omitted for simplicity. By following the same procedure uh, as in label propagation, uh, we would classify P1 uh, as a medical and uh, artificial intelligence publication. To evaluate our approach, we compared it to a deep neural encoder, namely DAN, 
which utilizes self-attention and classifies, classifies publications only utilizing the abstracts and cannot perform a hierarchical and multi-label classification. Uh, as a result, a, a multi-class dataset from MAG was extracted by sampling publications from journals. More concretely, we collect publications um, from journals annotated from science metrics, and we evaluated the classification performance only on the level three of the field of science taxonomy. Through labels for the dataset uh, publications uh, were assigned according to the field of science label of the published journal, which is a limitation. And this is the reason we are currently constructing a human curated publication level dataset to facilitate further research and better performance uh, comparisons. In the table, you can view uh, some brief statistics uh, of the extracted data set. And uh, the train set is used for training our baseline, development set uh, for tuning it, and the test set for evaluating both of the methods. Uh, we perform a multi-class evaluation to be aligned with the created data set and baseline. And to account for multidisciplinarity, uh, we present results with two settings. Top one, uh, which uh, outputs the most probable field of science label, and top two, which outputs the two most probable field of science labels. In the presentation, we observe results uh, with macro F1. However, in the paper, there exist more results in deep and in-depth in analysis. Um, as we observe in the table, the variation of our classifier that utilizes only the published venue outperforms all the other methods. However, this can be attributed to the nature of the data set since the true labels of the publications stem from the general classification of science methods. All the variants of our approach outperform done in top one setting, and all the variants uh, of uh, our approach are performed done in top two setting, apart from the variant of focuses on citations and references. The dropped performance of the citations and references uh, variant can be attributed to the fact that the field of science labels of a publication can shift through the course of time since they receive more and more citations. Overall, all methods perform much better in the top two setting, indicating that usually the answer is, that is in the top two predictions. Finally, some uh, more results. Here we present the macro F1 distribution of Sinobo and done for all the field of science labels. We can observe that the overall performance of Sinobo is better than done. However, Sinobo performs poorly in some of the field of science labels, uh, whereas Dan performs well, uh, which is a point that needs uh, more investigation. Finally, I'm presenting an example, uh, a field of science classification example. Uh, on the image, we can view the publication uh, we want to classify along with the title and the abstract. Now, given a DOI, we retrieve the metadata of this publication and the metadata we need to classify the publication are the published venue, the citing venues, which are the venues that cite the publication and the reference venues, which are the venues that the publication cites. And uh, we input the required metadata to our FOS classifier and it outputs the two most probable field of science labels across all three levels, which if you read the paper, it seems correct. And uh, summing up, um, Sinobo, along with the proposed field of science taxonomy, are inherently hierarchical and can also perform multi-class and multi-label classification. Sinobo utilizes minimal metadata and can classify a publication for the, from the very first day of publication. Uh, our classifier can provide context-aware classifications without relying on the publication content. And since uh, Sinobo also utilizes citations, we can perform case studies uh, showcasing uh, the multidisciplinary nature of the publications and how they can be assigned to more than one FOS labels in the course of time. And uh, finally, as I already said, the human curated publication level data set is being constructed. And we are currently working on extending our field of science taxonomy to levels uh, four, five, and six by utilizing community detection and neural topic modeling. And, um, this extension to more granular levels will also help us to identify emerging and vanishing topics uh, in certain fields of science labels. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sotiri. 
for the presentation. So let me go ahead and ask a question myself. I don't see any in the chat. Um, so you're basically a graph-based approach and you chose this uh, multi-layer uh, representation. Um, um, so I, I was wondering why do you use this uh, multi-layer representation where you need to have edges and compute their weights from venue to venue? Uh, if that's a necessity for your approach. And second, if, if you don't use this type of uh, aggregated multi-layer graph, uh, would you be able to apply uh, graph neural networks to predict um, fields of study? The, the multi-layer approach can also be viewed uh, as a heterogeneous graph, basically, where uh, we have multiple type of edges between nodes. Uh, this is the this is the reason we approach it this way, and um, we could also utilize uh, graph neural networks um, instead of label propagation. Um, and basically, no, we could use uh, graph neural networks to approximate the weights of the edges instead of calculating the um, citations, uh, citation counts, and so on. We could uh, train uh, a graph neural network as an auxiliary task and uh, approximate the weight of the edges and yes, assign the uh, labels, uh, new labels to venues instead of performing label propagation. And this is an idea that we were thinking to, to apply. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely viable to apply and, and more concretely apply graph attention networks because you have different uh, weights for the same neighborhood. Great, thank you. And one uh, final question from the chat, where one can find your uh, field of uh, science tax taxonomy? Uh, the data set, um, the data set will be available, uh, will be open in uh, some uh, time. Uh, furthermore, you can find, uh, you will be able to find the FS annotations uh, on the open air research graph. And uh, along with those, uh, you can also have the field of science taxonomy, but only on the first three levels because the three more additional levels are still work in progress. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, let me hand over uh, to Andrea, who will uh, be the chair for the next half of the session. So thank you very much from my side. Andrea, you're muted. So, uh, we cannot hear you, Andrea. Because I'm, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's strange because I'm not muted. I wasn't muted before. You hear me? Now? Yes. We yes, can we can better. hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, the first talk is um, beyond reproduction. Um, experiments want to be understood by uh, Jerome Zena. I, I, I hope I pronounce it uh, decently. And uh, with these, I leave the stage to you. Uh, remember that, uh, so this is a vision paper. So it has seven minutes for the presentation and uh, 10 minutes in, in, in all uh, for, for presentation and Q&A. So yeah. The stage is yours. Okay, so can you hear me? Can yeah. you see my yeah. slide? Yeah. Okay, very good. So this is not really a vision, uh, that's rather a position paper. I try to uh, draw attention a bit more on uh, uh, what I call experiment and more especially experiment description. Um, in principle, um, as we have seen with uh, Open Science Knowledge Graph, um, uh, people focus on papers, and papers are in experimental sciences are here to uh, describe experiments. Uh, however, uh, experiments are also described in some other places, like laboratory notebooks, um, which contains, uh, in addition to the paper, the, the experiments which have been published, also those who are not published, and uh, these are very useful in practice when you are doing uh, experimental science. 
Uh, from a data science point of view, uh, 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 an experiment is very often having a bunch of data, processing a, a more or less elaborate workflow and uh, uh, being able to uh, deliver results. Uh, but for some other sciences, actually this is only the end of the process. Um, there is a lot of other things that are more difficult to control than uh, the bunch of data. And uh, uh, there is a also elaborate process in order to um, uh, gather uh, the data that will be analyzed later. Uh, however, here I will only concentrate on uh, mostly on computational experiments anyway. So the goal of describing experiments uh, uh, is threefold. Uh, the goal is to be able to eventually reproduce uh, the experiment first for the experimenter himself to know that is uh, actually uh, publishing or describing what he has really observed. Um, but also for other that want to uh, check or to build on, on top of these experiments. The other uh, uh, constraints is intelligibility, of course, understanding how and why people uh, run their experiment and, and eventually how to reproduce it. And the last one is accountability, so being sure that the experiment has been described is indeed what has been processed and there can be uh, 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 mistakes that are made and not, not talking about fruit. Um, there is already a tension between reproducibility and intelligibility, um, especially in, in, in this, what concern computational experiments because uh, uh, in this case, the, the best way to have some kind of uh, repeatability, not talking about reproducibility is that uh, you will provide a container image to your to, to people and they will be able to uh, run the experiment again and uh, come up with uh, commensurate numbers. And of course, they would understand nothing. On the other side, you can have a very um, uh, well-worked and well-described uh, 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 papers that uh, describe, uh, uh, that makes you understand what uh, what's beyond this experiment but also doesn't allow to uh, reproduce it because there are some details which are missing so this is one of the the, the kind of problem uh, that calls for a uh, relatively precise uh, uh, description of experiments in the sense of accountability the current push uh, towards open science is very useful because again for computational experiment uh, you're supposed to uh, make open uh, the software that you use, uh, the data that you obtain, the analysis workflow that you process, etc. And so that's that's uh, very, uh, very valuable. And on the paper side, as we have seen in a number of uh, uh, paper presented today already, there is a lot of work on uh, exploiting, but also uh, um, describing the paper with uh, with metadata. Okay, but there is a, a, a quite, a, I will go directly there, to quite a gap between this uh, um, uh, amount of uh, raw, uh, uh, raw resources that are provided by open sciences and the, the kind of metadata which is provided uh, uh, describing the paper or, or even describing the, the, actual, the actual data. For example, if you uh, provide your experimental data to Zenodo, you will see that, well, the, the metadata that you can provide to Zenodo and that Zenodo will distribute all over the world uh, is uh, very, very limited actually. Uh, so this makes actually that uh, um, uh, one part of FAIR is quite well covered in my opinion, which is uh, the fact that uh, your experiment will be findable and available. But uh, in terms of interishability and reproducibility, uh, uh, there is a, a need to, to more uh, complete and more uh, comprehensive description of what the experiments are. Okay, and this is basically uh, uh, what I what I try to to push in this paper. Um, not that it is, as I say, the tremendously original. There has been some work on uh, modeling semantically hypotheses, uh, modeling the workflows, in particular in the research object project, modeling even the statistical tests that are applied to uh, um, to the data. So there is quite a, a lot of people that are aware of this, but it is not really commonplace. Just like we've seen in uh, Carson. Um, uh, uh, pr presentation. Um, uh, basically, the open scientific knowledge rev is really directed towards papers and not really towards uh, experiments. So you can 
more and more provide some idea of the contents, but um, all these things are really necessary and even for uh, uh, experiments which are not uh, published already. So I, I, I will kind of conclude. Um, uh, the, the, this paper comes from our, my experience as an experimenter and, and not from me as uh, someone working in uh, semantic technologies okay um, my group is now pro producing quite a lot of experiments we try to make our best to describe them not really necessarily with semantic technologies because they are not necessarily there i would love to have a, 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 a an ont the ontology that that work for us that we can use etc and a few years ago, I had a couple of students and I made them uh, model this in with semantic technologies this time in RDF, etc. And uh, offers a Sparkle uh, query engine. And I really discovered that it's super interesting to have this, not necessarily to publish to the world, but in your lab to be able to uh, deal with your experiment, to know what, what where, where you are with the experiment, what you did already experimented, uh, how something is uh, slightly different from something else. So for example, I put this uh, bug uh, in fMRI software uh, uh, panel because here it's, it was after uh, 15 years of research and uh, it would have been quite nice that people can check uh, all over the database of experiment, those experiments that have been used this fMRI software in order to conclude their result, in order to be able to reassess the experiment that have been uh, provided and uh, the um, the papers that have been published. Um, on the contrary, this was totally impossible to do. Okay, so my 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 message is that uh, yeah, we should try to build experiment knowledge graph that could be connected, of course, to that should be connected to a paper knowledge graph, but can, that can uh, allow to understand a bit better the experiment that are carried out and the relation between this experiment. For example, it's very easy to see which papers and other paper sites, okay? But it is not uh, um, very easy to understand that some experiment is just uh, repeat, repeating another experiment with some kind of variation in it and what are the variation with respect to these two experiments. And so this is what I, I would like to uh, uh, to see, but of, of course this uh, need to have some uh, specific effort to the representation that is producing the ontologies that are connecting to this and also uh, to have some kind of standard so that it can be a bit more interoperable with other. And just like Karsten state, now this is something I could, I would be very happy to participate. And just as a user, actually, uh, I, I have use cases that may be interesting. Do I have a couple of minutes? Or should I stop? Uh, yeah, we are, we are marking seven minutes now. Uh, I think we, yeah, you can wrap up and then we move to Q&A. Yeah, so basically the previous slide was my wrap up. Okay, so I just want to, to show here that uh, there are quite some benefits in having describing experiments. You can do some static analysis on the description, try to find out uh, if uh, everything uh, can allow the, the, the the, the experiment to be processed uh, correctly. So then you could be able to reproduce it and to repeat it. And why not, especially for computational experiment doing this automatically. We are, we are really working on, on, on this in my group. Um, uh, you, you can also check that the result can be re-obtained and re-analyze re the data with uh, using another uh, data analysis workflow. You can do meta-analysis. So what's interesting is not to represent one experiment, is to have a database of several experiments so that you can make comparison and find out why these two experiments that test the same hypothesis don't come up to the same conclusion. And uh, you can go back into the experimental setting to understand what are the conditions which are differing. And for uh, someone who is performing the experiment, one very important uh, aspect is uh, being able to uh, repurpose uh, the, uh, uh, the the experiment description because if they are they make them repeatable, um, well, creating a new experiment can be relatively uh, easily done by uh, just uh, uh, making a variation of the actual description and rerunning the experiment itself. Of course, it doesn't work for all experiments, but it's a, a good way to start. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jerome. 
uh, is there any question in the chat? Uh, otherwise, I'll go well, with Well, I can ask a, a quick question. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, so uh, uh, two things. First of all, I think that's, uh, that's a great idea and it will be great, especially if at a certain point we can have like a community knowledge graph of experiment so that it will uh, save a lot of time. Also, because uh, my intuition is that many people are inventing uh, warm water every time with doing the same experiment. But one issue is about the incentive. So how do you create incentive for people for doing things like this? For example, I think ISWC did some reproducibility track. So what do you think about the incentive? how to push people in this direction okay personally my own incentive because you know i'm very self-centered let's say it this way my own incentive is that i'm able to organize my experiment in my lab i think it is super useful of course very likely i am someone a bit uh, special on this on this direction okay so i won't uh, say that everybody should uh, or will do exactly what I, what I, what I would do, for instance. Uh, and I have a lot of trouble to push my student doing it, but they have no choice but doing it. <laughs> um, on the other side, uh, this what I just said also happen. You know, um, publishing papers uh, now comes with a lot of constraints. You've got to uh, be able to uh, deliver your uh, data in some place. You've got to describe your paper in some uh, particular way. Uh, you've got to go through the ACM process uh, once or three times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you've got this bloody XML in your in your in your uh, uh, ACM paper. Um, so people have to declare uh, a conflict of interest uh, to uh, split the work between the co-authors, etc. There, there, a lot of communities have a, 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 a setup uh, a, a, and are ready to 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 set up a lot of um, a lot of uh, rules uh, and people fo follow them. So um, it's not an incentive. Okay, but uh, it's something that uh, that uh, can be taken into account as well. I would say. Thank you. I see a hand raised uh, by Tobias. Um, do you want to answer and make the question? Yes. Want, yeah. um, so I I see this um, representation of scientific endeavor and experiments popping up every now and then, uh, and I wonder why this is the case. So there's the early scientific workflow work from the 2000s. So why do you think is it coming up again and again and everybody seems to define their own ontology for the same thing, even though there was one from 20 years ago? Is it because they are not sufficient? Is it because they are not, or is it just that they are not known? <laughs> Okay, one of the things I would say is that a few years ago, I made a talk where I was consistently saying a good idea remains a good idea, even if it doesn't find its public. And this is very common in, in uh, research, that people have a very early, uh, super interesting thing to do. But uh, as, uh, as has been said, there was not the right incentive for people to adopt it. They, they were more busy into uh, publishing their paper and, uh, and doing some, some other kind of thing. And so it did not work. And five years later, you got people coming up with exactly what you say, popping it, uh, the same idea popping again. So um, very likely, this is not a very, uh, uh, okay, very clever explanation that I give is that it has not been done well enough. Uh, we have been tried, and it's just, I would say it's a bit of the same with the, the semantic web. Uh, I think the, the current effort on an open scientific knowledge graph is uh, pretty interesting, especially that they attempt at going inside the, 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 um, the content of the papers. Um, however, uh, I would say However, at the moment they are they are trying to dig within the in the paper of the past in order to to describe them, and it's already something which is uh, quite difficult. Um, and then, uh, and so we need incentive for people to actually do it. But it's uh, so I would say 
I would also say something else. Uh, experimenters have a lot of experiment doing doing this. Eh? So this is uh, for for also for the the, the previous question. Um, they uh, are supposed to describe their experiment in laboratory logbooks. Some of them do it very draftily, and some of them do it very seriously. Okay, so there there are some people who do it. Then going from this manual logbook into uh, um, uh, uh, lab logbook, which are electronic, is something which is happening now. Okay, it could have happened 20 years ago, actually, but it was not it was not ready enough. I think at the moment. So I I, I have in my university some uh, some courses now on uh, EFTW. Uh, um, so it is popping up again and people are trying to take it. I'm not sure it will win, uh, but uh, but maybe next time it will it will win. Yeah. So I All don't right. know if it's a satisfactory answer. Yeah, but th thank you. I, I think uh, that echoes my experience that there's a lot of movement going on currently. They don't really know what has been done 20 years ago because they are not the ontologists that have this long knowledge necessarily. So with the communities I'm interacting with, um, you you have to somehow say, okay, look, there are old papers that you also may, may be interested in reading. Um, so you have to bring yeah, these I would. Into, into these communities and then see what sticks and what not. And I, I guess you're right that there's currently momentum going on to work on these ideas again, and hopefully they take off. Uh, yeah, please send me uh, the reference that you're thinking about. Uh, All right, Jerome, uh, I have maybe a comment is a quick one. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that on top of that, you know, like the, the, the right idea stays in time. There's also that uh, 20 years ago, uh, I mean, 20 years have, have, have passed and, uh, and technology had made huge leaps forward. So um, we we saw the emergence the emergence of, of, of reproducibility suites like Gigantum Science, and uh, and so it's like you know you have data software everything in a container that you can spin on your on your local machine in the cloud and run it. So all these new technologies that are available now that were unthinkable. To, uh, 20 years, 20 years ago, make the the, the the topic hot again and and bring the discussion, you know, like to to pop up over and over because just because we have enabling technologies that that make it uh, you know, um, possible uh, in in, a, in a, even in a different way that was uh, available before. And yeah, no, I, I think it's also that that's another driver on every cycles uh, of uh, of hype around around reproducibility. Um, so I would okay. move uh, to the next uh, talk uh, now. So um, so we have uh, uh, the next one is is a long paper uh, uh, titled "Semi Automated Litter Review for Scientific Assessment of Socioeconomic Climate Change Scenarios." by Vanessa Schweizer, Jude Kurniawan, and Adam Power. So please, uh, I can see the screen. Uh, okay, try I just to, want to make sure. Is that the correct screen? Uh, is that two screens? Yeah. Or... Okay, yeah, so it's, it's all good. Full screen presentation, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, thank you also for inviting our paper uh, to be presented. Um, I am Vanessa Schweitzer. Uh, I am an associate professor of knowledge integration at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And I supervised this project with two people who were students at the time. Um, and it's an example of uh, people who are working within a particular domain, uh, climate change research, trying to apply the tools that we're talking about um, at this conference. Uh, I am new to a, a conference like ACM, so I'm assuming that um, folks 
who are here might be new to climate change research. So I will uh, be giving a little bit of background for what socioeconomic scenarios are in climate change uh, or climate change research, as well as why it's important to assess them and why we were looking at these semi-automatic or semi-automated approaches. Uh, and then I'll get into the details of our particular study. So for the background, um, socioeconomic climate change scenarios are different from where a lot of folks tend to think about physical climate scenarios when they think of climate change research. Um, so with the physical climate scenarios, those are projecting things like changes in precipitation or um, also projecting things like temperature change in different places in the world. Perhaps you've seen something like a heat map um, of a particular place and how it might uh, be different under different levels of climate change. Socioeconomic scenarios are looking at details such as in this picture, uh, this is a picture of a city. Um, we're not entirely sure, or maybe some of you know exactly where it is, but um, I like this picture just because it's very pretty. Uh, and I like how uh, it represents things like different technologies that are being used in this urban environment, uh, including things like personal vehicles, uh, and um, you know these buildings, uh, maybe they have good insulation in them and are really energy efficient, but uh, maybe they're not. Um, those sorts of details have implications for things like uh, how much greenhouse gas emissions are coming from a city uh, that is doing its you know, daily commerce and people living in buildings and how much energy do they use. Uh, and people who model the socioeconomic or human dimensions um, of climate change, they produce outputs like what's shown on the left um, of this particular graph. That's a projection of greenhouse gas emissions um, that are due to alternative kinds of so socioeconomic arrangements um, around the world and then aggregated up to um, say something about a global trend. And um, on the right hand side of this graph, it's showing how these kinds of socioeconomic scenarios are used to um, make policy uh, ad advice um, to produce quote unquote policy relevant science um, because the models uh, that produce these kinds of socioeconomic scenarios, they're a combination of economic modeling and engineering modeling. They, you, you can actually go into uh, the, the guts of the various outputs that these models produce to figure out how much of the emissions are due to things like the style of buildings, the kinds of transportation systems that are there and so on and so forth. So when it comes to the question of how do you assess such socioeconomic scenarios, why would you assess them in climate change research, um, what's shown here is uh, kind of a, a table um, that uh, contrasts in the column direction, the SSP1, SSP2, SSP3, that stands for uh, these names of socioeconomic scenarios that are, there's kind of a family of them that's being used in climate change research right now. Um, and those different SSPs talk about those different alternative futures where um, when I showed that urban environment, uh, it either could be an urban environment that doesn't really pay attention to climate change at all. Uh, and so therefore has like inefficient buildings and personal vehicles that are powered by fossil, fossil fuels, or it could be a um, highly sustainable um, alternative uh, society. Um, and so the different socioeconomic details matter, but also so does the amount of climate change that's uh, being projected out into the future. So uh, for that, for those different rows, lower rows is less, or refers to less climate change, higher rows refers to more climate change. Um, and in the end, to try to pull out those policy relevant insights or to understand what the risk is of different levels of climate change, um, people, uh, explore these different scenarios in different kinds of studies. Um, it's a very heterogeneous community. Some people are doing global studies. Uh, they're using different kinds of models in order to produce these studies. They might be doing regional studies or country level studies, um, or they might even be doing studies that are at a specific level for a particular sector, like the transportation sector or the agricultural sector. Um, and then um, adaptation is uh, another subfield uh, within climate change research, but they use these scenarios as well, um, where people focusing on adaptation are, are asking the question of how can we live um, under a, a, warmer, um, a warmer world? So they have a similar uh, set of heterogeneous um, contributors uh, within their community. And when we're trying to do scientific assessment um, of all of these different kinds of studies together, it's helpful to be able to categorize um, what kinds of uh, assumptions were being used in these models, um, both 
levels of climate change that were being explored, as well as alternative socioeconomic futures. And then you can perhaps look um, across uh, for like any level of climate change if you're trying to understand, well, what is the, what are the degrees of freedom that societies have for how they um, plan for themselves over the next 50 years or 100 years or something like that, um, you'd want to look uh, across uh, some sort of um, those different socioeconomic scenarios to understand the range of mitigation effort, range of adaptation possibilities, and range of unavoidable impacts. So this is why it's important to assess them. But then there is also the um, problem of when you look at the uh, way that the climate change research community has been trying to monitor developments within the field, um, the abbreviations here, AR refers to assessment report, um, where these are published about every five to seven years by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. And the very first um, assessment reports were published back in the 1990s. And the latest assessment reports, uh, they're actually going through their sixth assessment report cycle right now. Um, but this is where we can see this comparison um, in this uh, particular uh, figure, how for the first assessment reports in the 1990s, um, the coverage of the publications in climate change research, over half of them were being looked at in the assessment reports. But as we've moved fast forward uh, to the present day, um, in smaller and smaller share of publications, um, if you compare to what you can find in Web of Science, are actually being assessed uh, by a group like the IPCC. So um, Minks and colleagues were pointing out um, that, hey, we should pay attention uh, to the work that uh, people like this community is doing, uh, because we actually, we probably need to integrate it uh, to do scientific assessments of climate change well. So that was what was motivating um, our research project, where we wanted to um, get familiar with these tools, try them out, uh, and also how the shared socioeconomic pathways, that's a, a new family um, of uh, scenarios. They're, they're now sort of the dominant um, kinds of scenarios that are being used. But I had also described how the community that uses them is very heterogeneous. And so it really is a multidisciplinary field. And so we were curious about how well uh, these tools might work. Um, so I'll tell you very briefly about how our project went and some things that we were observing were perhaps limitations for the time uh, during which we did the study. Um, so we did this study um, a few years ago. And um, in terms of describing what it was that we tried, uh, when we started working with these uh, new uh, SSPs, uh, shared socioeconomic pathway um, scenarios, they were relatively new. They hadn't, hadn't been in the literature for very long. Um, so we started off with using natural language processing approaches. Um, and I think everybody here is familiar with the different ways that you can do that. Um, in terms of what uh, we were, with the different kinds of tools that we were using, we were using different Python tools. Um, we used uh, meta knowledge in terms of um, putting together our scenario database and then starting to pre-process the different papers and, and then analyze them. Um, and so when it came to pre-processing, we used uh, the Python package Spacey, as well as uh, once we did have our data all set to go and, and to be analyzed, we used scikit-learn. Um, and then to tell you a little bit more about what's in that uh, database, um, meta-knowledge was used to uh, collect um, some sample data as well as test data. Uh, and so we did already know at the time when we were doing this study what were sort of recognized as um, the socioeconomic um, scenario papers. Uh, that's because there is already a group, they call themselves the International Committee on New Integrated Climate Change Assessment Scenarios, or ICONICS um, for short. Um, and at the time when the study was being done, they were just starting to build a, a human curated database. And these were kind of officially recognized SSP papers. But then we also wanted to, again, see how well the algorithms could do um, comparing these SSP papers and whether or not they could identify them to just quote unquote climate change research. So we looked at um, uh, climate change research writ large, um, just in general pulled uh, 10,000 papers from Web of Science um, published at the same time uh, as the um, SSP papers. Um, and then we used uh, Spacey uh, and a couple of approaches to put together a features matrix. Uh, and then we also um, used, um, I'm sorry, I've got to kind of move my different Zoom windows around, scikit-learn for um, actually doing the processing of um, training the algorithms um, a bit, uh, and then uh, actually trying to test them and, and let them uh, basically evaluate how well they were performing. And we used um, different uh, algorithms um, to see how well they could do. 
But what we were finding um, was that we were concerned about um, how well uh, these algorithms could identify uh, different SSP papers in like the bigger sea of climate change research. Um, and what we were finding across 1,000 runs of um, trying to train these different algorithms uh, and then uh, assess their performance, um, we were seeing that there were um, false negative standard deviation measures that we thought were actually um, maybe still a, lit, a, a bit larger than you'd want uh, compared to if you were just going to completely hand over uh, the literature review process to automated procedures. Um, here we were concerned that this is perhaps uh, performing no better than a human reader. Maybe it's um, the worst thing you'd, you could have happen is that uh, the algorithm is actually pre uh, performing worse <laughs> than a human reader. So we were really focusing on uh, the problem of false negatives. Uh, and uh, here we uh, thought that probably what was going on in terms of having metrics that um, we weren't satisfied with is that the actual language that's used in the SSP papers, as well as just general climate change um, articles, wh where it's very clearly not about SSPs, they, you know, they might be about other things, such as I mentioned, you know, changes in precipitation um, and whatnot. But both of these kinds of papers are going to use a lot of the same language. So that's where we figured that um, the actual uh, papers uh, that we were investigating were not sufficiently different. But we also recognized that um, the SSP papers, the number of them that were published at the time, was also very small, uh, less than 1,000 papers uh, at the time that the study was done. Um, so that could have resulted in a feature matrix that had insufficient detail. So we decided to switch to um, taking a citation network approach to see if this would do a little better. Uh, and um, we started off with those core papers that we knew were kind of the foundation of the SSP literature and built out a citation uh, network from there. Uh, so we used different Python packages um, when we um, switched to um, doing citation networks. Uh, and that's where we used um, meta knowledge once again to uh, go ahead and uh, put together our curated database. But now in terms of like figuring out what are the papers that um, the algorithms should pay attention to, that's where it was all a matter of who was citing whom. Um, and then we used Network X in order to do some unsupervised learning, because I had mentioned that there are a lot of different subfields that are um, trying to use these SSPs for their research. And so we were curious whether um, different algorithms like Louvain or Fluid Community might be able to, um, again, help uh, support or maybe even do just as good a, a job as a human um, reader. Uh, and we use Network X um, as well to actually create that citation network. And what we were finding in this case, some good news, um, was that uh, we did find evidence that this approach could um, actually detect um, one community. In this case, it was freshwater systems. Um, so this is where, I guess, that particular subfield, um, because of their uh, the communities of scientists who write these papers, that probably is something that helps make it very clear, um, this particular subgroup that we're using socioeconomic scenarios in order to like parameterize their um, freshwater system impact studies under climate change. Um, so we could see evidence that this approach had some promise. But then we also saw in other sectors that there was a lot more difficulty in terms of um, figuring out the communities. And so the uh, example that did the worst were just um, the group that we called scenario papers, because these are um, the particular papers that either were the foundational SSP papers, or they were um, papers that were sort of continuing to do methodological research around scenarios. Uh, and this is where the community detection algorithms had much more trouble finding or isolating down to one clear community that were quote unquote the scenario papers. Instead, when we actually looked at like a full citation network of all of the papers, you kind of could see the quote unquote scenario papers were kind of getting smeared across um, different um, communities. Uh, and so um, other things that we concluded from looking at this overall citation network uh, was buttressing our interpretation that um, perhaps the time that the study was done was a bit too early um, for the field of SSP research. The most central node um, ended up being a paper uh, that is cited by various communities. Um, and it is one of the scenario papers that ended up being the central node. Um, but the most cited article or, or the node that has like the largest size in this particular picture um, 
is um, from the same lead author, Brian O'Neill, um, where he introduced the framework for the SSPs. Uh, and um, so again, for the time at which we did the study, the fact that his paper was the most commonly cited paper um, was probably an indication that the, the field itself was still very new. And so this is where we actually had a lot of the communities kind of smeared across each other. Um, and um, that's where we think that the algorithms basically had a really tough job uh, with what we were asking them to do in this particular study. Uh, okay, so um, in general, the findings from that citation network approach um, were promising on the one hand that we did feel um, that the analysis was helping to visualize um, kind of this library of these SSP articles. Um, but we also, when we were doing the study, um, were surprised to find some inconsistencies um, in how the citations were formatted, including the, the DOIs sometimes not being formatted in the same way. We, uh, we uncovered some errors uh, basically across databases that we were um, looking at. Um, also, um, you sometimes have the problem of, a, of an article under the co-citation network approach. It's citing the SSP papers, but itself is not actually a good example of SSP research. So once again, that division of labor between um, the machine and the and the human reader, um, this particular subfield is like not mature enough to kind of hand everything over to a fully automated process. Um, and um, we also uh, recognize that with this particular approach, if we're worried about you know, not having the false negatives, you still have to find all the SSP articles then. Um, and uh, so far that requires human verification. Um, I saw in a previous presentation, some people were talking about um, how these citation networks are also dynamic, they change over time. We were seeing the same thing in our study. Uh, and as a matter of fact, right now um, in the climate change research, um, I don't know if I want to say nomenclature or um, just in general right now, people are starting to use that phrase SSP to refer to other kinds of scenarios, not solely just the socioeconomic ones. Um, so this is like an example of how the field itself, like the norms start to change in the field, and then that impacts um, how you might be able to, to do this kind of study. So um, in conclusion, um, we did see some promising some promising suggestions um, that machines could relieve and systematize some of the challenges of um, assessing scenario research. Um, and this is probably going to become even more important over the next five years. Um, at the time of the study, uh, we felt like we didn't necessarily see improvements uh, compared to still needing human readers to do a lot of the scientific assessment. And that's how the IPCC currently does um, its assessments. It's through um, these author teams uh, that are all responsible for, they're basically told what kinds of papers they ought to be looking at, and then they do these literature reviews. Um, so um, citation networks at this stage uh, perhaps are more appropriate for classifying subfields uh, to some degree. Um, but um, automated literature retrieval, um, I guess we also weren't sure if it's just a very difficult ask um, of natural language uh, processing approaches to have them try to do these kinds of classifications for multidisciplinary literature like the SSPs. Um, so in the interest of time to maybe take a, a question or two, I think I'll go ahead and leave it there. Um, but thanks very much for listening. Yeah, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, let's see if there's any question uh, in the chat. Is anyone uh, from the audience that has a question for Vanessa? Otherwise, I, I can... Um, um, so something that, that uh, occurs to me, but um, I'd like to know uh, what is your uh, view about that. But um, there are certain certain phenomena uh, that have been observed in different communities, and uh, they actually describe the, the, the same physical thing, but um, I'll, I'll throw you an example. Uh, in the centrometric community, uh, there's these um, there's this phenomenon about uh, the rich get richer. So the more citation you have, the more citation you get. So these in the, this phenomenon, which is uh, well known and and and, and exists independently of, of how it's described in, in research communities uh, in in the symptomatic community, goes after uh, Merton uh, is the Merton effect. 
um, while uh, who studies uh, complex networks uh, names it uh, cumulative advantage. So it's a different wording and uh, cumulative advantage is actually a generic version of it. It, 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 it applies to many things, it applies to, to, to similar phenomenon, not only citations, but so my question was, um, in this case, for example, or similar cases like these, uh, the research communities wouldn't cite each other because possibly they are uh, there is a, a fracture uh, in between them, and and they probably use even different wording. So it looks like that two methodologies that that are described here fall short both, and and I don't know like if the, the best would be you know like you have a, a recommended system that tells you hey. There's this paper that you couldn't dream of that actually talks in a different way of the same you're studying. And it, like, do you think this is like a, a, a very long shot or is there a way uh, that you foresee we could get there somehow? Um, well, and I was struck by, I feel like in, um, and I'm gonna go back to this particular slide um, that some of the things that are of interest to doing scientific assessment with climate change, uh, the climate change research studies that we were looking at, we were really more concerned with the ability to categorize uh, the different kinds of climate change research, um, trying to understand what are those impacts on freshwater systems or what trying, like basically we were interested in the fact that we, we, we do want the communities or it would be nice if it was more clear um, when they're not using the same language. Um, even though this particular uh, network is showing, you know, certain nodes are bigger because they are being cited a lot. Um, I guess I, you know, we were less concerned about things like Merton effects um, per se, and more concerned with whether or not um, the literature was sufficiently mature, uh, that you could actually have um, these automated techniques supporting the scientific, the applied scientific assessment that is currently done exclusively um, by human readers. Um, so um, I, I guess I feel like in relation to your question that we're not necessarily concerned about um, either, you know, that wild paper that like uses like really strange language. It, it did seem like we instead were having the opposite problem of um, a lot of climate change researchers, perhaps in order for them to be able to communicate across communities, there are certain terms that have just become, they've become shared vocabulary across all of the communities and that actually makes it harder um, for uh, automated approaches or that's what we think is going on is that it makes it harder for the automated approaches to exclusively come in and do a lot of the work um, for human readers. Uh, but you know, perhaps in future research, what we really, the question that we really ought to be asking is, how do you have human computer interaction uh, between these two things rather than, um, you know, maybe we, we were asking a question that was kind of unfair um, of the algorithms trying to see them perform exclusively on their own. And really what we need to be thinking about is how do you get people who are unfamiliar with these tools to actually start using them to improve uh, literature reviews and, and assessments that they need to do anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Uh, any other question? No one? So we might move on with the last presentation for this session. Thank you, Vanessa, again. Uh, so the next paper is um, a study of computational reproducibility using URLs linking to open access data sets and software by Lamia Salsa-Bill, Lian Wu, Muntabir Hassan uh, Choudhury, William Ingram, Edward Fox, uh, and Sarah Rathmeyer, and uh, C. Lee Gilles. Who's presenting? Lamia, I guess. Uh, we can see you. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. What is yours? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Hello everyone, this is Lamia Salsabil and uh, I am a graduate student at Old Dominion University. Today I'm going to present our work, a study of computational reproducibility using URLs linking to open access datasets and software. 
the goal of our work is to study the computational reproducibility using models that lead to open access data sets and software. And for the rest of the slide, uh, slides, I'm going to uh, address open access data sets and software by the term OATS. And also I'm going to uh, use the term OATS URLs, which means the URLs that links to open access data sets and software. So uh, since the inception of internet, research papers that uses uh, computational methods include open access data sets and software URLs in their work to show the transparency of their work and also the, the purpose. Uh, sometimes people who are like trying to replicate computational experiments, the OATs are uh, important resources for that. And also for building repositories supporting computational reproducibility, OATs are useful. Uh, Recently, uh, computer, computational reproducibility has been studied in several uh, research papers. For example, Matthews uh, studied the URLs linking to datasets, focusing on the papers of ACMC mode and uh, PVLDB. Uh, they introduced a simple keyword based method to search for links that, uh, to source materials. And Michael Ferber, uh, in their recent study, analyzed uh, the quality and usage of GitHub code repositories using the Microsoft Academic Graphs, and uh, the authors found out a, and demonstrated a strong bias towards specific computer science areas uh, like machine learning and publication uh, venues. And Philip Pimentel, in his study, uh, studied uh, 1.4 million Jupyter notebooks from GitHub just to uh, provide insights into the reproducibility of real notebooks. These are a couple of examples of OADS URLs. The blue, uh, the blue boxes represents the data set URLs and the green box represents the uh, software URLs. So uh, uh, while uh, suppose we, someone is trying to work with a single paper, they're examining research papers to extract, extract OADS, it can be uh, done simply when someone is just working with a single research paper. But what if we are working with a lot of research papers, like 100,000 research papers just to extract OADS? Uh, so manually examining all the, this huge amount of research papers uh, to extract OADS will be very challenging because it will be laborious, time consuming and impractical at the same time. So uh, the automation of identifying OADS URLs can be fast and time efficient and at the same time can be used to characterize and assess research producibility. So from that point of view, uh, in our work, we developed a hybrid classifier and we named it as OADS classifier to automatically identify OADS URLs in a scientific papers. And we created a data set of 500 samples to, uh, if, uh, to train and evaluate our classifier. Then we investigated the disciplinary dependencies and chronological trend of uh, OADS in electronic thesis and dissertations using our classifier. So here comes the OADS classifier pipeline. In our work, the, uh, firstly, we converted the research papers that are in PDF format in the text, uh, text format using two different uh, Python libraries. One is PDF minor and another one is PyPDF2. So the conversion result that we got from both the uh, libraries, we compared them and we noticed that the conversion result from PyPDF2 removed five spaces between words. So which made it very difficult to perform sentence segmentation on those uh, texts. So we proceeded the results from PDF minor in our work. Later, we performed sentence segmentation on converted text files using Spacey. And after that, uh, here comes the task of extraction of sentences with URLs, for which we built regular expression, which is following, to detect URLs in a sentence. And using that, we extracted sentences containing URLs. After that, here comes uh, a major step, which is URL classification. For this uh, task, we introduced a hybrid met method, which is a combination of a heuristic model and a learning-based model. And we use that for uh, the classification task. So uh, the heuristic classifier uh, is basically just a simple method to eliminate URLs that either ends with .pdf or link to publishers. So while we were working uh, with our data set, we notice that majority of the publishers URL don't link to OADS or the URLs which ends with .pdf, they also don't uh, basically link to publisher URLs. So uh, keeping that in mind, we built a control list of 54 major publishers like Wiley, SagePub, and we uh, used that heuristic classifier to eliminate those URLs, those, those publisher URLs or the URLs that either ends with .pdf. So these are two examples that represents publisher URLs. 
we used a learning based classifier with the purpose to encode the sentences that sentences that contains URLs using a pre-trained language model. In our work, we used three different transformer language models, which are BART, Distilbert, Roberta, and a document level embedding model, which is Spectre. We compared all the results from uh, the results from all four uh, all four pre-trained language models. And uh, in our work, we used a maximum sequence length of 512. And to avoid overfitting, we used a dropout rate of 0.2. And later on, the vector representations that we got from the uh, language models, we use them to train and test a binary logistic regression classifier. I have already talked about a uh, hybrid method uh, in previous slides. So in our work, we uh, introduced three different ways to uh, a three different approach to combine the heuristic and learning based models. So in the first approach, which is no heuristic classifier, we just simply took all the uh, sentences with URLs and fed them into uh, language models to get the sentence encoding. We didn't apply the heuristic classifier at all on the sentences. The, in the uh, next approach, which is heuristic classifier for uh, test data. So there we apply the heuristic classifier to only testing corpora before sentence encoding. After that, uh, the remaining sentences that we got from the uh, heuristic classifier, we fed them into uh, la uh, language models and got the sentence encoding. So the third approach is heuristic classifier for train and test data where we uh, apply the heuristic classifier to both training and testing corpora to eliminate all the publisher URLs and the URLs which ends with .pdf. And then the remaining sentences that we got, we fed them into a language model to get the sentence encoding. Uh, but in our work, we also uh, try to figure out and investigate whether URL itself can be very useful information uh, I mean, uh, for the URL classification task. So for that, we use two different ways to handle URLs. One is masked and another one is unmasked approach. So uh, in unmasked approach, what uh, what we did, we just took, uh, we preserved the original URLs in the sentence as it is. Uh, in the, in the first example, we can see that all the, uh, in the first text box, we can see that all the URLs are preserved just as they are. And in another approach, we basically masked all the original URLs with the word URL. So uh, in the second text box, text box, we can see that all the URLs are masked by the word URL. So for uh, training and testing purpose, uh, we created a data sample of 500 sentences, which we extracted from Core 90 dataset and an in-house corpus of social and behavioral science papers. We used two different class labels. One is OADS and another one is non-OADS. Non-OADS means that those URLs don't link to any open access datasets or, or as of and software. And OADS means the URLs basically need to either open access uh, data, uh, data set or software. So we also, uh, in our work, there, we, there were total 248 uh, samples of OADS class and 252 samples of non-OADS class. And we randomly split the data set into train and test uh, and for, from which uh, 400 samples were used for training purpose and the remaining were used for testing purpose. While doing the uh, data annotation, we faced a few challenges like uh, because of the ambiguity of the sentences. Here is an example sentence uh, which contains some URLs and the sentence says that for more information, see this particular URL. So this particular sentence doesn't mention anything about either data set or software. And this is a very ambiguous sentence just by looking at the context of the, of the sentence, it is hard to uh, label it as how I heard to label it. So uh, for this kind of sentences, we had to visit the URL that linked to this uh, websites. And uh, while labeling this, we focused on determining the nature of the content. And the data set that we created was independently labeled by two graduate students with a consensus rate of 83.6%. After that, we, in our work, we also used OADS classifier to show the disciplinary distribution and chronological trend analysis and forecast of work. Uh, for that purpose, we used ETD dataset, which uh, and the corpus, with the ETD corpus by Udin was collected by crawling electronic thesis and dissertations of 42 university libraries. And in the data set, the fraction of ETD metadata fields have uh, missing data. And most common missing fields are like ER department subjects. And that the data set also contains embargoed ETDs that were published in recent years. 
For our work, we randomly selected 100,000 ATDs from about 450 ATDs uh, from you know, 60 different disciplines. And while doing, uh, while selecting uh, ATDs, we make sure that uh, all the content, uh, all the selected content values in the uh, uh, content values in the ER and department fields. And when we observed the uh, department list, we noticed that most of the departments are closely related. So we consolidated 60 departments into 18 disciplines using the outline of academic disciplines from Wikipedia. After that, we performed evaluation of our classifier. So for that, we used standard metrics like precision recall, F1 score. And, uh, uh, the table one demonstrates the performance for different hybrid models uh, uh, only for distal bird language models. So uh, we just showed it for uh, the language model, uh, distal bird, because of the space constraint. Uh, and from the result, we can clearly see that adding heuristic classifier for both training and testing data achieved the highest F1, uh, F1 score, which is 92%. And in table two, we showed the precision recall and F1 score for the classifier, uh, OAJ for the OAJS classifier. And we can see the best performance was achieved by distal bird plus logistic regression uh, model, which is uh, 0. Point, uh, and uh, for which the F1 score is 0. 0.92. And, uh, for, and, the, the, uh, and the classifier showed better results when we URLs were preserved in the sentence. So from both the table, we can observe uh, very clearly that in general, the classifier achieves a higher F1 score if URLs are not masked. Though uh, an URL, an arbitrary URL can be an out of vocabulary token, but uh, when an URL itself can be parsed into subword tokens, and if those subword tokens uh, comprises words like data set, data, tool, software, so it, this, these words can be put in indicators for OADs URLs. After that, uh, we used the classifier and we applied it on the ETDs to show uh, disciplinary dependence. So using our classifier on the on our uh, selected ETD corpus, we uh, it could extract over 3 million sentences containing URLs. And among all those sentences, we could identify approximately 51,000 uh, sentences uh, that contains OADS URLs. And all those OADS URLs are from uh, it, uh, from uh, where extra uh, like found out uh, identified from uh, approximately uh, 15,950 ETDs out of uh, 96,842 ETDs. And uh, in our work, we also demonstrated the inclusion of OADS URLs that changes depending on academic discipline. Figure one shows the dependence of the fractions of OADS URL and OADS ETD for academic disciplines. and. Uh, as we randomly selected ETDs from the parent corpus, uh, we tried to calculate the fraction of OADS URL and OADS ETDs because when we randomly select uh, ETDs, there can be the case that some uh, more ETDs were selected from uh, chemistry department and less were selected from computer science. To avoid that bias, we tried to calculate the fraction of the OADS URL and OADS ETDs, and we used this particular equation to calculate that. So from the uh, figure, from figure one, we can see some interesting results. Like uh, it shows that computer science has the highest fraction of OADs, ETDs, which is about fifty point two percent, and uh, the result actually aligns with the uh, analysis showed in Michael Ferber's work. And uh, we can also see that ETDs in social sciences, sciences like political science, sociology, anthropology has a, a relatively higher fraction of OADs ETD percentage than STEM disciplines like engineering, biology. And uh, certain, ED, uh, certain disciplines have a very small fraction of OAD, OADs ETDs, which is less than 10%, for example, uh, chemistry department, business department. And uh, in summary, we can conclude that the inclusion of OADS URLs exhibited a strong dependence on disciplines. We also performed chronological trend analysis using our classifier on ETDs and figure two demonstrates the number of OADS URLs and OADS ETDs as a function of publication year. Uh, the distribution of ETDs over years showed that a significant increase of OADS ETDs and URLs from year 2005. And the main ETD data set that we, from which we selected our uh, ETDs did not represent all the ETDs in the United States. And also a substantial fraction of recent ETDs was embargoed from parent corpus. 
figure three shows the fractions of OADS euros, which is uh, marked by the blue curve, and, and OADS ED, and OADS EDDs, which is marked by the uh, red curve, as a function of a year. So the fraction of OADS EDDs uh, shown sh 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 by the uh, red curve uh, demonstrates that uh, it, the fraction of OADS EDDs has been gradually increasing over the years, from less than five percent in 2000 to more than 25 percent in 2010, and to about 40 percent in 2020. And uh, the, uh, the, blue, uh, the blue curve shows that since 26 and the fraction of OADS URLs has been gradually decreased from 15% to about 10% in 2019 to 2020. So this may be an artifact because, uh, I mean, the major reason can be because of the trends and things like that is the reduction of either including OADS URLs in EDDs and or the increase of non-OADS URLs in EDDs. And another reason can be the selection bias due to the weak correlation between embargoed EDDs and the inclusion of OADS URLs. In our uh, work, the experiment results are experimental results are very preliminary because data set uh, that we use for training and testing purpose of our OADS classifier is relatively small, and uh, the training and evaluation that we draw of, from coordinating data set and social social and behavioral science that data set. So for our future work, we are currently working on building a larger corpus for training and testing purpose. And we are also trying to draw data samples from uh, multiple disciplines. And we are, are working towards to uh, make a classifier which can distinguish between whether various URLs linked to data set or to software, and also whether published by authors or in, uh, included as a third party resources. A more complete sample is needed to reveal more accurate trend and dependencies after year 2016, uh, and on which we are also working. So in summary, we studied the computational reproducibility using OADS URLs focusing on EDDs that we collected that were collected from the United States universities. And we developed a classifier which we named as OADS classifier to identify OADS URLs automatically. And our classifier achieves a best F1 score of 0 0.92. And we also uh, showed that the inclusion of OADS URLs exhibited a strong dependence on disciplines. The chronological trend analysis demonstra demonstrated that the trends of including OADS in ETDs has been gradually increasing over the years. And uh, that's all about my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you. So is there any question? uh from the audience angelo pointed out before uh something in the chat and i i added up something like uh, have you tried grobid or sermine there are two well-known parts of of, of uh, for pdfs uh, i mean papers and publications uh, scientific articles pdf parses rather than using custom ones I uh, know we didn't try Grobit. So, I mean, Grobit can be good for uh, extracting URLs. Uh, but uh, what we did, we built regular expression to detect URLs. And using those URLs, we uh, tried to detect uh, the uh, using that regular expression, we detected URLs from sentences. And on the basis of that, we extracted sentences that contain URLs. Mm -hmm. And you're extracting from from the entire PDFs, not only from the reference section, right? No, it's from the entire PDF. Any, any, any part of it, yeah. yeah yes. Uh, any other question? Otherwise, I would uh, call it uh, and, and wrap up for lunch. OK, so we, I can dismiss you all. And uh, so I think we have roughly an hour. Light, right for lunch we need to start again uh, let me see the agenda for today um yes precisely Andrea. Yeah. so we'll start at uh, uh, 2 p.m central european time so in more or less one hour yeah okay uh so just a reminder for everyone uh, just a reminder for everyone we have the keynote speakers and the panel later on yeah So you know what? Uh, so this is the third session of the workshop on scientific knowledge, uh, representation, discovery, and assessment, or as we call it, chic. Uh, I'm very happy to see you here. 
Uh, today we are honored to host uh, two fantastic keynotes from two of the most important figures in our community. Uh, Jason Poim, who will talk about the new Open Alex project, and Alex Wade, uh, who will present his work with uh, uh, the Semantic Scholar Academic Graph. Uh, so starting with, uh, with Jason, uh, many of you will know him as uh, uh, one of the creators of the field of art matrix, uh, creating the terms uh, and authoring the influential art matrix manifesto, uh, is also uh, the co founder of our search, that is a, a non profit organization that builds open software to promote uh, uh, open science. And just, and just on most recent project is uh, Open Alex which is a free and comprehensive index of scholarly paper, authors, institution, and much more uh, that, as you know, is much needed in uh, this community. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Jason Prim. Great, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, terrific. Um, all right, well, first of all, I want to apologize because it is uh, five o'clock in the morning here in Vancouver, and I also had COVID for the last couple of days. So between those two things, you're not getting peak Jason, we'll say, but I'm going to do my best. And um, I'm going to try and keep it to about um, uh, like 25 minutes or so, so that we can have a nice juicy amount of time um, for questions. Um, and I also, I'm going to share my screen right now. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, I've had to stop to like blow my nose a couple of times. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to, uh, I'm going to share my screen and, oops, let's not hide it. And I'm just going to share like the, the slide, um, like composing view, because I want to switch back and forth to, um, to my browser a lot. And it's hard to do if I like to do the full screen. So I'm just going to go, so you should see like the slides as though I were like making my slideshow right now. Um, and we'll go to some of these other tabs in a minute. So uh, Open Alex is, uh, and let me make sure I can see everybody. Hang on, I gotta move you guys' pictures so that I can see it. There y'all are. All right, uh, so Open Alex is an open and comprehensive index of scholarly works, citations, authors, institutions, and more. And hang on, I just realized my little space here is so I'm gonna turn it off. There you go, I was probably making some noise for you guys, sorry about that. So yes, it's an open and comprehensive index of scholarly works, citations, authors, institutions, and more. Today, I want to talk about Open Alex, and specifically, I want to cover a couple of different topics. I want to talk about the history of the project. I want to talk about our data model. I want to talk about our process of how we gather, organize, and deliver the data. I want to talk about the openness behind Open Alex. It's part of the name, so it's pretty important for us. I want to thank some people who helped uh, sponsor us, and I want to end with a couple of key questions because I thought. A really good opportunity that we have here is uh, we got a lot of people who you know are into this who study this who know a lot about it in one place and i bet you guys will have a lot of really interesting things to say that i wouldn't necessarily have uh, to offer so we're gonna end with some key questions and hopefully have a little bit of time uh, to talk about those so let's go uh, oops let's talk about history first um so uh our history starts with uh, with the organization, which uh, you heard was called our research. Uh, we originally called Impact Story. Uh, we started a hackathon about 10 years ago. Um, and so me and my co-founder, Heather, were both at the hackathon and worked together all night on this kind of hackathon project. And then when we were done, we said, you know what, we got to keep working on this. Like She was a postdoc at the time. I was a PhD student at the time. We said, we got to find a way to keep working on this. So we kept working on it. Eventually, we got some funding for it. And we got some more funding for it. And then before long, it was all we did. Uh, and so, uh, so we, we think that's an important kind of part of our, uh, I guess you say DNA, um, our heritage and our culture is that we like building stuff and we really like building stuff that's open and we like working in a collaborative way. Um, and we like kind of doing stuff fast and getting it out there and seeing what people think and then kind of building on it from there, kind of with that hackathon ethos. Um, Heather's work and my work was both uh, heavily into open science and open access. And because of that, openness is really part of our organization. We'll, we'll cover that in, in a minute. So one of the things, one of the projects we were doing was using Microsoft Academic Graph. And so when Microsoft Academic Graph announced last year that they were going to cancel uh, that project, we, like many other people in the MAG, I'll say MAG from now on, uh, the MAG community were, you know, shocked and appalled, uh, same as everybody else. Uh, and we were like, oh, what are we going to do? And we realized there weren't a lot of good substitutions out there. And we thought, well, this could be a good opportunity for us to maybe help out the community 
we can make a substitute instead of just choosing it for itself, we'll make it open for everybody and hopefully everybody can use this. And so <clears throat> we started working on that in the summer uh, and we worked pretty hard on that for about, you know, like five, five months or something like that and five, six months uh, so that we could launch it at the same time that MAG discontinued. And one of the decisions we made early on is it needed to be backwards compatible with MAG. So it needed to use the exact same schema and you include everything that MAG included. So all of the works and everything that you would find in MAG, you would also find in our uh, new system open, which became called Open Alex. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and yeah, you would be able to use it as a drop and replacement. So if you already had a, a, an ingest workflow for MAG, you could just switch it out with Open Alex and it worked fine. It's just we would be keeping it up to date. So we did that. Um, we launched it on time uh, in uh, at you know January first, and then I guess the next you know that's kind of the, the past history. I guess the future history is that we're going to continue uh, working on Open Alex. And as we launched it, we found that there was a uh, we found that there was a bigger audience than we realized um, for this. So there was about you know maybe a few thousand people who were already using Mag. But we found when we launched Open, Al Open Alex that there were way more people than those couple thousand who hadn't really even heard about MAG who wanted what we were doing. So, um, so we started looking at ways we can improve MAG, and that involved improvements to their data process, um, you know, the accuracy, the coverage, things like that, and also improvements to the way we deliver the data. And we'll get into that um, in a minute. Um, but enough to say, you know, we, we made a, an open API, we made a different sort of data model. And the most important benchmark for folks who might be using the data now is that in July, we will discontinue the MAG compatible, um, uh, uh, what do they call it, data dump, and we'll only have the open Alex, the new open Alex format. So you still got a couple of months um, to prepare for that. So that's kind of the history, including future history. Um, now I want to talk about the data model. So I know I was one slide ahead. So this is the data model. Um, it's a little bit different than the one for MAG. Um, there's a couple big differences. Um, we think it's better <laughs> because, of course, you know, once you start tinkering something, you always got to figure out, oh, man, I got a better way to do this. So, yeah, we came with what we think is a better way to do it. Maybe we're right. Maybe we're wrong. You guys be the judge. But this is what we've got. Um, the first thing to notice is that, um, like MAG, everything's sort of flat. Um, we've got five different types of entities here, all the ones that are in colors. So we've got works, um, authors, venues, institutions, and concepts. And all of those are equal. Those are all first class citizens. So this is a heterogeneous, as Mag says, and I think correctly, yeah, this is a heterogeneous uh, graph of the scholarly communications system, right? So an author connects to an authorship, a concept connects to works, right? They're all just little dots and lines connecting each other. Um, but at the same time, even though it's heterogeneous, and even though all these entities have their own, you know, uh, their own first class representation within the, in the graph, um, Works is at the center. Everything points back to works. And we think that's appropriate because uh, works is in fact at the center of the scholarly communications ecosystem. And in fact, I would argue that everything else is just defined by works, right? So like what, what makes an author a scholarly author? Well, do they write scholarly works, right? It's the same thing as saying that if I want to try and identify all of the, all the basketball gyms in the United States, uh, I wouldn't start off by evaluating all the properties of the gym, right? Like what's its square footage? How tall is it? Does, I would say, well, do people play basketball there or not? If they play basketball there, that's probably a basketball gym, right? And then I'll evaluate the other parts. <clears throat> so similarly, is something a scholarly uh, venue or not? Is something a scholarly institution or not? Well, are there people there who produce scholarly works? That, that's really what it all comes down to. So that's why we think works needs to be at the center of the graph, um, which is what Mag had as well, which, which we think is great. Um, we changed the names around a little bit. Um, one thing, you'll see a couple of things that aren't on this graph. Um, uh, so patents, patents is not on this graph. I don't think patents should be on this graph. Mag had patents, but I think that was a mistake. I think that that is overreach. I don't think that's actually a scholarly product. I think patents are built on scholarly products. They cite scholarly products, but they're not themselves scholarly products. Uh, I think once you include patents, why don't you include, you know, uh, popular science books, you know, that are written for, for the popular public, those cite science papers, right? Like the pamphlet somebody gives me outside of a, of a rally somewhere that science cites a science paper, right? So I, I think just because it cites a science paper doesn't mean it belongs in the scholarly graph. I think that's things that are really important and people should build applications around those. And in fact, for patents, a lot of people have built applications that gather the patent ecosystem. So that's why we feel like it's out of scope um, for, for the, the scholarly graph. Um, one thing you won't see in here is data sets. That one is a bit of a, I don't know, maybe it should be in there, maybe it shouldn't, I'm not sure. Um, I think there's an argument that it should because it's certainly a scholarly product. Um, there's an argument that shouldn't in that there's 
several orders of magnitude more potential uh, data sets than there are uh, other types of scholarly works. Um, and especially the granularity of data sets becomes tricky, right? There's a lot of data sets where a single, um, a single file out of millions of files, right, has its own identifier because it's its own data set. A single photograph, right, could be a, a, a datum. Uh, even a single line in a spreadsheet could be a, a datum that has its own identifier. And so at some point, this, these things start to magnify out of control. So maybe they should go in the graph, maybe they shouldn't. For now, for practical reasons, they're not in the graph, but that may change in the future. And then finally, uh, funders are not in the graph. And honestly, I think funders should be in the graph. I think that's just a weakness of what we're doing so far. Um, I think that, you know, like the National Science Foundation, Sloan Foundation, et cetera, I think those belong here. Um, so far, just for technical reasons, we haven't, they weren't in MAG, and so they, haven't, they weren't a priority for us to do. That's something that we definitely do want to add um, in due time. So looking at the stuff that is in the graph, um, I just will uh, quickly define what we're actually talking about there and quickly you know, make a, a few notes about the structure. So the works uh, is pretty straightforward. That can be um, you know, papers, articles is a big one, but of course we also have books. Uh, we also have got posters. Um, we do have a few data sets in there, not on purpose. They just sort of sneak in. Um, we've got, uh, what else? Um, uh, we don't have, uh, I'll, I'll talk about figures in a minute actually. Yeah, so scholarly works, you guys get the idea. Um, venues are places that host works. So the edge there between venues and works is hosting, right? A venue is a place, what is a venue? A venue is a place that hosts a work. So a journal is the most, most well-known of those. We've got a lot of journals, um, but we've also got uh, things like preprint repositories. So archive, right, would be a venue. Um, we've got places like institutional repositories. Um, like uh, you know, a lot of you know, institutional repositories. So we got lots of different types of venues. Anywhere that hosts a work is a venue. Um, <clears throat> uh, a concept, right, is kind of um, what the work is about. So biology would be a concept. Um, uh, computational biology would be a concept. Uh, the edge that links those is tagging. So we tag a work with a concept. Um, authors, authors and institutions is a little bit tricky because we would argue that authors and institutions are not linked directly to works. Uh, authors and institutions are linked via something we call an authorship to work. So an authorship is a claim that someone has made about the work that says, I will say, in this case, Jason Preen, who am affiliated with the organization called Our Research, have published this work. And we think that that's the correct way to model this because I, I Jason Preen, am not necessarily innately affiliated with anywhere. I claim an affiliation on a particular work because we have authors who they may claim one of their affiliations for a particular work and for another work author at the exact same time not claim that affiliation right because they may have like these sort of partial affiliations or honorary affiliations stuff like that so we can get more into the details of that but the way we model this is that an author and institution are connected to work via an authorship claim and of course an authorship an author can claim multiple institutions and of course we have multiple authors on a work so um so that's kind of the data model, and I, I look forward, maybe we could ask some questions about that because we can get deep into this, and I know I've already probably gone too far. Um, so all of this is uh, built around an OpenAlex ID. Everything has got an ID uh, in the data set. Um, oh, you know what I didn't tell you, which I should have? I'm sorry about that. Just, uh, just a bit of a gist of the numbers. Um, so uh, where do I go? Yeah, let me look those up real quick, and I can get you. you um, they make sense of the numbers. Um, so for works, we've got about 200 million, uh, 210 million works. Uh, for venues, uh, it's on the order of 100,000 venues, um, which is pretty good coverage. It's more than you would find a lot of places. Uh, for concepts, there's about 60,000 concepts. Um, authors, is roughly 200 million authors. Uh, and institutions, it's about um, uh, somewhere around 100,000 institutions. So yeah, all of this is each of these uh, nodes in the graph has got its own ID. So this is what an open Alex ID is. Um, I think kind of some of the cool things about the ID are first of all, the IDs are all um, URLs, so they'll all take you somewhere um, where you can see more about that item. And then the unique part of the ID um, is a letter followed by a numeric string. This numeric string is backwards compatible with mag. So mag minted numeric IDs for all of their items. If there is a mag ID, it's this. If there's not a mag ID, of course, you know, this is just our own thing that we minted. So that's a way, it's a kind of a cute way you can go back to the, to the mag data. Um, and then this at the beginning tells you whether it's a work, author, venue, institution, or concept. So obviously W for work. So if I wanted to take this and put it, copy it, put it in my little browser, this will resolve to this cute little website here. 
that says, okay, state of AOA, here's the authors, here's identifiers. I can kind of even traverse this little graph by going to clicking on some of the different things. And this is, as you can see, it's under construction. Um, we're going to launch a much better website uh, in the summer. We were shooting for February, so it says February. This is this is how this works, right? <laughs> February, sure, why not? That's optimistic. But actually, I think in the summer we should have this launched. Um, we definitely need to change that. Sorry about that. Um, but here's a cool thing about the ID. So if I want, if I just plug it in like this, I got a website. But what if I don't want a website? What if I want a more structured representation? I'm going to type .json at the end of it, and ta-da! Here's the exact same data. But this is in a structured format. So this is all the same stuff. I got my title, right? I got all my different IDs. I got a PM ID here if I want it. Um, but I got stuff about the host, host venue. I, I know whether it's open access. Um, I know things about the authorship. So all of those things you saw on that web page, those are all on this um, same JSON representation. Um, and I can even get, I can even download the same thing as BibTech, which I think is kind of neat. Um, the other kind of ID that we have, so we have our own open Alex ID. And that's persistent, right? Oh, the other cool thing about that open Alex ID is that will always resolve. So the open Alex ID is never, I mean, always says, you know, as long as we're around, which is of course the big question, but like, as long as we're around, that always resolve. And um, we won't, it won't just disappear. So mag would just, you know, things would just disappear. An ID would be there one week and it'd be gone next week. It'll always be there. It might get merged with other things, but if it does merge, it'll just redirect to that new, um, that new ID. So you can kind of count on once, once the ID is there, it's persistent. Um, and so we also have this concept of the canonical external ID. So this is a good time to talk about, you know, I think this tension between when people build these graphs, they tend to have one or two approaches. They either want to look at the structured data. So they want to say, hey, let's take, um, you know, DOI and ORCID and ROAR. People already have these awesome PID graphs. Let's just combine those existing projects and then we'll have our own mega PID graph. And that's awesome. I think that's a great project. I think that's something people should do. Another thing people do sometimes is, ah, oh, the PIDs are garbage. Like they don't have very good coverage. Let's mine the, the world, let's mine the, the web and pull all this data out and we can ignore the PID graph because the coverage is so poor. So that was the approach that MAG did. And MAG, if you read their, um, if you read their, uh, their literature, it's pretty funny because they will talk about how, um, you know, they, they purposely avoid the PID graph. Like they don't look at DOIs, they don't want DOIs. They, they have like a philosophical, uh, what would you say, a philosophical distaste for the PID graph because they think that the, the coverage is so poor. So we think we think neither approach is complete by itself. What we try and do is both. So we do a lot of mining um, of unstructured information, and we also take all the structured information. And I think that gives us kind of the best both best of both worlds. So let me show you. Um, hang on, let me connect to the tab. And I think I can just drop this in here. Oh, that's not how it is. Sorry. Uh, how do I show you this picture? Okay, hang on. I'm almost got it. Again, I apologize. Five o'clock in the morning is not my best time for uh, for giving presentations. It's not my best time for anything, really. Okay, here we go. So I think this is a cool picture. This is works per year in MAG and Crossref. So this red part is just in MAG. The blue part is just in Crossref, and the purple part is both. And this is based on your publication. So the stuff from 1975 doesn't really matter that much. But if you look at at kind of the you know since 2010. You can see that Mag's approach, where they eschew, uh, eschew DOIs, they don't care about DOIs, is allowing them to get all this stuff in the red that you know doesn't live in the DOI world, which is great, good for Mag. But because they're ignoring DOIs, they're actually missing the stuff, this blue stuff that's only in Crossref, which is you know I think that's useful. But when you break it down here, I think what's cool is you see that Mag's approach is becoming less and less valuable, right? Ignoring DOIs is actually causing you to miss more and more things down here and it's giving you less and less value right like so so that's why we think it's important to include both uh, and we think that uh, if we were going to bet on one approach we would say hey let's focus on looking at stuff that is doi assigned because that's an increasing percentage of the literature that's out there all right so going back to here so yeah so the different canonical external ids we use these are the ones that are like i said pids that already the graphs that already exist that people put a lot of work in making so that means works. Uh, we use DOI, as mentioned. Authors, we use ORCID. Uh, for venues, we use ISSNL. I'd love to talk more about that because that's something that doesn't have as much, um, I think, uh, awareness in the community that it should. Um, journals have different ISSNs. They've got a print ISSN, they've got an electronic ISSN, sometimes they have more. Um, and often, especially at Crossref, they'll only give you one. 
And so when you're trying to match journals or you're trying to group by journals, you'll find that there's not a single primary key for the journal. So you end up with a big group for you know, nature online and a big group for nature paper, and you don't want that, right? So the ISSN Foundation came up with this thing called ISSNL or ISSN linking. That's supposed to be the canonical ISSN. And so we put a lot of work into finding that for every um, every journal. And we think that's uh, that's very valuable. It's certainly been very valuable for us when we've done journal level aggregation. And so that's why we're trying to get that in the community a little more. Um, for institutions, we got the RUR ID, which is you know the successor to the GRID ID. And then for concepts, uh, we've got the Wikidata ID. Um, concepts is a whole nother topic, um, but I think it's a cool one. Uh, and we like that every single, oh, I should look at the coverage here too. So about half of our works have got a DOI. Um, a very small percentage of authors have got an ORCID, unfortunately, um, although that percentage is growing. <clears throat> about 90% of our journals have got an ISSNL. And again, that 90% is because we're not saying it has to have a PID. If it does have a PID, we'll find it, but we also include stuff that doesn't. Um, PID being persistent identifier. Uh, and uh, for Roar, uh, I would say, you know, more than that, like something like 90% or at least of the institutions have got a Roar. The Roar coverage is terrific. Um, and uh, for concepts, 100% of our concepts have Wicked ID. That's the one, that's the only one where we're, you know, we're only sticking with one, per, one, one particular PID graph. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, and we can, like I said, we can ask questions about all these. Uh, that one's duplicated. Okay, let's talk about God. <laughs> Specifically, gather, organize, and deliver. I didn't come with that acronym on purpose. I just found out that once I typed it down, it spelled God, and I thought that was funny. Um, so uh, it's a very big topic, exactly how, how Open Alex is made. Um, so I'm just going to hit a couple of the high points, um, and then, like I said, we can get into the questions, which I know I'm starting to eat into my time for questions very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, the main thing about gather is that we start with works. Everything starts from works uh, for the reasons kind of I talked about earlier. Um, and we take from three types of sources for works. So we take from structured sources. So that would be people who have come up with APIs, be beautiful, like perfectly formatted, wonderful information like Crossref, like PubMed, right? So that's one of our sources for works. Then we use semi-structured. So semi-structured, I would say, is, uh, is OAI PMH. So the world of OAI PMH is a wonderful, wonderful world full of wonderful people doing very well-intentioned things, but many of those well-intentioned things are a server under a librarian's desk that has been running more or less untouched for five years that was about 50% set up by the guy who was here before me. I don't know, I think his name was John, but I don't know. Yeah, like it's not a super well-structured, like the data quality is definitely inconsistent. And so it's a lot of work to take all of those PMH records and turn them into something that is you know, consistent that you can really use. Um, we harvest uh, about, I don't know, a few, we actually only harvest a few PMH repositories right now in the system, but we're halfway to finishing kind of harvesting several thousand. We have about for Unpaywall, which is another project we do, we've got a, an index of like five or 6,000 um, PMH repositories. And so we'll be adding that to OpenLX soon. Um, so that includes everything from archive to, you know, the University of Florida Institute of Repository with 3,000 papers in it or whatever. Um, and then finally, unstructured. So that's the publisher web pages themselves, right? So we can actually like pull away, pull information from that web page. What we don't pull from is the entire web. So that was what, what um, Mag was doing. They were building that on the back of the big web crawler. We don't have the big web crawler. And um, I was happy, you know, when I talked to Quanzan, you know, the guy behind Mag, um, you know, he was like, yeah, we, we, that was, we wouldn't do that again. It was too much work for too, too little payoff, um, which, which sounds right to me. I, to me, I think, Harvesting scholarly papers from the entire web is like, you know, there's like a certain amount of gold dissolved in seawater, right? Like every cubic meter of seawater has got 0. 0.0001 and like grams of gold, but like it's economically, it doesn't make sense to filter the ocean to get a tiny bit of gold. I would say the same thing. I think let's go to where the actual um, scholarly products are and kind of focus on those. So we take all of those sources. And then uh, once we've got those, uh, let's go down, sorry, to the uh, our page. Source works is just structured, semi structured, unstructured. And then once we've got those, we need to do a few different things. Um, we need to group those, we need to deduplicate the groups, and we need to prioritize within the groups. So for works in particular, uh, the same work could be hosted in many different places. Um, it can be posted on the publisher website. That's generally the one people want. Um, but it could also be hosted on an institutional repository, right, as kind of a preprint version. It can be hosted on a preprint server. Um, it can be hosted all over the place. So we got to gather all this together, figure out the same work, even though, of course, they have slightly different titles and blah, 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 all that stuff. Right? So we got to kind of do that fuzzy match, group them all together, and then figure out which one's the best. And as part of that, we also figure out which ones are open, which ones are open access. And we also figure out the version 
right? So we figure out, is this, that's an automated system we have, um, completely different on paywall many years ago. And we figure out, is it the, the post peer review, pre, preprint, you know, which version? And we figure out the license, right? So it's the CC license, is it, you know, uh, all rights reserved, is it, um, excuse me, a public domain, et cetera. So that works. Um, from, oh yeah, I, I have this down here, yeah. So I wanted to go over WAVIC as my little acronym that helped remember works, authors, venues, institutions, concepts. Um, so authors, <clears throat> authors come from works uh, and they also come from ORCID. Uh, we cluster those based on the name and the citations. So we try and figure out, right, this Jason Preem am I the same as the other Jason Preem based on what kind of work we cite and what kind of work we publish. Um, and we kind of build those clusters. That's, you know, I, I think we're doing a, a good job on that ish. Like we're doing as good a job as MAG was. Honestly, I think that's kind of so-so. And so that's definitely something that we're going to be um, continuing to improve. No one does a perfect job, as we all know. Um, venues, um, we get the venues from the ISSN uh, portal uh, and also from, again, the works themselves. Um, so that's in the work metadata. So we can make new venues on that. A lot of that work, um, a lot of the venue stuff was done manually. Um, so we spent just a lot of time going over spreadsheets and you know doing group bias and trying to figure out if our, um, our groupings of venues make sense. So that's something that's been a like, couple of years in the making. Um, we think that's a pretty good data set. We're very happy about it. We don't think there's very many good kind of categories, catalog, catalogs of venues out there. So we think that's maybe something that, that could be useful for folks. Um, uh, what's the next one? Right, uh, institutions. So institutions comes from war. And again, it also comes from the works themselves and the metadata of the works. Um, and again, you can see kind of the, <laughs> like everything starts at the works and we pull stuff out of there. Um, and then again, we same thing. We do the clustering. Uh, we try and decide. You know, it's it's crazy how garbage the institution data is. Like I like until I started looking at this, I could not believe the number of ways people would say their institution and just get parts of it like just manifestly wrong, like of their own institution. They're like, hey, I'm from the University of Florida, but today I decided to call that the College of Florida because I figure those are about the same. You know, like just crazy. So we do our best to interpret that, but it is surprising how much how often someone has actually like written down an institution, but no, like not even a person could be able to figure out what institution that is. So we, I think we do an okay job, but again, I think there's, there's progress for that. We have a, a combination of rules-based matching with that and um, a machine learning algorithm that we train. So we, we do a round of rules-based first. And then once we're done, then we use the ML to try and like pick up the like the weirder ones. Um, and I think that two phases is so far the best approach we've, we've come up with. Um, and then finally the concepts, the concepts is the one where like actually getting the concepts is easy because we pulled that from mag and we pulled that from wikidata and using the wikidata concept graph is so cool to me because there's a whole other community out there using this concept graph um and we can kind of by using that same uh that same ontology we can link up with a lot of other efforts from a much broader community um so getting the concept is really easy the hard part is actually doing the linking right um how do i decide that a particular article should go with a particular concept and so that's when we trained the classifier on, it's a multi-label hierarchy classifier. We trained on the mag data uh, with some, again, kind of manual interventions in various places um, that would predict, hey, how mag would have tagged this paper. So that's, again, because of our legacy as a drop-in replacement for mag, that's kind of why we did it that way. Um, however, we did use a, a very strict, so mag had like about 600,000 concepts. I think that's way too many because they had concepts that would apply to like three papers. I don't think that's a concept. I think that's a that's a title at that point. So all of our concepts have to apply to at least a thousand papers. Um, and so that's kind of how we came up with that, that 60,000 um, threshold cutoff. There's a lot of room, I think, for improvement in concept tagging just for the community because it's so important for normalization. Um, and so we're working with a, a number of people in the community like, um, you know, uh, Stephanie Housesteen just had a meeting with her and um, uh, Ludo is doing cool stuff with open concepts. So we're, we're trying to work with people to kind of make these concepts open. And what we'd like to do, eventually do is like be able to incorporate multiple different concept taxonomies into open Alex. So that's uh, how we build the things. I'm just going to talk quickly about how we deliver. Um, not really very useful, right? If we just kind of have all the data in-house. Um, so everything is built for us on the API. And the reason for that is we think, um, first of all, that it's, uh, it's, the sweet spot between ease of use and power. So it's very easy to get, it's fairly easy to get started with if you're at all technical and it's extremely powerful because you can query everything about the API. So I have an example here that I want to use. So if you want one particular, oops, hang on. If you want one particular work, actually, let me show you this, this is cool. So I'm gonna go API, now here's works. 
this is all of the works in open Alex, right? The endpoint is slash works. So it's the works, it's every work that we have, all 209 million, right? So that's the total count. Now, if I want the next page of work, right? I can just say, okay, page equals two, right? And I can just keep doing that page after page after page for 200 million works. Please don't do this. This is not a good way to get the, all of the works. It'll take you forever. And you can actually just download the whole thing in one shot. But conceptually, I think it's neat that you could actually just page through every single page of works we have. And if you want to get, let's say, the venues, boom, there's our venues, right? There's all 124,000 venues. So at any given time, you know exactly how many they are, you can page through them. So what happens, most of the time we don't want every single work, right? We wanna do a little filtering. So here's an example of a filter that I kind of preloaded for you. So I'll show you how fast this is, which is pretty cool. And it is extremely easy to use uh, you don't need a, a registration. You don't need uh, an account. You just put this in your browser. So if you just want to copy this and put it in your browser, you can do that right now. So here's what here's what our search is. So we're searching for climate. I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. So y'all can uh, can I zoom? In? Oh, I can't. That's too bad. Anyways, so there's search equals climate. So this is papers that include climate in the title or the abstract. I could I could use the the subject. That might have been better, but I was just doing this quick. And then here's my filters. This I think is cool. So this is institution country code is AU, that's Australia. So this is papers from an Australian university. And then I also kind of thought, hey, what if I also showed papers that were in New Zealand University? So I gotta have both. So this would be international collaboration between Australia and New Zealand. It's OA equals true. So these are only open access papers about climate that were published in both, uh, with both uh, Australia and New Zealand authors. And then maybe I don't want stuff from this year because maybe I only want things that have been out for a couple of years so that it could have time for GreenAway to accumulate. So this that's what I get from this uh, from this query, right? And I get 721 of those. That's a more manageable number. That's really easy to page through. And then what's cool because it's an API is if you want to do this same you know double country comparison for every single country on Earth, that's a Python script that you can write in five minutes, right? It's extremely easy. So I can say, okay, well, what are the international collaborations between every single country that exists? Right, I just iterate through all of my countries on, you know, on this one, and for every one of those, all of my countries on this one, and I'm good to go. Right, and that's a few, I don't know, a few hundred thousand, I guess, uh, results. But that's no problem. Um, it's got very high limits. Each of these queries comes back in a couple hundred milliseconds, so you could do this in a few hours, maybe a day. All right? Yeah, maybe a day. Um, so yeah, so that's the API. Everything is built in the API. Uh, the download is a lot harder to use because the size of the data set is massive. I cannot overstate how difficult it is to use just to get it all set up and everything. It's a real big pain. But once you've got it, you've got literally the exact data set that we're working from. So you can completely copy what we're doing. Um, I can get into the format and stuff that in, uh, in a bit because I know we're, we're short on time. Um, <clears throat> oh, but the main thing that I think is cool about the data set is there is the Matic compatible one, but there's also the main data set, the Open Alex one, is exactly the same as what you get from the API. So if I wanted to get a particular work from the API, I can say works, and then I'm gonna I'll let this autocomplete. So this is by Open Alex ID. So this is one particular work. So if you download the data set, you're gonna get a, a 200 million lines of this. Each line is gonna be one JSON object. It's exactly the same as what you get from the API. And so because they're exactly compatible, it means you can use all the same documentation, which is pretty cool. You can also here for this one. Uh, you know, okay, and then finally the UI. So we're working on the UI. Uh, that's not done yet. Um, as you saw, but you'll be able to do all of the same. Um, so I've got a local host. So I think um, it's kind of in the middle of, let's say, frogs. So yeah, so you'll be able to look and kind of see all the articles you might see over here's, you know, one particular frog article and here's your quote and all this other kind of stuff. That's definitely not done yet, but it'll allow you, as you can see, to facet by all these different um, types of dimensions. And I think that that would be pretty helpful for folks who don't really want to use the technical part of the guide. What's neat is that that also, like the download is built on the API because it uses the API format, the UI is also built on the API, right? So we're built on our own API. We are our own API user there. And if you want to build your own UI on our API, you can do that, right? It's really easy to do. It's all documented and we would encourage that. So anyone can copy what we're doing, building on our own API. Um, a few quick words about openness. Um, all of the code is open. All of the data is open. All of the models are open. Every single thing we're doing is open. Um, it's all on GitHub. Uh, should I prove it? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh, nope, that's not it. Yeah, so all of our documentation, the website, everything, you can just search for Open Alex and you can see everything that we're doing. Um, uh, our concept tagging model, 100% of it's on GitHub. We think that's essential. We think anyone working in this space, 
I cannot emphasize enough that they're not making everything that they're doing open. I think we as a user community, and I say we because I come from a research background, I'm a person who used to use these systems. I think we need demand. Why not? Why isn't this open? Right in 1960 or whatever, when Eugene Garfield did the ISI, okay, I could understand why it wasn't open then. It was very expensive, manual, laborious process, blah, blah, blah. Nowadays, right, with today's like computing infrastructure that you can do so easy, this doesn't have to be expensive, which means it should be open. It needs to be open. I think we need to demand that. We created this, right? At the scholarly community, we built this graph. I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world, right? This is the spider web, this like incredibly intricate spider web tracing humankind's you know, exploration of the universe, all of the ideas we've ever had, all linked together. It's so pretty. It needs to be open. We built this. It's crazy that we allow commercial companies to wrap it up in tin foil and then sell it back to us. I think we we, we got to stop standing for that. So everything's open. I think it's important. I think our, our organization is open. So all of our grants, I want to show you this, because I think this is so cool. This is a project. This isn't our project, but I like to give them props called Open Grants. So we publish all of our grants there. So you can just search for my name or uh, Heather's name, my co-founder. And then every grant we've ever submitted is there, right? Whether we got the grant or not, you can look and see, hey, this is what we're going to plan to do. I think all that should be open. Um, our budgets are all open. Our salaries are open. Everything is open. I think that's really important for transparency. I think sustainability is extremely important. That's a whole other topic. We don't have time to get into it. But we do have a lot of exciting uh, plans for sustainability for this tool. We do have another two years of funding from the Arcadia Fund, which we're very happy about. Uh, and then from there, we'll be transitioning on to a sustainability model. Um, we are signatories of POSI, which I don't have a good time to get into, but it's a great initiative for um, scholarly communications infrastructure organizations like ourselves to commit to these open principles around not just open data, but also sustainability so that we can build a sustainably open scholarly infrastructure. Um, again, this is, we didn't come up with this, but we are signatories to it and we love it. Um, I want to give a quick thank you to um, Arcadia, a charitable fund of Linda Arazi and Peter Baldwin, which is a long name, but it's very worth saying because they give us a lot of money and we are very thankful for that. Um, really appreciate it. And then also the Amazon AWS Open Data Program, which is a great program. It costs $60 every time you download the, uh, the Open Alex data set. That's how big it is. $60. They're sponsoring that for everybody. So that means you can download it for free, which we're very happy about. And I think it's a really cool thing. Um, and then I had some questions down here, but I don't think we have time. So I would love to just open it for the few minutes we have remaining to any questions from you guys. Thank you very much, Jason, both for your useful work and also for the 5 a.m. presentation. Uh, so yes, we can uh, we can open questions. I have some of them, but uh, let's, uh, let's first give uh, the attendees an option to to ask, feel free to both uh, raise your hand or uh, write your question in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I will start with uh, with a question of mine, and is uh, what uh, what kind of service uh, would you like, uh, even personally, to see develop on the top of Open Alex? What do you think we are missing that uh, that will be cool to build on the top of this platform? Sorry, that missed the keyword. What kind of of services, so which kind of sure. service of system of application do you like them to to be yeah. the community to be? Oh man, like great question. I, that's that's when I don't even have time to, to answer. But I, yeah, I think there's so many services that I, I want to see built on top of it. Um, I think that y'all did a terrific job with the with the three kind of strands of the conference of kind of capturing, uh, particularly that discoverability use case and the evaluation use case. I think that those are the two main schools of use that people are going to have for this. So I think in terms of discovery tools, I think there's a lot of things that we could give researchers that would allow them to search the literature more effectively than they do now, right? So Google Scholar is, you know, kind of the state of the art, and that's what is that? Like that's using multi-decade, that's like 15 year old technology, more or less. It's cool. I use it. I love it. But surely we can do something better than that, right? Like I would love to see more visual search associated like approaches, like Open Knowledge Graph. I'd love to see more semantic search. I would love to see graph-based search. So I think there's a lot of search applications that we can build on this, so that's one. And uh, the great thing is, again, that's so easy to do. It's it's not a multi-month project. It's literally an afternoon project because you can build it all on top of our, of, of our API. Uh, you can even hit our API um, from uh, from JavaScript, so you can build it on the web page. So I think that's a big one. And then lots of evaluation stuff. You know, So I think uh, Cameron Island did publish a cool thing about open, Alex, uh, sorry, about open access data by country. That's built on our data. Um, and I think uh, I would love to see more projects like that. I think that there's sky's the limit in terms of those evaluation things. And just all your normal, like, kind of mapping projects, you know, like all this, like, different kind of uh, co-citation, collaboration graphs, all that kind of stuff. I think um, pretty much everything anyone has done in science metrics for the last, you know, 60 years or whatever, I think pretty much all of that could be built on OpenAlex. Um, that's the goal. 
But the key there is that it's just enough is we can build that on an open data set, something that we can share, something we can own as a community. That's very, very impressive. And uh, we have a question from uh, E.D. Young, I hope that I'm pronouncing that well. Uh, how long does it take for a new published article, uh, whether published in a preprint server or a journal, to appear in Open Alex? Mm, mm, good question. Um, for new publication, uh, right now, um, it's kind of a multi-stage journey. So it takes about two weeks to appear in the data dump because we do, uh, I take, I guess, on average one week. So the data dumps happen about every two weeks. Um, it, it appears in the API more like a few days, um, but it depends a little bit on where it's where it's published. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think a few days would be an accurate answer. Cool. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to tighten that over time. Um, we'd like to get to a 24 hour cycle, particularly for appearing in the API, um, but that's going to take a little time. Uh, I think Angelo was first. Uh, yes, I just yeah, I've got um, quite a few questions, but maybe I want to give priority to just one of them to give the stage to other people as well. Um, so yeah, uh, you opened the uh, the talk with uh, with the fact that uh, that you showed us uh, all the kind of entities uh, that are available in Open Alex, and you 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 said to us that the patterns should be there. So I want to make a provocative statement here uh, in, in terms of, uh, I think actually they should be there because for example, if we want to go through a research, ex a research assessment exercise in which we want to assess how the whole research is developing in terms of what uh, scholars and both industry is producing, we want to have patents because patents gives us an overview of what actually is going on, what is the technological progress. So I want to hear your thought about, about what I just said. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. I think it should be um, it should be available. I think that there are already data sets out there that do that, and I think that to me, it's better for to have a separate data set. But if we get enough feedback from people that patents needs to be in here, then maybe patents could be in here. Um, conceptually, to me, it seems a bit messier, but I, I can see where it's coming from for sure. And and we'll listen to the community, and if, if that's like I said, we'll go that way if that's that's whatever we're thinking. Okay, thanks. Analysis. Uh, yeah, um, nice talk. Uh, very uh, nice to hear all this stuff. Uh, so uh, one question that I am having is, uh, do you count uh, the number of uh, services that are using currently your API? Uh, do you count your downloads? Can you share some statistics about this uh, regarding uh, uh, the use that you are having the first months uh, of Open Alex right now? Yeah, great question. Um, unfortunately, right now, our data is not great on that. Um, our biggest problem is that we're so open that it's pretty difficult to, uh, <laughs> it's harder to track, right? So um, you don't have to register. And, and I like that a lot. I love that. I don't think you should have to register. I think that the internet, I shouldn't have to register to read a web page. you know, like I just show up, I ask for the content, they give me the content. I think that's the way it ought to be. Um, so when I do this query, right, like, uh, where is it here? Right, this is a pretty involved query. This probably would represent someone with an interesting research project, but like, I don't know, I can, I can reload this a hundred times. Is that because I'm, I'm reloading a hundred times or because a hundred people are doing, you know, a similar project, right? So I can kind of clutch it by IP and stuff, but then there's, you know, there's um, NAT and everything. So it's, it's pretty difficult for us to get reliable numbers on the usage. Um, and um, yeah, so unfortunately I don't have good numbers. Uh, and then the, the data, the downloads even worse because Again, you don't have to have an account to do that. So, um, so yeah, unfortunately, we don't have good numbers right now. We're working on, obviously, we need to do that to report to our funders. So, um, yeah, we're working on that. That's a good question. But I don't know. I, for me, I'd rather make it open and, like, super open and not have good stats than make it a bit more closed so that we can get stats. I, I, I'd rather not do that if I can help it. Yeah, the, the, I, I agree with this approach. Yeah. yeah I but, prefer this one, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. it's a good question. Paolo, you have the important responsibility of asking the last question. Ah, good. Well, first of all, it's really nice to see you again, Jason. Hopefully, it will happen again in person at some point because it's been too long. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. The usual, great and highlighting. So uh, the question I wanted to ask is the following. Um, uh, what you're doing, uh, with, especially with respect to the uh, deduplication, disambiguations of multiple sources and bringing things together. 
um, has a challenge, uh, poses one main challenge, which somehow frictions with uh, the persistent identifications of the groups that you're identifying, okay? So records, metadata records are subjects to uh, dynamics that are really hard to keep under control. They change, the individual record change uh, their metadata inside. Sometimes they are retracted, sometimes they're uh, they appear and disappear in from various places and in some cases even the uh, the duplication process is mistaken and you fix it in a second stage right so and once you fix it of course you destroy groups and you bring up other groups so i was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more on the the kind of choices you've made there and to which extent there are approximate choices that you, they can uh, give you some level of satisfaction and to which extent instead they are uh, secure in a way. Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and like you said, it's, it's super messy. Um, pretty much anything that, that you would bank on saying, well, this one, this is immutable, right? We can definitely rely on that. No, it's everything is mutable, right? Like, like you said, DOIs disappear, DOIs appear, DOIs change metadata, everything changes. Um, so I would say we've got kind of two models. We've got the model we're using right now, uh, and we've got the model we're moving towards in the future. So the model we're using right now is a bit simpler. Um, we had to build this on a very compressed time frame in order to get it out when Mag disappeared. Um, so right now, for instance, nothing disappears. Like, you know, if we've got a cluster, we have no way of destroying that cluster right now. Um, so that's not great because like you said, there's a million reasons why we actually want to, might want to remove a cluster, particularly as we improve our algorithm. So we do have kind of the easy way now as stuff comes in, we say, hey, which cluster does it match to? Match this one, great, you're going there, right? Do you not match to any cluster? Okay, well, we're making a new cluster for you then, right? So that works pretty well, especially you get started. Eventually though, we're gonna need to, you know, do it the more compl complex way where we need to iterate over the entire database and re-cluster everything. And then, as I said, our approach will be one in which cluster IDs never disappear. Um, those we're committed to kind of keeping alive for the duration of, you know, our existence, uh, we'll just make it map to a new cluster. So that would be kind of the, the approach to destroying clusters, to editing clusters, is, you know, just edit it in place. Um, I think that, does that, oh, and the linkages between clusters, um, yeah, those will just disappear or not disappear. Um, those are updated in the API instantaneously or within a few hours. Um, in the data set, like I said, it takes a couple of weeks and the data set, the format of the data set, um, it partitions things by update date. So if you want to try and keep track of what has changed, you can just say, okay, what changed today? And you can just download the things that changed today and then overwrite um, those items in the data set. I think that's one of the advantages. And one of the reasons I really like the sort of um, denormalized download approach we have is built on these five, little, um, five files just to describe each entity. Um, yeah, I, that's a kind of a partial answer to your question, but it's, it's a good question. And I think to get more into the technical details, probably outside of scope of the time I have left. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Jason will also stay as uh, stay with us for the panel in the next session, so we will have more time to discuss uh, about that. So it is now time for the second keynote by Alex Wade. Uh, many of you will know Alex, who has been one of the leader of this research area. Uh, first with Microsoft Academic Graph and now with Semantic Scholar. Uh, Alex spent his career working on different problems in scholarly communication, information retrieval, and open science at uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Research, Amazon, Facebook, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and now the Allen Institute for AI. He's currently uh, director for strategic partnership of the Semantic Scholarly team. And uh, uh, I believe he will have a great keynote about the um, uh, the Semantic Scholar Academic Graph, which is the other uh, graph that we are very excited to know about. So, uh, Alex, uh, up to you. I think you are muted at the moment. There we go. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, is everybody seeing my presentation mode here of this deck? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the conference organizers. Uh, I, I wish that uh, this was an in-person conference. I would have loved to be over in, in France right now instead of uh, 
quarter to six in the morning. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Jason for going first because that gave me time to have a couple cups of coffee. So uh, here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I am with a semantic scholar at the Allen Institute. Um, I am based in Seattle and I'm physically in Seattle at the moment. Um, oops, hold on one sec. Struggling here. Um, so the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence was started in about 2014, um, really with the intention of, of creating a research institute centered around uh, artificial intelligence and developing AI for the common good. And Semantic Scholar was really one of the first actual products that came out of that effort. In fact, today we're still one of the only um, and definitely the largest product within um, AI too. Most of the rest of the organization has uh, really centered around being uh, more focused on, on research and research prototypes, um, but we're sort of in this for the long haul. And we have this really nice relationship between our Semantic Scholar research team and our product team. So it's, it's truly a research and development organization. Uh, Semantic Scholar itself was started in about 2015 was our initial launch. Um, and I'll go over a, a little bit of a timeline in a second there. Um, within the Semantic Scholar research team, we're mostly focused on areas of natural language processing, document understanding, uh, recommendations, name entity recognition, uh, et cetera. Uh, but we do occasionally uh, bring in other research parts of AI too, such as the computer vision folks uh, who've helped us in some areas of document understanding and using computer vision techniques to actually understand the physical layout of a PDF as part of a PDF parsing uh, process, for example. Um, you can see a number of areas that we have active research projects going on right now, and these are ongoing. So uh, we try to have this very close tie between uh, the, the actual product and the research organization. Um, if you want to see more, this isn't a research talk, but if you want to see more about the research that we're doing, um, there's a, there will be a set of URLs through this talk to take you to various resources here, but um, research.semanticscholar.org is the, the top node for our research team. Um, we have a, a bunch of these cards here that are talking about individual research projects. Um, oftentimes these will take you to demonstrators, will link you to the GitHub repository where both the source code and the training and evaluation data are collected. Um, Jason mentioned in the last talk, you know, some of the challenges around the author disambiguation. And that's one of the areas that we've uh, recently done some additional work with something called STAND, uh, Semantic Scholar uh, Author Name Disambiguation. Uh, and one of the nice things about that is that we actually have uh, uh, proposed a new uh, evaluation data set as part of that. Uh, if you just want to filter down into our research publications, um, that same roots, research.semanticscholar.org slash publications, will show you all of the papers by, uh, by the research team within Semantic Scholar. So that's further reading if you want to dive into the details here. From a timeline perspective, oh, and I just realized that I forgot to set my timer. Oh, no, now I'm going to go long. Uh, Hold on one second. Um, so as I mentioned before, Semantic Scholar uh, launched initially towards the end of 2015. Uh, we've been going on close to seven years now, six and a half years. But it was only about uh, three years ago that we really sort of made the, the pivot away from initially just being a computer science publication search engine to then adding neuroscience, um, easing our way into the biomedical domain. And then there's a certain tipping point where uh, through our data sources where we're bringing data in for our conversations with publishers that it, it didn't make sense for us to try and limit our domains anymore. So we are officially in all scholarly domains right now, um, although you can sort of see the, uh, the biases of our history focus in computer science and biomedicine. Um, and that also reflects itself in, in our number of users. So we have on the order of about 2 million weekly active users um, on our website. Um, a, a lot of those are, are sort of traffic that comes through us from people who've searched for publications on Google, found our page, they'll come onto our site. And then we have a much more modest number of uh, registered users who have actually created accounts uh, who may have claimed an author profile and are using our, our recommendations. Uh, 2020 was when we also uh, launched our uh, public API, uh, which is now called the Semantic Scholar Academic Graph, STAG, uh, to rhyme with MAG. 
Um, and then we have added some additional API services. Last year, we added a new peer review API that does conflict of interest detection and reviewer assignment. Um, so this workshop, for example, the organizers could have, I probably should have suggested this, um, could have uploaded a set of, of uh, reviewers and then uploaded your submissions. And we would do both conflict of interest detection and then a ranked uh, a ranking of appropriateness of reviewers to papers to review. Um, we're in 2021, we've added some new features to the API and I'll discuss these as we go. And uh, just last year, we passed over 2 million papers. We're currently at about 205 million papers. So just shy of Jason's 210 million. Um, and um, we are uh, going to be launching a new API later this year, hopefully in the next couple of months around recommendations. So that's sort of a history here. Probably the biggest differentiator between what we have been doing and what Jason is proposing is that we started as a website and built a bunch of internal APIs to go between our data stores and our, and our user experience. And we later made the pivot to uh, making a public API on that. And while I agree with Jason's sentiment about um, everything should be open, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, in open science and in open access, the pragmatism of the situation is that not everything that we have in the back end of our data store, we are allowed to make open. So we have to make some trade-offs between um, maintaining positive relationships with the publishers so that we can get access to the full text publications that they provide, and then still abiding by the, the terms of the contracts that we have with them. Very often, uh, this will include things like not including abstracts in our API, uh, not including the extracted figures and images, uh, for example. So we do hold back a little bit. So we are as open as we are able to be and still trying to create a useful resource there. So because our API is, is really, or I should say, because of the data that we have and the services that we have and what we do with the academic graph beyond the metadata and the full text that exists out there in the community, um, we develop a number of features to solve very specific user problems within our environment. We sort of think about that first. Um, what are, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? What are the areas of AI research that we want to push into? Um, and then secondarily, we will, um, as we develop the, the feature, as we validate it with users, um, we'll then expose these resources via the API as well. So I, I'm not intending for this to be a product demo, but I wanna walk you through a few experiences on the Semantic Scholar experience, because it's an easier way to explain the features that you'll see in the API uh, as we get it. So I'm gonna do sort of two halves here. First is I'm gonna walk you through the user experience to show you a few elements, and then we'll get into the API. So the, the first uh, homepage uh, that a user experiences, or at least a logged in user, um, you do not have to create an account, uh, but if you do, then uh, the first thing that we provide you with is a research dashboard. Uh, and there's a number of different pivots on here, um, things like your impact, which will uh, show you newly published papers that may have cited your publication, um, a set of research feeds and recommendations based on items that you have saved into your library, and then alerts. So you can follow various entities here. You can follow an individual author. You can follow a paper. Uh, may, may not be your paper, but you might want to know when a certain paper has been cited. You might want to know when a certain author is publishing a paper. And so you can configure and control the uh, alerts that you receive uh, and how you, how you receive those alerts. Um, I'm going to drill in specifically on the research feeds feature because this uh, uh, starts to uh, intersect with stuff that we're offering in the API. Oops, excuse me. So the first thing that we um, uh, that that uh, sort of drives this research feeds feature is the notion of a library. So as you are <clears throat> searching around the site, identifying papers that you might want to save to read later, um, you can simply click on the the save icon for any paper, and that will add that paper into your library. And further, you can organize your library into folders. So that could be based on projects that you're working on, various uh, areas of interest, uh, papers, an individual paper that you're authoring. And in this example here, um, I've actually got a few, uh, a few folders here that I've created in my library. One of those folders I've labeled academic graphs. I put all the papers that are related to uh, academic graphs in that folder. And uh, 
I don't always read them. I, I seem to save them more quickly than I'm able to read them, but I know where to go back and find them. So I have here in my folder right now about a dozen papers um, uh, relevant to academic graphs uh, that I want to be able to get back to. And you'll find up here at the top, there's this uh, button, a little toggle here called research feed. So what we do is we take those papers that are in the academic graph and for every paper that we have in the graph, we actually um, create a document level um, embedding, a set of embeddings for that paper. Um, those embeddings are available to you in the API. Uh, if you want to build something like a recommendation engine or, or do some levels of document similarity matching. But in our case, what we do is we use these embeddings, uh, the embeddings of these 12 papers, we match them against a rolling window of research, uh, sorry, of recent papers, and we will then pr uh, present these to you um, as a feed. Uh, the intent being, we want to show you newly published papers uh, that are, are similar conceptually to the papers that you have stored in the library. This is adaptive. So if today I find three more papers that are relevant to me and I add them to the library, then those three new papers are going to influence the recommendations that I get for new papers tomorrow. Uh, and then secondarily, if we happen to show you something that is not relevant to you, uh, there's a little down, uh, thumbs down icon here, and I can just click on that item, and that shows, uh, that's a, a flag to, to us that this particular paper is not relevant. So now over time, we have a growing list of positive examples and potentially some negative examples that all start creating this sort of moving target of, of an area of interest for this particular user. Uh, second feature that I want to talk to, I'm now on our uh, SERP page, and I've done a query for BioBert. Uh, and you can see here, it may be a little bit small, but um, you can see here a few um, fields of study. Uh, Jason talked about the fact that Microsoft Academic had a field of study and they have continued that. Uh, we have done so as well in, in, a, in, in a more lightweight way. Um, the intention here for our users is really to provide a filter uh, within the search results. So if I uh, toggle on to this field of study button, I can say, I just want to see the BioBert uh, papers that are in the area of, uh, of computer science, for example, and that will filter down the set of search results on, the, on this page. We had previously been using the field of study, specifically the level zero field of study from the Microsoft Academic Graph. So we, we did not have our own classifier to do this. We would simply inherit those values and, and append those to our paper records in, in our graph. Uh, at, similar to what Jason said, like as we saw the end of life of MAG coming uh, about uh, last summer, we started development of our own model. Um, we had that completed by uh, December of this last year. And rather than, so we knew that any paper that we got after December when MAG went away, we were going to have to write our own field of study onto. What we decided to do is actually go back over all 205 million papers in our graph and apply this model to it. So we have a new uh, semantic scholar field of study model that will do this classification. Um, based on user feedback, we not only took the level zero ones from the Microsoft, Ac Microsoft Academic Graph, but we actually promoted four additional uh, uh, fields of study, education, agriculture and food science, law and linguistics. So our model will now apply those to all new incoming papers, as well as the historical ones. Within our API, you can actually see both values, um, or at least both values for anything up until the uh, MAG went away. So there, uh, you, you will see both the MAG field of study and the S2 field of study in the API. If you want to do some comparison on, on how ours differed from theirs. Uh, another feature that we've developed to simplify the process of looking at lists of papers, that can be a list of papers like in a SERP page here, or a list of papers, if you want to look at it, uh, all the papers that are citing another paper, is our abstracted summarization uh, uh, algorithm, which we refer to as TLDRs. So rather than showing a truncated version of an abstract here in the search results page, we actually rewrite an entire single sentence um, abstractive summary of that paper. And you can compare this one sentence a TLDR for the BioBert paper compared to the, the abstract. And you can see, you know, that's probably a third to quarter to a third of the length of text. 
Um, and this is really intended to, to help users scan the paper. Um, so these TLDRs or, or extreme abstractive summaries um, are also available in the API. Um, with one caveat, uh, we have uh, trained, we, we train individual models depending on the domain that we are in. So we have one model for the computer science papers. We have another model for the uh, biomedical papers. Um, we'd like to roll this out into further uh, domains so we have better coverage. Um, but right now, the TLDRs are limited to those two, three domains. If I then click through from a SERP page onto a paper details page, uh, I'm looking here at the uh, paper details page for the CORD19 preprint. Um, we aggregate together uh, a number of uh, citation edges from a number of different resources, and I'll show you that those details in a second. But importantly, rather than just simply saying this paper has been cited 259 times, we try to classify these citations along a number of different dimensions. And these are individual algorithms that are doing different, uh, different sets of work. Uh, so one of them, for example, is to uh, help the user try to navigate uh, the intent of a citation. Is a paper just casually mentioning this uh, in, in sort of a background session, section where it says prior work has gone before? Are they citing the methodology of a paper uh, or are they citing the results of the paper? Um, and this isn't necessarily as trivial as understanding the section of the paper that is doing the citing and seeing that it's coming from the me methodology. We actually apply, we take that into account, but then we also look at uh, sort of the, the bounding text and do some NLP around the way that the paper is being cited. What, what are the, uh, what's the language that's being used in, in the reference? Uh, so that's a, a feature in the API that we refer to as citation intents, and that exists on every citation edge uh, or, or citing and cited paper pair. Um, secondarily, we try to uh, make a, a sort of Boolean decision on whether or not a, a citation is an influential citation or the thought of a different way. Did this paper materially affect the, the paper that is citing it. Um, again, it's sort of the difference between a casual mention and, and sort of a more important uh, in, uh, uh, citation. So for every citation there, we, we have a flag on it about whether or not it is a influential citation or not. And both of these are actually driven by um, processing the full text of the paper and looking at the citation contexts. So uh, as we get the full text of papers, we go in, we find the bounding text uh, around each reference within the paper. We store those um, as, a, as a property of the edges and we expose these to you via the API if you want to do your own citation classification. Um, this is an author homepage. So aggregating all the papers together around an author. Um, uh, I can't remember the number that Jason mentioned in terms of the uh, number of authors. I think he said on order of, of 200 million authors as well as 210 million papers. Uh, but we, we have fewer authors in the system. We have about uh, 79 million uh, author records in the system. We do have more than that, um, but we, uh, as Jason mentioned, we don't throw away authors even after we have uh, merged potential duplicate authors together, but we will reassign papers from an, an existing author. Uh, so we do have a bunch of uh, sort of ghosted authors right now, authors for whom we have no papers assigned because we, we have merged those papers in with another author profile. Um, but we then will aggregate together some of the author level statistics on the author homepage. So what are the total number of publications that we have by this author? What are the aggregate number of citations uh, for the author's papers? Uh, how many influential citations does this author have, and what is the H index? Um, where am I going from here? Uh, here you can see at the individual paper level uh, that this, this CORD19 paper has X number of citations and Y number of influential citations. And then we can start doing some things like a visualization of an influence graph here. So what are the top authors that have influenced me in my publications? What are the top authors who, um, who have been influenced by my publications based on a number of features, but, but oftentimes uh, a citation, uh, aggregate citation counts. And then, then if I want to see more about Kwan San Wang, for example, we can pop up an author card and again, give you some aggregate statistics about that citing author. 
Uh, importantly, we allow users to come in and claim author home pages. Um, they can adjust things like uh, their name, uh, their preferred pronouns, uh, their current and historical set of affiliations, their ORCID, uh, their homepage, for example. And we use especially the affiliations in the ORCID um, to, to help us in our author name disambiguation. Um, you can see here uh, that right now we do not have these normalized. We do have a project going on right now, uh, as OpenAlex has, to, to use the ROAR identifiers uh, as a canonical source for, for affiliations. Um, but right now we have our own internal system for that. Uh, and uh, this should be hopefully rolling out, uh, I, I'd like to say later this year. Um, if our algorithms, our clustering al algorithms have gotten things wrong and we uh, inadvertently misattribute a paper to you as an author, uh, you can adjust that. You can come in here and say that paper was not by me, it was by a different Alex Wade. And similarly, if we are missing a paper, there's actually two use cases here. We may know about the paper, but we haven't attributed it to you, or we don't know about the paper at all. Uh, in the first case, you search for the paper and you say, I'm an author on that paper. Uh, and in the second case, uh, we actually allow you to give us some more information and preferably the URL of that paper on the web. And we will attempt to go out and fetch that with our crawling system. Okay, so that's a, a very quick whirlwind tour of some of the features on the Semantic Scholar website. I'm gonna do a quick time check here. Um, we uh, then make um, as much of this data as possible available to you all uh, via a, a number of different resources. Um, first, there is the Semantic Scholar Academic Graph. Uh, that consists primarily of the STAG API, which I'll go into more details here. Uh, we currently have about 205 million papers available via that API and 79 to 80 million authors uh, and about 2.4 billion citation edges. Almost everything that I, if not, no, everything that I mentioned to you previously um, is available to you, uh, such as the TLDRs, uh, the embeddings, the citation contexts, uh, et cetera. Um, we also have a couple of other APIs. I mentioned earlier the peer review API and coming soon is a recommendations API. So if you wanted to build your own system, like the research feeds that I showed you, you can do that as well, either based on an individual paper or based on a set of, a set of uh, positive paper examples. Um, and like OpenAlex, we also provide you the ability to download the entire graph if you want to, if you don't want to iterate through the, the items individually, or if you're doing a large science of science project, it might make more sense to download the entire graph. Uh, and we currently make those available monthly. If people have important use cases where they would like more frequent updates, then uh, let me know and we can discuss that. In addition, uh, uh, Kyle Lowe and Lucy uh, uh, on our research team um, have released something called the Semantic Scholar Open Research Corpus. And uh, what differentiates this from this the, the STAG graph is that this actually contains a fairly large number of full text publications in it. So if you are doing a, an NLP project or a, a text and data mining project, uh, what we had seen in the past is very often people would go after the largest open access collection that they could find. And that oftentimes was something like, I'm gonna grab everything from archive.org or I'm gonna grab everything from PubMed Central. And the, the problem with that is that you have just sort of boxed yourself into a, an individual domain. And once you take your you know, NER approach and then you start scaling it out to other domains, you realize that you, know, you didn't have enough uh, variety in, in the language that you were looking at. So we've attempted to build a very large multidisciplinary uh, collection. So this has about 12 million full text papers in it. You can see the distribution by domain there, uh, and that's available for download. This was um, last updated about 18 months ago, um, but we are moving to a model right now where we will also update this on a monthly basis. So if you are looking for a, a large growing uh, updated collection of full text papers, uh, watch this GitHub repo. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to talk briefly about where we get the data from. Um, I mentioned previously that we used to get a lot of our information uh, uh, on the pig piggybacking on the Microsoft Academic Graph as they crawled the web and discovered new papers. 
Um, we are now uh, relying much more heavily on the Crossref citation edges. Um, unpaid, oh, sorry, uh, PubMed, DBLP, et cetera. And then also a uh, huge props to the, the Unpaywall project from Jason and his team. Um, we use that as well, both to annotate a paper, whether or not it is open access or not, but as well to discover potential open access links to papers that we have discovered through other means. Uh, I also mentioned the fact that we take user annotations into account. So users are adding new papers and adjusting things. We process all of this metadata together. Uh, it runs through a number of algorithms like paper disambiguation, author name disambiguation, affiliation disambiguation, and it all feeds into the Semantic Scholar academic graph. In addition, we have a growing number of partnerships with publishers who are giving us full text publications. Uh, these are publishers, they are preprint repositories. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we have our own web crawling infrastructure. Uh, I will uh, echo the sentiment that Jason mentioned earlier. Um, it is, it's ridiculous to try to go and, and crawl the entire web to find uh, these very small flecks of gold uh, in the ocean. So we take a very, um, targeted web crawling approach, uh, looking at uh, specific domains to crawl and then specific individual URLs. URLs that come to us both from end users saying my paper is over here, um, as well as URLs that are oftentimes uh, embedded maybe in a reference section of a paper and we, we parse the full text references. That full text all feeds into a separate pipeline where we do our PDF parsing. Uh, there's a paper called uh, Vila uh, the visualize, oh, I can't even remember what VILA stands for right now, but uh, if you want to see about how we're using some of the visual cues in our PDF parsing, uh, go to the uh, publications page that I mentioned earlier. We take a number of different features um, out of the full text parses, uh, such as the abstracts, uh, the citation context, which allows us to do the citation classification. We do figure and table extraction. We do reference extraction, both the reference section as well as inline references. And all of that metadata also feeds into STAG. And then the PDF parses themselves uh, feed into the Stork corpus, as I mentioned previously. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a, a, a quick uh, whirlwind tour of the uh, API. I'm going to start with this sort of simpler one. Uh, Jason talked about the, the five top level entities that we have, that they have. Um, what we have really in our API is centered around two specific entities, um, authors and papers, and things like venues and affiliations um, are areas that we have uh, active work on to expose as, as uh, entity endpoints in and of themselves. But right now, those are really uh, just properties. Uh, a venue would be a property on a publication, and an affiliation would be a property on an author, for example. So I'm going to walk you through authors, which is simpler, and then I'll walk you through uh, paper, the paper API, and then uh, also uh, how the paper API can be used to navigate the citation graph. A URL uh, into our API really consists of three points. There's the end point here, which is api.semanticscholar.org, blah, 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 author, uh, the identifier for the, uh, the entity that you want, and then an optional set of fields that you would put into that. So uh, here's the set of fields that we expose for the author. Um, you can do sort of a, a traversal in here, which you can say, I want this author, but I then want all of the paper IDs and titles of all of their papers. So you get the sort of cascading effect via the author endpoint. And just to give you three examples, uh, if I leave this fields, uh, field blank here and just ask for the author, um, I'm just going to get the default return payload, which is the string name for that author. Uh, not super useful other than like validating, did you get the right one, hopefully. Um, if I add into that a few things, like I want the external IDs and also the title and abstracts for this author or this author ID, then you start to get more useful information here. So I can see that for uh, this author, um, for paper number one, uh, we have a number of external IDs such as the MAG identifier, uh, the ACL identifier, the archive.org ID, the DBLP ID, our internal corpus ID, and the PubMed ID. So as we find the same paper from multiple sources, um, our paper disambiguation will accrue additional identifiers for the same paper. 
And here you can see I've also added, asked for the title and the abstract for that paper. Uh, similarly, if I change the fields over here to uh, aliases, affiliation, H index, blah, 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 um, I get a different payload back. And so this allows you to adjust the parameters, the fields that you want to have returned from the author API. Uh, and here I've gotten back, uh, for example, the ORCID uh, aliases. So if I publish papers under different names, those will show up here. Uh, a set of affiliations. And you can remember when I showed you the um, author homepage editing screen where I had added in my affiliations, that this is how they get reflected here. Uh, and then some aggregate statistics like paper count, citation count, uh, H index, and the title of each of my papers down here. All right, that's the author uh, endpoint. Uh, I should say that we also do have an author search. Um, so uh, in addition to the, the fields parameter here, you can pass in a query parameter. You can search for the string Alex Wade and you will get back uh, a number of string matches. Uh, there are a, a lot of Alex Wade's, uh, a small number of Alex Wade's uh, out there in the world. It's, it's, it then becomes an exercise to determine which of those author entities is the one that you are looking for. Uh, so moving on to the, the paper, API endpoint, similarly, three aspects to it. There's the URL of the endpoint, um, an identifier that you pass in for that paper, and a, a, an optional set of fields. Um, in this example, uh, I've put in the SHA hash of the paper to find it. Uh, we also support our own internal corpus ID, um, but we also support a number of those external IDs that I mentioned, in fact, all of those external IDs. So you can get into a paper by searching it by DOI, by archive ID, by mag ID, by PM ID, et cetera. And for a, a finite number of resources, you can actually even pass in a URL and get back the, the paper ID for that. So um, in this case, I uh, passed in a particular, uh, I think, DOI. Uh, doesn't really matter which key you're using to get in. And again, with no field specified, we're just going to default to showing you the title for that. Uh, but if I add some things in, like I want the external IDs for this paper and the fields of study and the TLDR, then I get some more useful data back from, from the API. Uh, you can see here in the middle where it says S2 fields of study, um, there's, there's a source tag associated with each tag here. So the first one says medicine sources external, uh, category computer science sources external. External in this case means it was the MAG uh, attributed field of study. So MAG said that this paper was about medicine and computer science. Um, our model, the S2 FOS model said it's just about computer science. So if you wanted to go into some comparative analysis on, on how much our model agreed with MAGs and where the differences are um, for everything that we have a MAG ID uh, on uh, should have the MAGs assigned field of study as well. Uh, and then down at the bottom here, you can see the TLDR for this particular paper, uh, which is, uh, we also give you an indication of which particular model we used as we uh, rev these models. Um, we may have some asynchronicity on how quickly we update. So you can see uh, which generation of the TLDR generation model we used. Um, in addition to getting that basic paper level metadata, you can also, uh, like I showed with the authors, you can use this to, uh, to navigate within the graph. So if I start from the paper point of view and I say, I want the paper with this archive ID, and then in the fields, I say, I want the title and the authors for that paper, then we will return for you the uh, list of authors on that paper as well as their author ID. So this is a really convenient way to pivot between a known paper that you have with an identifier to our internal set of author IDs for each of those authors. So I wanna find the Lucy Lu Wang who wrote the CORD19 paper. I start with the DOI or the archive ID for the CORD19 paper. And then I see the list of authors and I can take this ID and pass it into the, uh, the author endpoint to get Lucy's details. But we try and make it efficient so that you don't have to do secondary and tertiary calls there. So you can actually ask for more information directly from this API endpoint and say for each author on this paper, I want their URL and their external ID and their H index, uh, for example. And here uh, you get that all in one, one API call. Uh, so now I know uh, Lucy's 
author ID, but then I can also pivot, for example, to her author homepage on Semantic Scholar if I want to uh, see her other papers. I can either do that in the, in the UX or via the API. Uh, and then similarly, you can navigate the citation graph in the same way. So starting from a paper, you can either travel forwards or backwards in time, see the list of, of papers that have been cited by this paper, or the list of papers that are citing this paper. Um, same thing, I want to ask for the, uh, the title, uh, the title of the citing paper, the venue of the citing paper, and the year of the citing paper for all papers that have cited the CORE 19 paper. Uh, and this is what that looks like here. So. You, you ask for the, specifically the fields that you want to get back. Uh, you can get things like the is open access flag, which we, we derive from the unpaywall data set, the total number of references that a paper has, etc. Okay, uh, just a quick uh, colorful slide here. Um, these are a, a, it's a very short list of the people who are using our API. As I mentioned, we've been around for a, a couple of years. Um, but it's really been in the last year, even prior to MAG announcing their, uh, their end of life, um, we had a large number of sources, but it certainly increased as people started looking for no new uh, replacement options. Uh, and especially into January of this year, we have a growing number of, of sites that are not just using us for research projects, but actually uh, rolling us into production uh, in their environments. Um, it, this started, I would say, if you rolled back the clock, uh, you know, nine months or so, it was largely people who were working on uh, uh, tools in the scholarly communication and discovery space, like Citation C, Insightful, Lit Maps, Connected Papers. Uh, connected Papers is this great sort of visualization of the citation graph and one of our earliest API users. Um, increasingly, we're seeing people uh, outside, such as uh, illicit.org. Uh, fur.ai, other AI startups who are using our data to drive question answering systems, other discovery tools, etc. Um, okay, so uh, nearing the end and hopefully leaving some time for questions, we have um, a number of resources that are available to you if you want to use this. Probably if you're going to take away one URL from this talk, that's that first one, the api.semanticscholar.org. Uh, at the that gives you a link to all of the, um, the uh, readme docs on the API endpoints. It gives you a link to the monthly snapshot downloads. Um, picking up on what Jason said earlier about be, the, the sort of tension between being easy and open to use, but then not having the ability to track who's using you, um, we are very much in this mixed model. So you do not need an API to query into us. You can right now go and get started, read our documents, take those URLs that I just showed you and start hitting our API directly. And um, all we know about you is, is the IP address where you're coming from. Um, we do uh, threshold the number of queries per second that you can run in against that API. So if you want to do anything that is going to be more query intensive, um, you can request a higher API throughput rate limit. Um, or if you just want to be light, nice and let us know who you are and then say, hey, I'm using your API, and then fill out the API uh, key request form. This is still a manual process right now. So we usually takes us a day or two to uh, get the data into our system and send you a key. Um, we're trying to automate that. So uh, hopefully by later this year, it should be a simple submit a form, get an API key back. And then you would pass this in on the HTTP header uh, of your API request uh, to send in. So it is, it's very simple just to use your browser um, as, and using HTTP get commands against our API today if you're testing things out. But if you're doing anything more substantial, we prefer it if you ask for a key and send that in just so we get a, get a sense of who's, who's uh, using the API. Also, as a teaser for that, if you do request and get an API key issued, we'll send you an invitation into our Slack uh, channel. If you just want to share information, share discoveries, ask questions, make feature requests, uh, file bugs, uh, things like that, um, the Slack channel is probably the best place to do that. If you want to get updates for new features that we're deploying here, uh, if you log into Semantic Scholar and go into your um, account page, we have a, a number of different newsletters or update alerts that you can subscribe to. So if you just toggle on that developer updates, we'll let you know as our new API uh, features get released or if we are uh, adding a new 
property, a new field, for example, to the API. Uh, and then um, I am also planning on, on hosting probably uh, in the next four to six weeks, a, a webinar uh, where I will bring in some of the developers from this. We'll do a little bit of demos, um, but mostly leave some time for a uh, sort of Q&A. So if you are interested in joining a webinar, uh, that bit.ly slash stag webinar with a two S2AG webinar uh, is a Google form for uh, registering your interest in the webinar. And we'll send you uh, the, the Zoom or Google Meet details once that gets scheduled. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Let me know if you have any questions. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing uh, research projects uh, based on STAG moving forward. And that's, that's all I've got for today. Thank you very much, Alex. It was very interesting talk. And we already have some questions uh, from the attendees. So I will, I will read them. Uh, the first question by uh, Sotiris uh, Kotitsas, sorry for my pronunciation of this na great name, um, is the document level embedding a node embedding from the graph or a textual based embedding from the text? Um, that's a very good question. And I'm going to attempt to give you my, uh, my lay answer to this with the caveat that I, I may get this slightly wrong, um, but um, the, I'll write this in here. Um, Spectre is the name of the embedding system that, that uh, our researchers created. And so these are referred to in the API and our system as Spectre embeddings. Um, so they uh, sort of two things. Um, it, it principally is a document level embedding, although in this case, um, we did not detect a significant amount of variance between doing full document level embedding and doing just title abstract. So considering the title and the abstract as the document. Um, so that is highly textual. But we also integrate into that um, information about the uh, citation graph. So intuitively, you would assume that papers that are citing each other are going to be more similar than papers that are not citing each other. And so those, those citation edges um, also influence the, the embedding. So it's a combination of, of textual and citation graph uh, embeddings together. Perfect. So uh, uh, Jerome Eusenat is asking, would you qualify some of what you do, such as training a plastic eye on the server and deliver the output to the client as AI as service? Uh, I, I wouldn't call it that um, because what we're doing is we are simply giving you the output of that. Um, for me, this is, sort of, this is, this is more uh, philosophical than anything else, but um, an area that we've talked about that, that I would like us to, to move into into the future is um, more where you're bringing the data. So let's say you have a paper that we don't know about. Um, let's say it was a submission to, to this workshop. Um, so it hasn't been published yet, um, but you wanted to get information about that. You wanted to get citation intents. You wanted to get spectrum embeddings. You wanted to get other things. I would view AI as a service as us having a trained model. You submit the paper to us. We then calculate the embeddings and do the parsing, and we return back to you the payload. So right now, all we're doing is we're returning to you data that we've already pre-calculated. And, and for me, the sort of AI as a service is, is something that's a little bit more um, on demand. OK, perfect. And from uh, um, A.D. Young, uh, could you please provide more details about the feature of the upcoming recommendation API? I'm also very curious about them. No, it's a secret. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, do, do contact me offline if you're interested in being a sort of a, a beta customer for this. Um, I, I want to get feedback on this, but we have effectively um, taken the existing model that I, that I discussed before um, and wrapped that up in an API. So it's, it's very similar. There's basically two modes to it. Um, the first mode is uh, an HTTP post. Uh, sorry, no, HTTP get, um, and you simply pass in an identifier for a paper, single paper that you want recommendations for. Um, so you can imagine this if I'm like looking at a paper, um, in fact, we have this on our website, if I'm looking at the Core 19 paper, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, we have some recommendations, sort of related papers. And uh, 
what we do is we take that DOI, we look up the paper in our system, we find the spectrum embeddings that we have for that paper. So in this case, we can only give you recommendations for a paper that we've already processed, back to the last question on AI as a service. Um, we find the spectrum embeddings for that paper, and then we run it against uh, our uh, sort of a K-nearest neighbor store to find the papers with the embeddings that are closest to that. That store is a rolling window of about the last, I think, 90 to 120 days of publications. So you're only going to get similar papers that have recently been published back out of that store. Um, and we, we rev that, uh, I think, on a daily basis, maybe every couple of days. So we, we acquire the new papers and we flush out the older papers. That's a very simple model. Here's a paper, give me recent similar papers. There's no sorting in it. We give them back to you in the ranked order based on similarity. So uh, the most similar paper is going to be at the top. The maximum number of recommendations you can get out of is 500. It's just sort of hard coded into our system right now. The more interesting and the more complex one is HTTP post. And the payload of the post um, argument is a set of paper IDs. So like in my library example, I had 12 papers in that folder, but you could pass in 40 paper IDs. And then some negative examples, um, optionally, you don't have to include them, but um, so an example might be, I wanna take all of the publications from an individual author um, and I wanna pass those in as, uh, as positive examples. They've written these papers, they're probably interested in those topics. Um, and I, uh, and if I have any down votes for them, or if I'm building a reviewer system and my reviewer has said, I don't want to review this paper, that might be a negative example. Um, and so you can pass in positive IDs and an array of negative IDs, and we'll give you the same thing over the past 90 to 120 days, um, other papers that, that, uh, match that based on the sum total of the similarity of all those embeddings. Okay, perfect. I saw different people uh, opening the camera. Does it mean that some of you have a question? Hi, uh, may I ask a question? Absolutely, go on. Hi, Alex. This is Jian Wu from Science here. How are you? Hi there. How's it going? I'm good. Thank you. Very fantastic talk. Um, it's, um, and you realize very... I didn't put the Science here logo on our little logo site, but we do consume Science here data as well. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious of uh, the document conflation because you have document come from different sources and uh, come from different time. So it's inevitable that you will get some uh, some duplicates or near duplicates. So how do you do the document conflation? Um, uh, I'm not going to be able to give you a very good um, uh, other than hand wavy um, answer to that. Um, we th there's sort of two levels to that. Um, so sort of think about it that from the perspective of um, archive.org, uh, which now, uh, uh, and BioArchive for that matter, that support document versioning. So obviously yeah. we don't want to have a similar document for, um, for every single version of a document. Uh, we do try to conflate something where, depending on the order that we have discovered it, um, it might appear in archive.org first and then later show up as a workshop paper or a conference paper. Um, we do try to conflate these two things together. So that paper will have both an archive ID. Now archive is assigning DOIs, so it might have a DOI, but then it might show up in the proceedings of the paper and might have another DOI. We do actually attempt to conflate those uh, together. Um, unfortunately, we, uh, I think at the moment, we, we have some heuristics that decide which DOI wins in that case. That's sort of one model, which is you know, you're trying to aggregate together multiple instances of the same paper. Um, we, we do have a, a model as well that is a little bit more similar to what Microsoft Academic had, which is uh, more like a paper family. So we might have a top level node and, and then sort of store, here's the preprint version of it, here's the VOR version of it. And in that case, we actually can preserve the, uh, the multiple DOIs for the same conceptually same paper. It's very tricky because um, yeah. as you know, uh, titles can change, authors can change, abstract can change. So like what, what, what is the essence of, of similar paperness? And, and that's an ongoing uh, sort of challenge in our paper disambiguation. Exactly, yeah, we have a similar problem. So we're still looking for a good, um, a good way for that. Uh, another question is about the future. I, I see that Symmetric Scholar uh, extract figures and tables and displayed in the paper summary pages. 
Uh, is there a plan to do a figure search? We haven't talked about it. Um, I know that you guys have done a lot on, on sort of data extraction from tables, and I think that's that's fantastic uh, uh, work. Um, we should potentially have a conversation uh, about that. Um, it hasn't been on our roadmap yet. Um, really, our intent here is, is really to um, help the user decide uh, whether or not the paper is something that they want to read. So everything that we put onto the paper lander is really sort of intended to um, give them enough information to make that decision. So the TLDRs feed into that, the figures and tables feed into that. Um, we still do want to, the users to be, like we don't want to replace the, the reading experience. Um, well, actually, yeah, that's not too, we do want to replace the reading experience, but that's not the intent that we have with showing the figures and tables here. Um, we haven't had a lot of requests yet, but I'd love to get more information from the from the use cases that you guys have thought about in in deriving data from uh, tables and, and figures. So uh, let me welcome uh, Paolo Mangi, which is uh, joining the panel, uh, replacing Natalia, which unfortunately had a loss and uh, and uh, she cannot make it today. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Paolo will be. Uh, the best suited uh, replacement. Um, and then we will have, uh, as anticipated before, Alex and Jason um, then continue to be with us for the rest of the, of the day. Um, so um, how to structure this? Uh, like I, I will break the ice uh, with a couple of questions of mine. And so, the, this panel, uh, it's all about, you know, like the, the, um, the mug after mug, um, after mug disappearing and uh, from the scene. And the announcement last year left uh, lots of people, including myself, really bitter about that because I mean, I was using mug for my own research and I, I always thought that it wouldn't go. No, there's, a, there's a billionaire uh, firm behind it, there was, and, and I gave it for granted. The same way I give for, grant, uh, I give for granted uh, services like Google Scholar, and we, never, we don't think or we don't care that and anytime soon, like they could say, uh, it's not in our uh, profitable, it's not profitable anymore for us, uh, we will face out the service. So these, um, of course, it, it is a problem for all the people that are um, uh, downstream that are using the service uh, for um, consultation or for analytics. So the first part of the question is, is how we can you know, contain the damage. And the second, like the, the subtext of, of these, is, it's about interoperability. So every initiative, we have a gazillion uh, initiatives and services and infrastructures that, that are operating in, in the same core business. And uh, all of them, I, th I believe each one has his own peculiarities and, and uh, added value. So wouldn't make sense to push for interoperability of information so that, that the added value locally can flow around and uh, and re be redistributed to the other ones. You would say that, that that's not profitable in terms of um, you know, like in terms of as, as an investment, but it would make sense in terms of sustainability because if the, if, if uh, another player disappears, then we wouldn't lose all the information that has been generated and and contributed. To. So yeah, that that's my my two part question. Uh, I'll take a, a, a first stab at that. I mean, Jason already uh, alluded in his talk to the POSI, the Principles of Open Science Infrastructure, and I highly encourage folks to to read that. And it's it, it's not a it's not a far off philosophical concept. I mean, it's it's about the things that you all as researchers are uh, taking dependencies on. Um, and so, you know, understanding whether or not you are um, getting a resource from a uh, a, a for-profit company or a, a not-for-profit or somebody who has the motivation to, to create and sustaining these resources is, is sort of the, the first object. One of the things that the principles of open science infrastructure really starts to delve into is 
how do you plan for a future where your service uh, ends? Um, how much do you plan for uh, an end of life, like being able, as uh, as Microsoft Research did, being able to give the community an eight month heads up that they, they're going to go away rather than just saying, hey, you know what, we can't pay the bills, we're gonna turn it off right now. Um, but also then thinking about um, uh, licenses, thinking about sustainability, thinking about transferability of, of the IP. So uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's complicated and it's a mixed bag. Um, we do attempt to make all of the data that we have open. I already gave the caveats of like areas that we can't because um, it's a trade-off between, okay, we're not going to look at the full text or the abstracts at all, or we can use the abstracts to generate things like TLDRs, but we can't always redistribute them. Um, and that creates a, you know, a little bit of tension between what we have access to and in turn what we can share. The second complication in that is sharing uh, and what licenses that we use. So uh, Open Alex is uh, more open than we are. They use a CC0 license on all of the data. Um, that's outstanding. It means that there are uh, absolutely no limitations on what the community can do with those. Um, we have chosen to go with an ODC by license, so basically the equivalent of a CC by license, um, which is still open, uh, but less open. Um, it comes with a couple of, of caveats. One is that you need to give us attribution back. Um, but the other sort of nice thing from my perspective on the ODC by license is that it's a database license and you can differentiate the license on the database, the collection from the license on the individual items in that database. So it allows us to make the database available to you guys, that entire month's uh, download snapshot under a, an attribution only license, just tell us that you're using the data, but individual items within that collection can have more restrictive licenses. Uh, so there can be a CC by a uh, non-commercial license full text item in the Stork uh, collection, for example. Um, it allows us to redistribute them. It allows us to transfer along that license. It puts the onus on you as a consumer to decide, do you have the rights? Um, are you, are, is your use case a commercial uh, use case? And if it is, maybe you should be filtering out the non-commercial things. But for me, that strikes a, a nice balance between allowing us to uh, make available more data um, rather than sort of going down to a lowest common denominator of only the things that we could include under CC, uh, CC0. And I'd be interested in hearing Jason's perspective on that tension and whether or not you face things there. Like, do you have to make decisions on, on like, oh, we can't include that because we wouldn't be able to do it under a CC0 license? Um, no, no, it's it's the same same as what you're saying. So right, so uh, the database is is under a CC zero license. But as you say, like you know, if we've got metadata for something that's all rights reserved, you go follow our link to the thing that's all rights reserved. Of course, that thing is all rights reserved, right? That's just the nature of the beast. So um, <clears throat> uh, and I, I think it's, I mean the whole license thing is an issue one to me because um, you know we, we did a lot of research on this before we we decided on the license and um. Uh, I'm convinced based on that, that licensing, like I'm not sure that any of us actually have the rights to license our own data databases for the reason that the data inside, like the facts that the database is made out of are not subject to copyright in most jurisdictions. So I think there's a strong case to be made that, um, that most data that people license CC0, the CC0 is more of a flag saying, hey, by the way, you can use this than it yeah. is at Really, like legally that meaningful because I think like I said there's such a strong case and, and Wikidata and Wikipedia have put like a ton of work and effort in this and I've done a lot of writing on it that I think is really useful and I, and I definitely recommend but with a lot of this stuff right it's like it varies by jurisdiction and it's all subject to case law and many of the cases just hasn't, haven't come to court yet. so it's, it's you know it's kind of it's a bit it's definitely like when I went into it, I was like, oh, it's all figured out. I assume everyone's got it written down. I was like, no, it's like, it's quite it's a bit of a wild rest. So, but I, I think the data being open is huge. I think the code being meaningfully open is huge. I think that, um, you know, MAG, for instance, they made the code behind their concepts open, which is great, but it's all in this like complicated dot network, like dot net framework stuff. That's like, I don't know. I don't know anything about dot net. And it's kind of a pain to get it started and everything. So it was like, it was easy for us to just make our, make our own. But still, I think props to them for like making you know a lot of the code open. Um, 
So I think all of our data is open, but also all the code behind what we do is open. And it's all in Python, which is sort of the more, I think, uh, more common for a lot of folks in the area. And so I think that that's a good bit of, I think, sort of insurance for like, if we disappear, um, you can start from data, absolutely. But then you can also pretty easily just, you know, we, we deploy on Heroku. So it's a pretty straightforward pipeline to deploy our code, build your own version of this. Um, you know, and maybe you use some of our code, maybe you throw some away, whatever, but it's all there. And I think that's important. I, I think 100% of the source code behind this needs to be available. And then I think there needs to be a sustainability plan. So I think the reason why Matt quit, you know, I think we got to look and say, well, why did they stop doing this? And in the, you know, the, the proximal answer is because, you know, they decided to, it was their project, they didn't want to do it anymore. Um, the, the longer term answer is that it was built on a certain part of the Bing infrastructure and like baked really deeply into that. And Microsoft decided, Bing decided they wanted to change the, the Bing infrastructure. And when they did that, it would have been way too costly. They would have had to rewrite, Mag would have had to rewrite their whole, um, their whole workflow for this new Bing infrastructure. They, they were like, oh, this is dumb, it's gonna cost us too much, we're not making any money off it. So um, to me that says, I think we gotta build on stuff that has got a sustainability plan baked in, right? It has to have something we have to build on something. In my mind, that means it makes money. Um, and so that's that's definitely our goal with this. We've got, you know, we don't have one of those right now. So uh, Open Alex doesn't make money, right? It just burns money from funders. Um, <clears throat> but the other projects that we've done so far um, have all started that same way too. You know, we always started, uh, get it out there, see what where the user communities are, see what the use cases are to solve that could be potentially like something you can charge for and then charge for some service built on top of the data, not for the data itself, but for some service built on top of the data. So um, Paywall has been self-sustaining that way for like, I don't know, like four years or something like that. So that's the plan we, we tend to do with, we plan to do with OpenOx as well. But I think regardless of you know, who's doing it, I think everyone in the space should be thinking, you know, how do we make this something that makes money? Because I think that's the thing that, that keeps it around. For, for, okay, but don't you, know, you think for, that, that, Jason, don't you think that the, the, the question stems exactly from that? So if uh, it so it, i fully understand the problem of budget and budgeting and money and sustainability is behind every single service but of course when it's all about sustainability it means that if at some point uh, something else will come up or it will not be worth it then profit will be the reason why you you switch off the service so in a way the positive principles uh, are trying to secure that aspect because if it's worth it somebody will do it right because it, it brings back something on the other hand there's somehow keeping another question which stays in another level that from the open air perspective i of course appreciate more which is the fact that whatever we're doing is not driven by our own intention to make money but also because there is a strong requirement requirement by the community to do it and this is the public part okay so governance uh, should be somehow driven and steered not by the demand of something that you can sell but also by the demand of something that is needed out there you know to do science and in that case i think the cake should be somehow be split because uh, what you guys are doing is amazing and can only be done, I think, to some extent with people like you and the enterprises or the companies that you have behind. So with that intent in mind, so doing something innovative for that. On the other hand, having public money like you're having now uh, with OpenAlex, you know, in a way, uh, makes things uh, to takes things to the next level so i can start innovating and doing something useful without having in mind if it if it can be sold right because sometimes <laughs> uh, worthiness is not the profit but is the side effect that you have on society or on uh, on the public so probably don't you think uh, alex because i see you've taken a look at it and probably you jason the, the policy principle are missing these aspects a little so they're, they're they have a really an enterprise perspective uh well, I, that's not i'm sorry alex no i uh, i mean i think that uh I'm, I'm sort of skirting around the, your actual question here Bella, but um i think there's a differentiation between what what jason was saying about making money um is a distinct thing from being 
profitable. Um, like Dave, Jason sort of touched on the per item cost of, of this, but but actually running running these things at scale um, is an extremely expensive off operation. You're just the amount of, of cloud computation that is going on. And then like in our case, especially because we have a, a website and experience on top of it, there's a very large number of engineers that it takes just to keep the service running. So uh, we don't charge anything right now, but I, you know, I do uh, empathize with the, with the notion that Jason is talking about here, which is at least getting into a stage where there's like some cost recovery. And when you start thinking about that from that perspective, that's way different from, from how you know, a Microsoft or a Google or other people would think about it. Um, it's just like distributing the, the cost of running these expensive services. Um, and I and I agree with you. You know, sort of from a governmental, from an academia perspective, maybe we should be thinking about models uh, where we're we're sort of sharing this load a little bit more. The Posey principles, where I think that there's a little bit of a a, a, a gap and attention, and I can't remember if this was directly in Posey or or just stuff that Cameron Nalen has written about, but Cameron has advocated for um, things like. Um, open contracts. So you talked about this in the MAG case, but the same thing applies to me right now, um, which is making all of the, uh, the um, contracts that we have in place with publishers open. Um, I don't know what problem that solves. Um, mm. I, I, it's, it's not an easy thing for me to do. I wouldn't mind doing it, but it introduces a different amount of tension between me and the publisher if I were to share that information and making that available doesn't actually solve any problem for the community. Um, the publishers have concerns. They want to be able to monetize their stuff. They, uh, you know, they don't want us redistributing things that they could be monetizing because it undercuts their business. Um, so, the, the 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 biggest problem, if what you know we're saying and what Jason is saying is like we make our algorithms, we make our training code, we make our source code, we make our data as open as possible. The biggest problem in this space is how do you get access to the raw materials? How do you get access to the 205 million papers in full text to do this? And that's where a lot of these things are still dammed up behind paywalls that's, and behind publisher agreements. That's the other side. So sorry, don't take it this bad. I wasn't criticizing uh, Jason in that sense. In, in, so as, as open air, we have the same issue. We're we are drafting a business plan because we need to sell. Otherwise we cannot sustain ourselves for the future. We cannot hope, you know, Europe will pay for our service forever and they in fact they are doing it only partially today so they have you know special structure of fundings and this is i think is something useful uh, through which they can um, uh, cover part of the operation which is extremely expensive and the rest you know it's really up to you because it has to be worth it at, at some point you know the, the member states need to to uh, elaborate on that no what i was just saying is that the posy when i read them uh, I don't think they took this part into account. So, so, or at least it was implicit. Okay, so we are posy compliant. Okay, but we are posy compliant, and we have to include public funds in that, right? And this is not necessarily seen as something um, conceivable. But rather, you need to have your customers, some some who pay for that, you know, because you're selling something in the end according to the positive principles. And that's probably a missing bit. And then I agree with you that, you know, the, the availability of the data is a big deal because you can share anything you want, even the outcome. But then in the end, uh, if you don't have the PDFs as CC0, let's say, so if you don't publish open access, um, that's the uh, major limit. There's yeah. nothing you can do there, uh, even today, I guess. And uh, 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 about the second part, like, how do you see these, um, you know, like trying to have an interoperability framework to flow information uh, across different domain, across different uh, scholarly knowledge graphs? Like, do you see that as a feasible um, opportunity or it would be just um, a no-go uh, direction? Like, if uh, to, to share a core for a core uh, core of information um, about about the same the same entity, so that you know, like you can have a, a better aligned 
representation of the same physical object. So in this paper, uh, you might have identifiers because I don't know, you, you did some uh, deduplication and your deduplication runs better than mine. Uh, but I have some identifiers that uh, some PIDs about these authors that you don't have because of some other technical reasons. So we could do like this kind of, we could have a flow of information so that at least we get the same, we get aligned to, to, to some extent. And, and, and it, we don't always have to cross bridges because this is what I do. Like depending on the research question that I wanna answer, I, I need to know which are the most suitable data sets that I wanna get. And possibly I won't get everything in there. So I need to cross uh, different realms. And this is not, always uh, that straightforward. So, uh, you, you know, to have this, at least this minimum set of information that I know I can find everywhere, that would be, uh, that would simplify a lot my, my, my job day in, day out. So I don't know, like, what is your view? Uh, I know that with Paolo, we have been thinking about this uh, for, for um, a long time, but I don't know, like, if you, if you see these something feasible uh, in, in your in, in your initiatives Alex and Jason that's more I think for you I, I was gonna so I mean I think you know I think Jason actually sort of covered this fairly well in his talk which is it's one thing to say that in principle um, but if you take, take a longitudinal look at this, uh, uh, 15 years ago, orchids didn't exist. And so if somebody wanted a, a common identifier for authors, you were having to get a, a Scopus ID, but that only you know, worked with the scope with the Elsevier publications, et cetera. Orchid was launched as an effort to have a consistent author identifier um, across all academic authors. Um, it is open, um, it does what it does really well, and yet, we still have incomplete coverage of, of ORCIDs for authors. Um, these things take time. Again, roll back the clock a decade ago and DOIs were almost principally for peer reviewed academic papers. Uh, preprints did not have DOIs. Um, so you could say that a DOI was a great identifier, but you had to qualify that statement. Now we're seeing DOIs uh, that go uh, on preprint services. Um, Archive.org has just rolled out a DOI system. Um, you can get DOIs for data sets. Um, DOIs still, although fairly ubiquitous, are not absolutely ubiquitous. Not everything has a DOI. Um, so it's one thing to have a plan and a vision, and there's another thing to sort of have the entire world sort of flow into that, and these things take time. Um, Roar, uh, it, it was a, it is an effort to do the same thing for institutional identifiers. Again, it's going to take a decade before um, that's a, a ubiquitous identifier. And who knows, maybe another better thing is going to come along in eight years. So you may invest everything you have in Roar now, and there's going to be something different in 2030. But Alex, how about something, uh, all the things that we built on top to, let's say, um, uh, mitigate the the side effect of having all these registries out there for example all the, the three initiatives that are uh, today uh, sitting at the table i'm sure have to deal with cleaning uh, organization information uh, cross bridging different registries across different uh, uh, organization registries uh, again we all we are all trying to deduplicate metadata records coming from different so probably there are many things that we can try uh, to uh, work on together or try to align or uh, somehow test each other's sets and see where yeah. we are wrong and where we can uh, do better. And uh, once we do that, it's for, for, for the good, right? So <laughs> let's say from some point on, you can say, uh, this is done, we all agree, we are aligned, and maybe we also have a mechanism to uh, up to 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 keep these uh, collections up to date uh, for the future, but I think it would be interesting, unless again, it's limited by you know the usual the side effects of uh, data sharing and data licensing, etc. What do you think? I'll I'll defer to Jason on this one. Um. Well, I I'd argue I think we got kind of like three layers to this ecosystem. I think there's the there's the first person claims. So there's, hey, I'm an institution and this is my role. I'm an author, this is my orchid, right? These are these are claims by the authorities, right? Like these are ground. 
if my name is Jason, I say this is my argo cable, and that, that's what it is. That's by definition, that's right. So we've got all that. That's pretty easy. And you as a researcher can access that by looking up the ORCID graph or the WAR graph or the ISSN graph or whatever. But that's not sufficient um, because it's nice to combine all that, right? So then I think we've got another level, and I would say that's deduction. So that's stuff that is logically true. Um, if, uh, you know, I, if, um, if Crossref has got this ORCID associated with this record, that's 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 a truth that's been linked in a semantic way, and we can say transitively that therefore this author has got these publications, right? That's a lot of work to actually computational work, even just assemble those graphs. It's a big pain in the butt. And I think that Paolo, I think with Open Air was doing this before most people were with um, DOI Boost, right? We're we're not having to make necessarily like it, it's all facts, right? We're just kind of building from facts we know, and it's all logically true. And then the, the next level after that. That's inferences, and that's the ones um, that are opinions, right? That's I've got an opinion. Hey, I think this this title, which is one letter away from this other title, I think those are the same thing. But Paolo thinks I don't know, man. One letter, hey, if it's an important letter, I think these are different things. Who's right? I don't know. I don't know. You might have to look at every single one. And those are the ones where I think that's actually quite productive for us to all be doing something different there, um, because I think that you can look at Paolo's opinions, you can look at Alex's opinion, you can look at my opinion, you can look at Google Scholar's opinion, you can look at opinion, and say. Hey, these people are getting it right more often than these other people. I don't want to use them. We use them instead. And I think we actually want to have a diversity of opinions out there in the world. <clears throat> Over time, if someone gets it right more than other people. People tend to flock to that person or whatever you know. But if we wanted to try and say, okay, we're all going to agree on on which which inferences we make, no, no, no. maybe maybe we don't agree yeah. on the right one. And I think it's better if we just all put our inferences out there. I think the stuff that's logically consistent that is has to be true. Yeah, I think that stuff should all be shared. Um, but I think the opinions, the claims, I think we actually want as many people making those claims as possible. I, I think if we were all fighting on this inference level, that, that would be amazing. The problem is that we are stuck on layer one. We, we don't know, we, we, are, we are stuck trying to fit, to, uh, fit different details uh, in the same picture that are at the factual level. Like there are uh, certain certain data sets that say A and other data sets that say B. And, uh, and, 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 and these should be facts, you know, like um, this paper as uh, this DOI as this title, you can find that, that assertion in different flavors from different, uh, from different places. And then it doesn't, it doesn't take inference or logical deductions uh, at all. It's just that, you know, uh, human errors uh, happen and the same thing get deposited into different places with different uh, in, in different ways and when you try to pull uh, from all the places and, and, and try to reconcile the data then you have to make arbitrary choices sometimes and 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 uh, what, 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 what's sad is that uh, all of us, like Open Air, uh, is it, like we work in compartments, and Open Air is doing the same thing that other uh, that Open Alex and then Semantic Scholar and that uh, Mac and so on and so forth has been doing for the last conceivable years. Like we we have been trying to um, you know like reason lots of times on things that should be you know like at, at the very foundation. And so that, so if, if that is granted, then yes, we could move uh, one step above thinking about uh, logic deductions and, and inference and so on and so forth. And there, and there, I would welcome plurality, because there is where plurality must be. But at the lower level, yeah, we are stuck there, and and we we can't find I think, one. I think, Jason's, one. I think Jason's deduction is what you're mentioning in a way, because uh, the facts are what you collect from the data sources where the metadata was provided by users, in some cases by machinery, but mostly by users. And these data is curated or less curated, depending on where it comes from. The, the nicely pictured tired tires uh, from Jason, uh, I think include deduction at that level. So these are the kind of facts that you can deduce because of logical inference. And here I agree with you, uh, Andrea, that is, uh, there is a lot of work that we could do you know, in sharing this stuff. For example, I saw um, Alex before sharing uh, a list of uh, the of persistent identifier schemes, DOI, archive, and so on. Uh, there is no public list of those. 
So we are all using different terminologies to refer to these schemes. Very simple fact, right? So I'm not going uh, to inspect uh, uh, more complex situations. But then, of course, you can move to the next level. As I said, the work that we're doing in DOI Boost, which is a work that is trying to uh, uh, propagate ORCID IDs uh, towards other objects based on this inference, it's work that once it's done together and once it is arranged, could make sense. And it is deduction. I'm not sure it's more uh, uh, machine learning or uh, anything else. Um, cleaning author names or disambiguating authors to some extent, uh, I think can become a statement at some point. So we are that sure that this is the case, okay? And this information, how can it be shared? How can it be stored so that we could all access to it? That would be probably one good question uh, if it has an answer. Unless, again, it becomes the sell. So what you're going to sell to your consumers. And in this case, of course, we have a problem. So mm -hmm. what's the, the right level uh, under which we're not selling anything new and we can share? <laughs> and beyond which it's our stuff that we can sell is a good to the customers. Exactly. I think this is the question. I'm not sure you've, uh, you went through this uh, analysis uh, from your perspective or if this was never considered. I, I think part of <clears throat> the, the conversation that's going on right now is the, this differentiation between what is a fact and what is a claim. And uh, even looking at the, the statement of the paper with this DOI has this title, um, you then have to like poke into that and say, where does the ground truth live? Um, is it what a publisher has registered with Crossref? Um, is that absolutely immutable over time? Uh, and where do changes happen along the way? And, and who's, who's the owner uh, of, of that? I mean, I, there's an extreme version of, of what Jason was saying and just saying it's all claims. When, when a publisher says that a paper with this DOI has this title, that's a claim by that publisher. And you may choose to um, honor that claim with a higher level of confidence in other claims. Um, but the, the world is nothing but claims in that, in that realm, um, that there are no facts. And so I think we need to look at where the, the sort of mutations happen along the ecosystem and, and it's more a, a level of ranking. There's a separate tier of this if you go sort of all the way upstream, getting back to your original question, Paolo, which is um, I think we could as a community do more to um, agree upon um, evaluation data sets and evaluation standards so that we can sort of set as a goal, you know, we want to have a perfect system of author name disambiguation and a perfect system of, uh, of normalizing uh, the, the hugely variant strings that Jason was referring to as affiliations and institutions. Um, but right now we're sort of in a situation where um, we come up with our claim that this author was at this institution when they wrote that paper. Jason comes up with his own claim. You come up with your own claim. And we all say to the world like, well, we've done our own measures and this is the best thing, but we can't actually evaluate them independently across each other unless we're using a consistent evaluation framework. We could. Then, we're trying to, you know, the RDA, Resource Data Alliance, you heard about it, okay? So uh, what Andrea was mentioning is uh, uh, an interest group called uh, Open Science Graphs. And the idea is to come up with uh, standards uh, or select standards or pick standards through which uh, some of the information that is uh, being uh, produced by graphs can be exchanged, okay? Uh, which doesn't mean it could be, it should be one only, but it could be many standards. But anyway, there, there are information that need to be um, shared across these graphs and finding ways of doing this um, uh, according to uh, common lingua franca would be probably uh, very interesting. Um, which doesn't mean that, of course, uh, I trust you, um, you more than others or et cetera, but that I find what I need uh, to look for uh, in the right graph, okay? And that's exactly going in the direction of what Jason was saying. So that each of us has, of course, its own uh, 
skills in defining the, in defining and constructing such graph and we could all benefit from each other it would be great to find also a way to describe such skills in a way so where you're collecting the data uh, how much you trust your data or the provenance of your sources so have ways to express uh, the the level of trust of your guesses of your claims which are not facts in a way uh, so that while, while exchanging data we can build workflows that you know uh, leveraging this and uh, make sure that I'm aware of what I'm collecting and, and what I'm including in my graph uh, for me and for the others. So uh, I think it would be great to include you in the discussion. Uh, Elsevier is already part of it uh, because they're interested in that. Data site is already part of that. So uh, if you'd be interested, uh, we can uh, certainly point you to that. Absolutely, it'd be great. Yeah, me too. Give me an invite. I'm interested. It's uh, there's a session. In fact, we have a session at the next uh, RDA Alliance. Uh, this is the link at the next plenary, which I share to the world. So it's the same. Nothing to hide. Can I chat here? Yes. This is the group. Of course, all the participants of the workshop are invited to participate. And this is the program. And uh, this time, Jason is slightly better, is 7 UTC. <laughs> I think it's uh, not great, but still. So, so maybe, um, so maybe uh, right now we covered this uh, subject uh, a lot. Maybe go to any further questions uh, and go back to the route. Maybe uh, regarding what is missing right now uh, uh, with uh, Mag being discontinued. For example, uh, this is a question to all of you. Uh, what uh, do you consider the uh, the main gap right now, uh, based on the fact that uh, Mac is not here, uh, and based on what you are currently providing? Uh, what do you expect that is missing? Uh, the coverage uh, to conferences, for example, in computer science, uh, something related to uh, full texts or abstracts? I don't know. Uh, what do you consider as uh, the main gap right now? That's a good question. Um, I, to be honest, I think most of the stuff that's missing is not that important. Um, so for instance, MAG had really good coverage of um, things that aren't in, like that are in either very small or non-scholarly venues, right? Because they're they're pulling from Bing. If if I had just like a little website that's like my patient group, right? Of like alssufferers.org or something like that. And I had put a bunch of papers up there, um, MAG was getting those. Um, I don't think any of us are getting those because we don't we're not calling the whole web. I don't think that that was actually a very useful source because when we looked at the mag data, quite a lot of that was like gray lit or not actually like peer reviewed studies. Um, and some of it just was not scholarly at all, but some of it was actually pretty cool and good and like, like author web pages would be another one right where like I don't have all, I, if someone put a preprint on their author web page on their like personal like you know personal web page, we don't none of us have that. So that was kind of a cool source for that for me. It was also, like I said, a big source of a lot of garbage. So I mean, it's kind of pros and cons. And I think, as you said, I think conferences, um, you know, especially CS conferences, uh, Mag put an enormous amount of focus into that, like an enormous amount. I would argue, like, again, I think disproportionately too much focus because, yeah, they're all CS people. So they want to make sure they have, like, incredibly good coverage of the CS literature. I think in terms of, like, cost benefit, I think that probably wasn't, I don't think the right trade off. But if you want CS conferences, MAG was doing a better job than I think anybody else. So I think those are two that jump out. Um, and then, of course, MAG's exact concept hierarchy, right? Like, I don't think anyone has really duplicated. We've duplicated just the concepts that applied to, that have Wikidata IDs, which is about 90% of them, and the ones that applied to more than 1,000 papers, which is about 10% of them. So if you wanted the concepts that only applied to a small number of papers, no one's assigning those anymore. So I think that that would be another loss. 
again, to me, that's not that big of a loss. So I think the community's done a pretty good job of, of, um, of picking up where Mag, where Mag left off personally. I will I'll sort of echo um, the statement on the on the venues. Jason, you you refer to the fact that you guys are using ISSN L's for uh, for journals uh, identifiers. Um, I, I think there's a gap in the community right now to, to actually have identifiers for venues. And if you look at the history of ISSNs, they were not intended to be an identifier for a journal. They were basically the equivalent of a shopkeeping unit. It was for it was for commerce and how you sell a journal. Um, and the ISNL was sort of a retrofitting, uh, you know, shoehorning of that in, trying to make it an identifier system. That doesn't exist. Most uh, or yeah, most if not all CS conferences do not have ISSNs. Um, so having Yes, Microsoft Academic Graph did a good job at that, um, but they didn't. They didn't even attempt to solve the problem of coming up with uh, identifiers or canonical lists, and that's that's an area that we are working on right now. But I think from like a community effort, um, having better um, uh, better tracking of of venues that papers appear in, they can be journals, they can be conferences, they can be book chapters, they can be other things, is is sort of a, a gap right now that exists. Um, and then building on this sort of notion of a topical hierarchy, Microsoft Academic Graph did that, um, but it was you know relatively um, high level subject hierarchy. And where I I would love to see more community effort uh, or more more efforts um, come out is more um, consistent and comprehensive named entity mining of the literature, so you can start pulling out things like genes, drugs, diseases, um, software, uh, et cetera, and adding these into the graph. So we're still sort of skimming the surface at the you know, top level bibliographic metadata of a paper, um, actually starting to go in and being able to, to then track trends over time and see what software has been used in different domains, what, uh, what, what genes are emerging in the cancer research uh, uh, literature, et cetera, is going to be the next frontier. And all of this is, is really dependent on, again, access to the full text to do these things. Uh, actually, being part of the, the community that Alex just mentioned, that is the community is trying to do information extraction of complex concepts from a research paper. And uh, uh, I fully agree that uh, recently there were some uh, pretty interesting thing. For example, uh, we are working on extracting uh, information uh, uh, like task method and matrix from the computer science domain, and we will release soon uh, some uh, very interesting result. But uh, uh, my question on that is that uh, uh, recently we saw a lot of initiative, well, some initiative like open research graph, uh, nano publication, AI knowledge graph, and others which aims to do a bit the opposite in terms of concept, that is to produce a, a very semantic and specific, uh, uh, much readable description of the content of the paper. Let's try to almost do an automatic semantic publishing. And uh, uh, of course, if this actually happen, uh, it means that we can unlock a number of smart services that could be very, very cool functionality, way to compare, way to generate survey automatically. But of course, there is a tension uh, between uh, how much we can extract uh, and what is the accuracy of things that we can extract uh, and the human are not scalable and so on. So uh, my question what is, what do you think about this kind of effort? And do you think uh, it will be possible to, to cooperate with them at least to a certain degree in your data? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Alex has got it right. I think that um, we need to be extracting the stuff, not producing it. Um, I think somewhere around, what, like 2005 or something, where everyone was so excited, like we're all just going to publish nothing but triples. And that sounds great. If we can get everybody to do that, I think that would be a terrific future, you know. But to do that, we need very polished authoring tools because people don't think in, in triples. So we need, and those don't exist. And where they do exist, it's pulling teeth to get research researchers to you know say hey don't use microsoft word use my new triple authoring thing a lot of people have tried that and it's just it's not the value isn't there for the researcher you know and there's been i, I i'm such a big fan of um simon bucking and shum's work on uh, uh, uh ontologies publishing uh, ontolo uh ontologies of argument i think that's because i think ultimately i think as i said everything's a claim so i think i would love to be able to look at the entire literature as a network of arguments 
I'd love people to, pu to publish what they say as network of arguments, but I, I genuinely think it's impossible. And so I think that instead we need to take the opposite approach and say, okay, people are going to publish the things that they publish. It's going to be a long rambling manifesto of prose or whatever. You I mean that that's just, that's how people think. That's how they publish. And at least for many years, we need to bootstrap this argumentation, not work underneath, by extracting it from the text. And then the second thing we need to appreciate when we do that is that extract that extraction is not value neutral i take a text i'm going to extract these arguments these claims these triples you take that text you're going to extract different claims different arguments different triples and that extraction is itself part of the argumentation that makes up scholarship your opinion about what is this author really saying and my opinion about what is author that scholarship itself right our, our difference of opinion there is part of the exercise and so i think it's great that we i think we want as many people as possible doing that extraction and instead of the vision of you know the, the purity of we're going to have one single bucket of triples that encompasses all of human knowledge i think instead we're going to have many 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 buckets of triples based on many many different people's approaches to extraction and then we need to find ways to do second layer extraction on top of those different claims so that's that's the direction i think i think see i would like to see things going I think Alex, I think you already like mentioned all that. The first steps are doing just kind of pulling the easy entities out of the papers. Um, the next step is pulling the argumentation. But even before we can get to any of that, we at least got to get the basics of the graph out there. The titles, the authors, you know, like links to full text. We don't even have that. And so I think that's got to be the first step. And we have to do that in the open so that people can build the next layers on top of that. It's got to be infrastructure. It's got to be like water. You know, you go to the city, you turn on the water, water comes out. You build other stuff like you build a bakery, you build whatever other kind of things you're building, but you have to assume the water's there. Yeah, the, the one thing that I would add to that um, is academic papers aren't the same as poetry, where everybody can have a different interpretation of what that poet is a poem is about. Um, the difference here is that the author should be a part of the ecosystem. And too often, I think, in, in the current culture of scientific papers, is you publish your paper. And then you're sort of out and everything, all the other comments today in the traditional system happen by somebody publishing a rebuttal paper. And there's a very interesting, I think, touch point that has not been sufficiently leveraged yet, which is exactly what Jason was just saying. But, um, but, but you submit an article and we do some of that extraction in real time at the point of submission. And you, that author then has the ability uh, sort of primacy ability to say, no, 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 the, the, the statements that you're extracting or the arguments that you're extracting is not what I meant. And, and have, you know, rather than building the authoring tool to build a, a triple that represents the argument, you use the technology, but you still have the author validate that. And so now you have the paper that I've submitted and a machine readable set of the arguments that I've made that I've vetted. And, and I think that that we just don't, there's, there's, there's all of this sort of, um, sort of baked in what I said is in my paper and take it at face value rather than incorporating the author's knowledge into some of this extraction. Yes, I tend to agree with Jason. Um, I like all these approaches. They're just one step beyond what we are ready to do today, I think in many ways, because uh, even the, the open uh, knowledge resource graph, I think uh, it's a very interesting uh, initiative from the way it takes, uh, the perspective that it takes, but of course it requires the researcher to do most of the job and this is uh, in itself uh, interesting but an issue right so because you're asking me to do uh, twice as a job probably if what uh, what alex was suggesting could be integrated there at some point that would uh, simplify a lot of things and uh, maybe incept also uh, a new way of doing things and producing content but on the other hand we're really missing <laughs> the basics in many ways um, we have recently done some work on ORCID and analyzed the way uh, researchers use ORCID. So when you publish today, for example, in a preprint and you specify your ORCID ID, uh, in that moment, in that very moment, you're making a statement which is not validated at all. In many cases, you have no validation of your ORCID ID as you have no validation of the ROAR identifier you're using. And a simple character makes a difference in many cases. 
So we, when we have inspected the data, fortunately, the number of mistakes that we have found by mm -hmm. matching, you know, the ground truth provided by ORCID itself and so on, were not many, but still they are mistakes which propagate, you know, because when your data input data becomes an assumption uh, to further uh, conclusions, of course, you make mistakes, you're propagating and potentially exploding the error into many others. So yes, I think we're still missing a lot in terms of infrastructure and data infrastructure. Um, although we like those, Francesco. So yeah, I, I thank you very much for your answer. I I, I fully agree with it, and that's uh, that's also why uh, most of the things that we are doing in my group is automatic extraction because. Uh, uh, we are a bit less idealistic than we were <laughs> a few years ago in which uh, we were hoping to convince uh, um, researchers. And I think the idea of having automatic system plus auto feedback is probably, uh, is probably the future. So uh, I, I will look forward to your data to build uh, this system on the top. And actually I'm already using it uh, uh, mag and now I'm, I'm switching to, to open Alex. So. Very curious to keep can, using I, that. can I ask a question to Alex and Jason? Jason mentioned something before, which I, uh, in his presentation, if I won't remember, which I really like because I share the same, I feel for this kind of reasoning. And it's, uh, we have to take a look beyond the PDFs, okay? So beyond the article itself, beyond the publication, because in open air, we consider not just scientific articles, but theses and presentations or whatever is an output. But on the other hand, we're also including what we call resource data and what we call resource software and what we had to call other kinds of products because they were not classifiable as nothing <laughs> of the first three um, uh, structures. And here the problem is huge, right? In terms of granularity, as Jason mentioned before. So what is a data set exactly? Um, what kind of what kind of assumption we can make? And we have to jump into the communities here. So uh, actually understand what they call data set and what they would like to perceive as a data set. And uh, what is a research software, for example? This is another question because software is software. In, in open air, we infer links to software from the papers and then we find them in GitHub and we make them nodes in this graph, of course. But is it a research software? Is it not? Uh, what are the differences? So in this scenario, have you started thinking uh, of taking a look beyond? And if so, uh, what are your initial ideas or assumptions you would make today in that direction? Uh, I'll, I'll give a short answer, which is, um, yes, uh, I agree with you. Um, in, in my previous role at, at Meta, um, we were doing quite a bit of work to um, identify software, software mentions in the literature, um, identify data sets, both from structured resources like Datacite and Zenodo, um, as well as doing entity extraction. Um, I think you're right, it, it, it varies heavily by domain and what people refer to, what people mean by a data set in a domain. Uh, but I think it's a tractable problem. And I think it's actually something that will be um, not necessarily solved, but um, approaches, useful approaches um, can be achieved in, in the next few years. Um, uh, we haven't spent a lot of time at Semantic Scholar doing this. We we have partnerships, for example, with Papers with Code, um, and we have some extraction going on, but it's it hasn't really reached a critical mass across multiple domains that we've rolled it into the website yet. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think I think it's a good point. I think it's tractable. I think it will be solved. I think it must be solved. I think um, I think we're on. There's about. 20 steps to build the thing I want to build. And I think we're on step two or something like that. Um, I think right now, I think you look at look at how much value just web of science and service are currently extracting from the scholarly communication, not adding extracting, but taking, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm not sure what the overall revenues are, but like tens, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, certainly hundreds of millions of dollars from from scholarly libraries, you know, I, I, there was a great tweet by one of the folks at Mag that I broke my heart. I think it was exactly right, and they said for the price that a couple different libraries, like pick two, two or three libraries for what they spend on Scopus, we can keep that going indefinitely. You know, and it's like it's true, and it breaks my heart because there's just it's such a difficult problem to put that money together. And I think the corporate people who do this have just got you know they've got 
you know, the kid 20 years, 20 slash the kids have lost 60 year head start on us. And um, you don't overcome that right away. I think we've got the momentum on our side. I think there's a lot of interest in what we're doing, a lot of support for it, but it takes a long time to build that momentum. And the reason I mentioned them is because what if they, you know, they don't really focus that much on software. They don't focus that much on data set. But eventually, you know, I think those are gonna be important, but people really need the articles. They need the citations, they need the metadata, right? They need just the basics of that article graph and there just haven't been good open places to do that. So I think we need to, step one, I think that's our beachhead, say, we're gonna do a really good job, as good as the commercial guys, of providing you the basics of the article and author and citation graph, because that's the thing that people are most desperate for. And then we can potentially free up those tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And then once we can start bringing that into the open community, I think we can build out these other parts. It's kind of the way, way I think about it. But it's always a, it's always a balance, we always say, between like, making the stuff that people want open and making the stuff that we want them to want right i want people to care a lot more about software i want people to care more about data in evaluation but i can't solve both those problems at the same time i can't try and get them to care more about these alternative products at the same time as i get them to use an open alternative for the old school products i think those are two separate problems and to me if we're going to solve one i'd rather solve this one first give them open alternative to the the old school stuff and then once that's got some traction, then we we say also you can get this GitHub, also you can get this you know data site, all these other kind of things. That's kind of the way we mapped it out. And um, but yeah, we'll see. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, very pragmatic, and I think it's the most efficient way to go. Um, in Europe, we were kind of uh, taken by this lead, you know, by the Commission who wanted to have numbers on several fronts, and so we had to quickly. Uh, let's say, move on and include uh, everything into the picture. And of course, what we're trying to manage today is a very complex problem in many ways. So, uh, and hopefully pioneering this will help others to do better in the future as well. But uh, no, I was interested to see, uh, to, to check what you were thinking and potentially, hopefully in the future, also share the challenges that we have and get feedback from you guys, because, uh, it's not obvious to take these decisions in many cases, as you said before, right? So you may have better interpretations of our choices. Okay, thank you. May, may I, uh, I make another question uh, on another aspect? So uh, it seems that uh, much uh, of the information that uh, uh, you need to store and provide uh, may be uh, related uh, to the communities. Uh, maybe communities have the answer to uh the statements like uh, you said or for example which are the roles uh, uh, with which uh, the authors uh, contributed in each of the works etc uh, so these are essential information that the community itself has uh, because the authors know uh, which was the role of each of uh, uh, of the authors of a paper and uh, they could provide this information for example using a taxonomy like uh, the credit taxonomy uh, if you know it uh, so uh, it seems that there is a lot of information in the community itself. Uh, do you have any plans uh, to involve the communities in the generation of uh, this data? Uh, you mentioned earlier something like, uh, okay, uh, we can uh, ask the authors to confirm that this uh, statement that uh, was automatically created uh, is correct. Uh, this uh, also implies that, for example, publishers should be uh, in the uh, in the game as well. But do you have any plans to to involve in uh, uh, a, a most a more important uh, give a more important role to to the communities and the researchers themselves? Yeah, I'd say it's always we think of uh, Cunningham's law, which is if you want the answer to something, don't ask the question, post the wrong answer on the internet. Right. And then people come out of the world. No, no, it's wrong. It's wrong. Right. And I think that's that's we've got this terrific opportunity to do that um, by posting a bunch of wrong answers on the Internet. You know, And I think that all of us who are doing these graphs are going to get a bunch of stuff wrong. And then we give it a great opportunity for people who, like you said, know the answer or, as Alex would say, have their own opinion about the answer that we think is a very important opinion um, to uh, to correct us. And I think I think semantic scholars are doing a great job of that. Mag was doing a good job of that. You got to have a, a web front end, I think, for that. And, and like for, for the most part, people got to be able to show up the internet and click the buttons. We don't have that yet, but we will be doing that as well. But, but sorry for the interruption, but uh, there is, okay, there is information that uh, 
uh, the people can confirm, but uh, there is also missing information. For example, the one that I mentioned about the roles that people have in, uh, in several works, uh, this information is not there unless the publisher asks for, the, for it and not all publishers ask for this information. Uh, but uh, authors know about it and maybe the, they will begin to provide this type of information if, uh, for example, you or other initiatives like you uh, ask for it. Do you have plans to, to have something like a com community features like this? Uh, or do you believe that this is really difficult, uh, at, at least uh, at this uh, stage? And the same is for the other two uh, participants as well. We don't have any uh, uh, direct plans to do that. And I think, uh, I mean, even just picking up on the example that you provide, um, uh, I've been an author on, on many papers, and I am not an authority on what all the roles of all of my co-authors were. Um, and I think it's a really hard, I think you could ask every author on every paper that same question and you get a different set of answers. Um, so it, you know, it, it, it comes back into this sort of statement of, of claims. Um, there are some questions that probably you get more consistent answers, like who was the PI on this and who was the corresponding author. Um, but they're, they're hard questions. I agree that this needs to, to happen um, upstream to the extent possible. Um, so, you know, there are some, some efforts underway for the, the credit taxonomy uh, to roll into manuscript submission workflows. Um, I don't have a good <clears throat> bead on, on how much uh, traction those have right now or, or what the sticking points are. Um, I support that, um, but I, uh, it scares me a little bit to, to sort of uh, think about trying to bake those in downstream in the process. But I support community efforts to do it and, uh, and sort of getting back to Paolo's question around interoperability earlier. I think if there was a, a, an effort that started to demonstrate scalability and accuracy in the space, we would love to fold that data into our graph. Um, but I think there's a separation here between, uh, and I, I think the same is true with, with Jason, which is we don't have to be the ones who um, manage all of these projects. Like we, we bring in data from lots of resources. So if the data are there from whatever effort um, and, and it looks good and looks comprehensive, uh, then we would certainly be interested in folding that into our graph. So, the, probably, Tanazi, where you meant when you uh, were mentioning communities, you you mentioned uh, input at the discipline level. Or... Yes, input uh, from from the research community at large, let's say. Uh, so, uh, for example, for the authors themselves, or uh, something like that. But uh, well, of course, yeah. feedback I see from in uh, Alex's work, for example, feedback was one of the uh, main. Uh, one of the most important aspects and we're trying to do the same in open air we're collecting feedback uh, from the users enrichments especially uh, uh, from the users um, now i was wondering if uh, it would be uh, possible or the case to uh, try to find ways to exchange data and uh, collaboratively check the quality of it that would be i think uh, extremely important for example we have a lot of uh, the funder data you were mentioning, uh, Jason, we have a lot of mining and, and a lot of experience in producing links from publications to funders. We have, I think, 25 funders with 3.5 million projects related with them. And uh, the, the results are quite good in terms of uh, mining because some of it are harvested also from Crossref or from other activities. But we're